I don't even know if people are here, but I'm assuming people are here. Hello, people. How is it going? Let's get the candle going. Hell yeah. Oh, oh. This candle is fighting. All right. Oh. I gotta get my world buffs quick. That should be easy. How's everyone doing? People ready for some OS development? The sun is blinding my eyes. It's uh, it's a bit it's a bit much. Woof. <laughs> that sun is fucking me up. Need a candle emote? Hell yeah, we do. Is that retail wow? No, no, it's a classic. I don't. I don't I don't play brain dead modern wow. <laughs> Any cuties in chat? What's up, Zarsek? How's it going? Alright. Let's see here. Chat, you gotta fill me in on what what have I missed? What have I missed? Ah, Gamer stream. Oh yeah, we're gaming. Oh, we're, we're we're big gamers here. Oh yeah, nothing but gaming on this stream. We are pro professional gamers here. Hey, thanks for your content. Is it relevant to contribute uh, to some of the FreeBSD projects, even though even if I don't have deeper knowledge in the subject? I mean, it really comes down to if you have relevant things to contribute. I wouldn't contribute things just because it makes you look good because now you have your name on some PRs or something and you put that on your resume. Um, ultimately, you should put effort and thought into what you're doing and contribute to things when you think there are issues. Uh, bug fixes are really easy contribu uh, contributions because if it's a bug fix, you're, you're like by nature it's a fix, but a lot of open source projects get fucking plastered with PRs for shitty features that no one in the world would use. Um, and people get really frustrated when those don't get accepted or they get shot down or refactored. Um, and ultimately, it kind of comes down to, you know, reading the room, understanding the things that people want in the project and the code quality they want. And um, a lot of places are willing to have you suck and then have you uh, improve, right? Make a PR and they'll give you advice of how to fix things. And there's that's a, a good way to go about it. But... Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to contribute to a project just to get your name on things. Like, I remember I did that when I was a kid. I think that's something that, that kids are a lot more prone to doing is trying to just like get their name on stuff by doing random, uh, PRs. But a lot of times that's not the most useful path you can go down. So TLDR, uh, uh no advice there. Basically, uh, <laughs> you have to, you have to know if the thing is valuable in the first place and, and if you're a user of the software and you talk with other people, you probably should be able to get a good feel for that. All right. I like contributing to Blender because I use it uh, and there are things that I didn't like. Absolutely. So if you use the software and you want to fix something, go ahead and do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I would say FreeBSD and the BSDs are more on the side of like pretty, pretty, uh, pretty tight allowance for the things that they accept. Um, I would say things like uh, like you know Linux are a lot of more like user land, open source things typically accept things a little bit more willy nilly because they're looking to have all the features and all the bells and whistles. Whereas things like OpenBSD is very picky. Uh, they do not like features. They like to keep things as simple and minimal as possible. Uh, so there are a lot of things like that. That uh, kind of varies by the project. Let's see here. Um, okay, getting this. Uh, getting these buffs. Do you know of a way to have a process survive being exec on? What do you mean by that? I don't think uh, 
Process doesn't die when you exec. Like, you want to have it... You want to do something more in the process after execing, then you're going to have to fork or make a thread or do something like that. You're probably going to have to fork. All right. Or you can use a better language like Rust where uh, those things are kind of kind of understood better. <laughs> How long does the process have control before being replaced? Until the syscall. <laughs> like until until the syscall. That's about it. Like on the order of nanoseconds. If you're if you're making the libc call, it'll be making that syscall pretty soon. You don't really have time for that. Alright. About ten more minutes to get these buffs. Oh nice. Eyes are passive. Oh, that sun. Probably not gonna start dev until that sun goes away too. It's brutal, dude. What if the process has threads? Hmm. Do do do. Oh, that sun. Is it possible to get control in between? I mean, what are you what are you trying to to do? Like, I feel like you have to you have to know what you're trying to do there to be asking a question like that. Like the only reason you would really want to get control between when the program uh, calls exec and when it actually goes into the operating system to do exec is like <laughs> you want to like hook the call to exec, and in that situation, just put a a breakpoint on it. Or replace libc, do a ld preload, modify the libc on your system, patch the assembly, uh, hook the kernel, replace the kernel with a custom kernel, rebuild your libc, rebuild your kernel, um, use gdb to do it automatically for you, uh, use hardware breakpoints. Um, there's like a billion ways to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. There's no there's no one way to do it and all of them have their ups and downs Pretty much to, uh, in order the the best way to do it is always modify source modify the kernel is probably the best way Modify the kernel's behavior on exec if you can't do that modify the libc uh, Such that you get control when they call exec if you can't do that then you're gonna have to go to uh, like binary patching or breakpoints if you can't do that, you'll need to go to like a hypervisor to patch things at a hypervisor level. If you can't do that, then you're probably going to have to uh, figure out uh, a unique way to accomplish what you want to do. All right. Ultimately, you never want to do binary patching or breakpoints until that's the only way you can do it uh, Because those are typically messy and not portable and a lot of extra code the, the best way is always to modify the source code of the kernel or libc to do what you want it to do LD preload is also a pretty clean way. That's kind of uh, above binary patching All right. Oh yeah, got the buff starting.
Hello, Mr. Robo Streamer. How's it going, Robo Boat, though? First half an hour is usually talking. Yup. Playing some WoW, doing some talking. We'll probably throw up some Zonotic as well as more people come in. Where are you from? I'm from the U.S. In Seattle. West Coast. United States of America. Oh, there he is. Damn. If you had to uh, choose between AMD chipsets and Intel chipsets when building a new PC, which would you prefer? I mean, they're basically the same. There's really no difference. Pretty much the same. Like, the only nice thing is that AMD probably brings to the table is, uh, mainly you get, um, you can typically get, uh, ECC memory on desktops, which on Intel you need server-grade processors for. That's, uh, that's a big, uh, a big plus there. At least you used to be able to in Bulldozer and Piledriver. I think you still can. I don't think that's something they changed. Do you know where the Czech Republic is? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I mean, ballpark. <laughs> I know where it is. I could, I could point it out on a map, but I'm, I'm not gonna be able to like describe what's around it. But yeah, I'm familiar. I took European something in uh, high school. I'm educated. I'm hip. I'm cool. What do you do for a living? I am a computer security person. Uh, security researcher. I find uh, find bugs and things. I'm basically a, a, a glorified hacker. I'm a, I'm a corporate hacker. Corporate sellout shill. All right. Bam. It's better than most Americans. I always liked maps. Maps always were fascinated to me. Cartography. I especially like old maps. I like maps that are wrong. Uh, maps that like, you know... We just didn't know. We were kind of winging it. I, I think those things are really fascinating to kind of look at. I think one of my favorite gifts as a kid was uh, was just like a, a world map atlas sort of guide thing. And do you get uh, hired by companies to attempt exploits? Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what I do. That's a pretty good description. All right, we'll play some Zonotic while we uh, while we chill. Wait for more people to show up. I, I know people don't like waiting at the start of the stream, but unfortunately, um, more and more people are coming in here pretty quickly, and I don't really want to start until uh, we kind of stagnate with the viewership. So we'll see here. Do you use all the monitors bef behind you? Yes, absolutely. That is... Uh, Important. I wouldn't have bought them if I didn't. Okay, this map's really dark. I'm gonna have to probably go full bright. Whew. There we go. Now we can see. Sometimes full bright really fucks up maps. Actually, it seems like more often or not, but a lot of these dark maps, it's pretty much solely useful. Wow, that corner's gonna suck. Oh, yeah, fuck that corner, dude. What the hell? Even those corners are bad. Dude, this corner is unreal. Oh, and then it goes that way. It's, is this a maze? Okay, and not there. Makes sense. It's not here either, sweet. Yeah, it's like a little maze. I'm gonna have to memorize that pattern, whatever it is. Okay, that looks like I can step over the inside there. And then 
Uh, no death on there. Okay. Oh, God, I hate holes. Hole with a little slope. Okay, and then a turn and a finish. And that's where the start is. Okay, cool. All right, let's see, uh, let's see if we can get a, a reasonable time on this map. I don't think we'll be able to. This map looks really hard. And then I think it's right. Yeah, left, right, left, left, left. Okay, left, right, left, left, left. Okay, that's all that matters. Um, is it waiting for most of the European guys to go to sleep? Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna violate GDPR here. Uh, all the EU people have to get out, uh, so we can violate some GDPR. Um, we're gonna we're gonna take cookies without asking about cookies. Everyone here, give me a cookie. Give me a cookie. Uh, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you what I'm gonna use the cookies for. <laughs> <laughs> I did start streaming at pretty much the worst possible time for viewership, unfortunately, like, it is, it, this is, like, the, the death hour for streaming, at least for, uh, my viewer base. <laughs> Good timing on Australia. It's 9.30 in the morning here. Oh, jeez, that's early. How, what's the future like? Can you tell us something that happens in the future? Any information you can give us? I fucking hate this map. Map is awful. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Um, and let's make it so I can see what I'm streaming. I don't even know where I have OBS. Oh, there it is. And then we'll get uh, we'll get Twitch Chort up there too, so we can see Twitch Chort. There we go. Now we can see, see Twatch. All right. All right. It's 2020. Not even people in the future can predict it. What do you mean? Yeah, fuck that corner, dude. Are there any good cor uh, code bases that you would recommend reading? I mean, like, I... I <laughs> I don't recommend reading code. <laughs> like, just in, in general, I think that's a, a miserable state of existence. Uh, code is... Reading code is pretty much always suffering in agony. Yeah, fucking please, dude. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> um, like, if you're trying to get better at coding, writing code is the only way you're gonna get better. Like, of course... Of course you will get better at coding by reading code, but in the same way you'll get better at driving your car by playing a trucker simulator. Like, yeah, in theory it probably will help, but there are probably better ways to go about that. And that would be actual educational things pertaining to coding and actually writing code. Uh, writing code is, is massively going to improve... Um, uh, your ability to write code. And I, I think that's uh, that's something a lot of people don't want to do. A lot of people who want to become good coders don't want to write code, and that is a great indicator uh, that maybe, maybe you got to find a, another way to explore that passion. Um, writing code is by, by far the best way to get better at coding. Like, reading third-party code, the biggest thing that it will actually benefit you um, is is showing you the way that other people stylize things, and you're picking up more on programming soft skills, Git repos, management of code bases, code style, comment density. And these things are, are kind of late game skills uh, for developers. It'd be great if people had these skills as beginners, uh, but I'd rather a beginner know how to code before they know how to like cleanly architect a code base. Um, So, ultimately, you, like, I would say learning by observing what other people do is typically a path uh, to, to just reproducing and basically um, 
only being able to build things that other people have built before you. Because uh, you, you typically are just so used to the way other people do things and the other way people design things um, that you're too uncomfortable uh, exploring outside of those realms. And that's something I see in a lot of very senior engineers. Uh, they'll offer advice that's typically based on historical things like 20 years ago for this one project, they made this one design decision and they're now giving you advice to do something a certain way because 20 years ago in some completely different circumstance they approached a somewhat similar problem in a unique way. Um, and I think ultimately, I, I think TLDR, uh, this really long-winded thing, is basically saying most people's code really fucking sucks and it's really not what you should aspire to be. Um, if you want to uh, integrate with other people's code and, and collaborate with people, it is important to understand those properties of the code. But if you just want to understand programming in general, uh, go and fucking make mistakes. There are a lot of confident people out there who will tell you the right ways to do things, and they can be wrong. Um, so uh, there is no ground truth out there. It's uh, go out there and, and have some fun and try out some things and uh, fail. Fail a lot. And more importantly, understand why things failed. Because typically things are not... Um, there's not a one solution to a problem, and when there's not a single solution to a problem, that often means that uh, there are many partial solutions, and all of them have their pros and cons. And understanding those pros and cons is what makes you an expert developer. Understanding that you are going to enact something that is going to have some, some limitations, uh, but you're picking it because of the things that it excels at is, is really important. And you're not going to get that by reading other people's code. Um, it's really important to understand that programming is lossy. You lose intent with code. Uh, you cannot, you can infer, but you can never recover the intent of the original developer. So when you're reading code and you say, oh, this is how they sorted a list you don't see that their intention is that 95% of the time the data is already partially sorted and it's mainly consisting of alphanumeric characters. And then you might use that code as a way of just sorting things general purposefully, and it's not a great way to do it because it's tailored, it's special cased. Um, and that's the case for pretty much everything in programming. So understanding nuance and not viewing things as binary is so fucking important. Um, most code out there is wrong. Like, in general, if you're reading some code and you're wondering, oh, is this the best way to do it? The answer is probably no. <laughs> the, pro the answer is probably no right off the bat. And if it is the best solution to a problem, it might be tailored, and thus it's not, it's not something to copy pasta. How much code do you write as a security engineer? I write a lot of code, but I'm not a normal security engineer. I write, I write more code than most software engineers. Let's see. Learn how to code first, learn how to push to GitHub second, yeah. Yeah, I mean, contributing to things is very difficult, um, and it's a skill on its own, and it, should, uh, it shouldn't it should be taken for granted as well. It should be understood that you can be the best coder in the world, but that doesn't mean you're a good team coder or a good contributor. Um, those things aren't exclusive, they're just not uh, implied. This map is very boring. Um, exactly. Blog posts and books are written with that in mind. All examples are generic and, uh, specifically made to teach, uh, and not to be useful. I don't know. I think it varies. I think it varies. I think, I think a lot of blog posts are very specific, but when they are, it's, it's described that way. Maybe I'm, maybe I read that wrong. Um, Software is more experimentation than most uh, engineering disciplines. It's a lot easier to do things differently than other compared to stuff like civil engineering. Yeah, I think that's pretty true. Um, I I don't think <laughs> I don't think at the root that that's true. I think both are fundamentally extremely experimental. 
I think software, uh, there's just no, there's no cost of failure, right? When you fuck something up and ship security bugs or ship bugs or ship shitty software, uh, you don't get penalized for it. Um, unless it's so buggy that it's not usable software at all. But, uh, we all know that, uh, no one gives a shit about bugs in software, right? If Cyberpunk 2077 was a bridge and it fucking fell over every day, um, yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't think they'd be in business any longer. But as a gaming company, won't fucking matter at all. In a couple months, they'll iron out a couple of the major bugs, and it will become the best game of all time, and people are gonna be so hyped about it and talking about it for a decade, right? Like, no one gives a shit. There's no financial penalty. It's, it's just, no one gives a shit about these things. Well, then there's solar, solar winds. Yep, and how much has that affected companies? Uh, let's see, all the tech companies are at all-time highs, um, and that code uh, did not matter um, because no one gives a shit. Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> no company has ever had a long-lasting impact from a, security, uh, from a security breach or from a security bug. It has never happened, and it never will happen in the next five years. No one gives a flying fuck. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. <laughs> Solar winds themselves? Nope, doesn't matter. Uh, too many of its customers are integrated into that ecosystem, and it's required for their systems to work. Um, and they're still running Windows XP and Windows 7. I fucking doubt they're going to replace their entire thing. They're going to wait for the next update. SolarWinds is going to charge an extra fee for that update. Write a blog post about how they're sorry and the technical mitigations and sandboxing that they've integrated in the next thing. And that they've spent 50 grand hiring two IT contractors to slap a green button on that. And that shit will be at all time highs, baby. <laughs> No one gives a fuck, dude. No one gives a fuck. <laughs> you have to understand that no one cares about security. It does not matter. It doesn't mean it shouldn't matter. It just means that it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of how it is. Would it be for some sort of software regulation? No, because it's going to be pushed by the companies that write the uh, Cisco uh, training courses um, and by the companies that make the endpoint software. And all of those regulations are effectively going to be contracts. I've seen that in the government space. I've seen computers and networks are required uh, by certain government groups to run certain AV software. Um, and it's effectively a big fucking uh, contract that just gives money to this AV company and it does absolutely nothing for security. In fact, it actually reduces security because it's an AV. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the world we live in. Uh, those regulations are basically just going to be paychecks. So, no, I'm, I'm not really for that. Um, I'd maybe be for, like, uh, some form of punishment for security issues, uh, but it's too late. We can't do that. Um, there is no company in the world that cannot be trivially hacked into. Every company can be trivially fucking hacked into. It, it's a joke. It's an absolute joke. Like solar winds. You you really think that if they had that bug patched or they didn't have the, the username and password uh, on that like public GitHub repo that it'd take more than fucking two days to get access to it in another way? And then two days after that to get access in a different way? And two days after that to get access in a different... No, it doesn't fucking matter. Like, these, these companies have thousands, thousands of vulnerabilities. It's like... What are you what are you possibly going to enact? Nothing. It's impossible. Like the average security engineer is incapable ag against securing uh, against a, a nation state threat. In in fact, not even the best hackers in the world are able to. You could not pay a million dollars salary 
to each security employee and still get a team that even remotely fucking secures your company. It does not matter. We have fundamentally architected ourselves into a way where we cannot fix these problems. They are eternally issues until we completely rethink the way that we do software. And that largely is going to mean that we have to take a five or ten year step back in performance and features and development and growth uh, and, and capitalizing on things and expansion and integration such that we can fuck around and rewrite a bunch of code. <laughs> like, that's what it's gonna take. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's how it goes. It is never going to happen. It is never going to happen because no one's gonna foot that bill. No way. Because what's going to happen is another company is going to make a less secure product. They're going to develop it faster. They're going to beat you to market. They're going to beat you on pricing. And they're going to beat you on features. And you're going to get fucking smoked. And then uh, no one's going to be able to compete with them who's more secure. And then they'll get hacked in a couple years. And they have too many features and too much integration that everyone already relies on that software. And they can't switch to something new. That is how it's going to go. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, I'm quite a bit into sim racing and security that is non-existent. Servers most of the time of the sims are so poorly written and lack any security testing. I found a simple way to crash one and their fixes try to disable the whole interface uh, except the way they did it. did it made it even worse. I hate that people ignore this stuff. Yeah, they just don't have time. They don't have time. No one has time for this stuff because Here's the thing, it costs money to spend time to fix things. And there's been no indication that security makes your product more valuable, but there has been multiple indications that more security makes your product less valuable. So basically doing a security fix is spending money to spend time doing something that will lose you more money. <laughs> it's like, it's so bad. It's so bad from an economic standpoint. It's why every company doesn't give a fuck. It's, it's why, like, it's why Zoom effectively didn't have a security department until the security breach this year. They didn't care until they had to care, right? <laughs> Just how it fucking goes. And it's not that they had to care, it's that they had to pretend to care. That's the real thing there. That's the real thing. And as noted, the Zoom security department was contracted out. What are the odds? What? People hire a contractor for one one hundredth of the cost of an actual security team to get a green stamp? Wow! I'm shocked! I'm sure someone... I'm sure someone who basically just learned how to run a basic script off of GitHub ran a script on it and checked if there were any known active end days in it in the Metasploit framework, and it, it didn't have it, so it got the green light, and it, it no bugs, ship it. <laughs> Security doesn't have an ROI, yeah, exactly. Um, it will eventually. It will eventually, it just doesn't now. So... <laughs> you raised some really good points here today. I mean, look, it might sound grumpy and depressing and awful. It's how it is. It really is. Like, I am all for feeling like you're contributing and doing these awesome things as security engineers, but like, no one gives a fuck. Still. Still. It's far. It's far from even remotely mattering. Do you think GDPR will make security RIO valid? I don't know what RIO is in this case. In the sim racing case, if I wanted to bankrupt the company in minutes, along with causing them legal troubles, uh, and they don't care, I mean, yeah, like, because no one's going to do it. <laughs> no one's going to do it unless they're a nation state. Like, why... It's something we've talked about before. A lot of these companies are only able to get away with the security that they have because the uh, skill sets required to break their security models uh, typically make you worth 
Uh, like hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Oh, ROI. Um, let me see here. I don't know what this map is. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, no, GDPR will not make security ROI. Uh, um, return on investment ROI valid. It, it's it's not punishing enough. These companies have to basically get fucked if they have a security issue. They have to lose like 10, 20% of their market cap and spend years recovering from that damage. If you even remotely want people to spend uh, what they need to on security. It's not going to happen. No one gives a shit. And here's the thing. We don't have developers that are capable of writing secure code. We d they don't exist. There's no one out there who can make a secure code base. There is no code in the world written in C and C++ for the 40 or 50 years we've been writing that fucking language. Nobody, nobody in the world has written high quality C or C++ yet. It's never going to happen. It's never going to fucking happen. We have to stop treating developers like fucking gods and treat them more like what they are, a bunch of toddlers, and give them rattles and make sure that we put outlet covers on all the outlets so they don't have access to stupid shit because they're gonna electrocute themselves. That's not that developers are stupid, it's that we all are stupid. Everyone, in every industry, it's the same reason why doctors have medical malpractice issues. It's because people make fucking mistakes. So we should start designing our operating systems and our languages and our libraries in a way that if you make a mistake, you don't fucking core out a trillion dollar company. <laughs> like, come on. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely fucking ridiculous. I have no idea why we keep giving developers full access to the whole system and we give access to these like fucking kids who have no idea how to program things. And then senior engineers who have no idea what has changed in modern languages. And principal engineers that have no idea how to architect things securely because to be a principal engineer basically means that you've been architecting things for longer than security has been a concern. Like everyone across the board, management, junior developers, senior developers, middle developers, architects, pretty much everyone is incredibly un unwell, <laughs> not well equipped to do security. It's just, it's fucking terrible. Like, <laughs> look at Apple. Like, look at companies like Apple that pay 200,000, 300,000, probably millions for some security engineers per year. And they constantly, monthly, get fucking bugs. Like, how is a company that only can afford to pay their engineers 50 to 80 grand a year possibly going to make their code secure when these massive companies that can pay millions of dollars a year per employee can't fucking do it. The answer is they can't. <laughs> they can't. <laughs> we have to, we have to stop giving developers access to things. The fact that like you can just read all the files on the file system uh, is fucking ridiculous. The fact that you can even create a file without asking is ridiculous. The fact that you can do syscalls that you'll never actually do in your operate in your program, like why does your CLI application need to have access to the entire GDI uh, syscall space? It like it's bad. It's bad. The correct way to do security and the only way that we can effectively do security right right now is radically, radically reduce surface. I mean like reduce surface by like 99%. Have guards on syscalls, prevent what you can access, to root fucking everyone into their application folder, make a concept of an application folder. Uh, basically any 
Any network service that is by default must be built with ASAN. Like in fucking prod. In prod, if you want to run like a DHCP client, a DNS client, a DHCP server, the things that are critical for a network infrastructure to even remotely function, right? You need these protocols. Um, those need to be built with ASAN. It turns out a a 50% or a 2x performance penalty isn't going to affect the thousand DHCP leases that you give out every fucking month. Like, build this shit with ASAN. Build prod components in ASAN. Seriously. Install Windows on a new computer. Run Netstat AN. Look at all of the listening services. None of those services are performant critic performance critical. Build them with fucking ASAN. <laughs> Delete all buffer overflows. Use after freeze. Uninitialize memory uses. Double freeze. Just delete all of them. All of them. Instantaneously. We could literally do that in one day. In one day. In one fucking day. <laughs> like, it takes no time. The thing is, once again, no one is willing to pay a 2x performance penalty, even if that means that 99% of the ODE that fucked them in the past get deleted. No one's going to sign up for that. It's un... It's, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely fucking ridiculous. Um, you mean like Pledge and FreeBSD? FreeBSD's Pledge is a little weak. Um... And, and I think a pledge is OpenBSD, but yeah, um, something in that vein definitely needs to be stronger. <laughs> um, and you'll have one guy who works in the same big company. Uh, <laughs> what's that? Uh, you'll have one guy that works in some big company and writes code and Cobalt will stop to work. I mean, I, I, that's fine. That's fine. If the code breaks by installing ASAN, then that means that there's a bug and there has been a bug forever and it needs to be fixed. What is your opinion on BSD licenses? I, th I think they're one of the better licenses. I, I prefer the BSD and Apaches and uh, MIT licenses, which are all pretty comparable. I like BSD licenses a lot. I spent a lot of my, a lot of my youth working on uh, removing GPL code from FreeBSD. That is what I'm interested in. All right. Dude, fuck this map. All right. But yeah, those are the sorts of mitigations we need. Uh, radically reduce attack surface. Yeah, that's like it. <laughs> A lot of these services don't need to be performant criti performance critical. Like, it's ridiculous to me. You can have your allocations take twice as long. It's fine. Build things with page heap. It's okay. Windows spool service. Hey, someone's got a spool. Someone's got to be a spooler, you know? How long until code time? Not sure. We're, we're having a good time with chat. Uh, we had an issue where a uh, server would crash because the JVM wanted more RAM. Solution scale up the RAM or scale up the VM. Yeah, that sounds totally reasonable. <laughs> sounds totally reasonable, to be honest. Uh, sounds like a really cheap solution. <laughs> I advocate for that. RAM, RAM costs like dollars. <laughs> like, <laughs> you can double your RAM for like a. Uh, a couple hundred bucks, or you can re-architect your entire code base for uh, tens of millions of dollars. Uh, buy, buy more RAM. <laughs> Just buy fucking more RAM. Why is programming education at universities so lame? Uh, because they're not teaching even remotely the skills that you need to have as a programmer. Uh, they're basically teaching you algorithms uh, which are completely irrelevant for pretty much every developer in the world. Um, and then they're teaching you how to try and get a job. 
Um, which is a, a relevant skill, but uh, useless for being a good programmer. Can't download RAM. Just set your page file. Just set your page file high. <laughs> this blue guy is great. Dubba D, dubba D, dubba die, chat. Dubba D, dubba die. You know. <laughs> I hate this map. This is so fucking tacky. Wait, I don't need uh, to rewrite red black trees a dozen times in university. I mean, look, it's at one point in your career, you'll have to do it and you will have no documentation, no articles, no blogs, uh, no, uh, you know, nothing that would really help guide you and how to design that or do that or when to do it. That is information that you you have to memorize. You have to learn that. I do think algorithms are good. I think everyone should learn algorithms. Uh, but in reality, I don't think people have capacity to learn algorithms in school. I don't. Um, like, yeah, of course, people can learn and regurgitate them, but they don't have the basic programming skills uh, to understand when to apply those things effectively. Um, and that's a big issue. Like, it's, uh, it's pretty fucking terrible knowledge to have, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have your driver's ed instructor teach you how to do donuts uh, because you have more important things that you need to fucking learn first. Um, if everyone, if everyone is learning the basics of how to drive a car in driver's ed, then sure, we'll do some donies in the parking lot. But like, <laughs> right, it's the, it's the same with, um, it's, it's the same shit with programming. If you can't fucking tell me when to use a for loop, we probably shouldn't be teaching you algorithms yet. I can't remember who it was, but there's an idea uh, that you should write a compiler at school. I, I don't know. <laughs> That's really irrelevant nowadays. I, I Look, I, I would like for that to be the case, but I don't think it's realistic for that to be the case. In the same way, I think it would be awesome if by first grade most people knew calculus and diffy cues. Uh, that would be great, uh, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, and I'm pretty sure if we tried to teach a bunch of first graders uh, diffy cues and calculus, uh, we'd probably end up in a situation where they would really have bad uh, reading and writing skills and, and things that maybe should be taught uh, more for their skill level. What is a for loop? <laughs> Negative IQ viewer, hell yeah. <laughs> All right. I have a friend who likes writing compilers for fun. Yeah, writing compilers is, is really valuable. Um, it's a skill that is, is really important. I love compiler dev. I think, it's, I think it's good. Problem is when students learn algorithms, they try to apply it to everything, and it uh, stops good engineering. Yeah, I mean, once again, people don't know when to apply these things, right? A lot of people, like, this is how a lot of people's education works and higher education works. They will apply the hardest thing they know because they're going to equate difficulty with correctness and application, right? Um, and that's, that's why you see the, like, R, I am very smart people. The, the thing that got their minds to blow up and challenge them the most, that's the shit that they regurgitate and cram down people's throat and talk about being so cool. It's, it's the most obscure, hardest thing that they did uh, that they keep trying to find a use for. Um, in reality, in a lot of computer science, the right solution is the easiest one, right? When I want to sort 10 things, um, I'm not going to use a sorting network. I'm not going to use a highly optimized sorting algorithm. I'm going to use the most basic fucking sorting algorithm I can possibly use because it saves line of co lines of code. Or I'd use a language that actually has sort built in, like Rust, like a great language like Rust. Um, 
But yeah, there's a lot of situations where the correct solution is actually just the simplest solution. Um, even if it might be 10 times slower, it turns out it doesn't matter that that thing that you do one millisecond every 10 minutes, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's 10 times slower. <laughs> wow, shocker, shocker. <laughs> you don't need to hyper optimize every single thing that you do. Whew, it's crazy. Recursion is the ultimate solution to everything. Oh, I hate recursion. All right. But perf. What is this game? This is Xenotic. Q sort it is. Hell yeah. Lead code is hi hiring as a cancer on the industry. Yeah, it's terrible. It's uh it's just a it's a fake. It's a fake little club. <laughs> Everyone studies uh lead code. Everyone practices some bullshit problems and then tries to impress everyone. It's it's pretty stupid. I feel like I remember this map, but I don't know why. I don't remember the slime at the start. Oh, this is icy. Yeah. Ah, yeah. I hate uh, slippery floors. They're just really hard. I don't. I don't know why. I think it's because I play with high ping. I also don't know how to do them. I think that that might be the one of the reasons why I suck at these is because I literally don't know how to do them. What's the alternative to lead code hiring? Um, you know, talk about things on people's resumes, ask them about the skills that they have, uh, what kind of languages they like to program in, uh, have a couple questions of, of how they would architect or design things. Ask them historical things they've worked on. Ask them about projects that they like and solutions that they've had to problems. Um, I don't know. Something, something maybe relevant to their... Uh, maybe something relevant to their background. Something like that, you know? Because, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe, uh, maybe some programmers have different skill sets, and sometimes having different skill sets is valuable to a team. Like, sometimes you want your operating system developers to understand how to build operating systems, and sometimes you want your user interface developers to know how to build a user interface. And I, I know, I look, I know that is a rat, uh, that's a radical idea, and, and I know it's not going to catch on, uh, but, but that might be, uh, that might be relevant. <laughs> well, calm down. That's fringe as fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Yup. If they don't have a hundred repositories, don't hire them. Yeah. No, UI people need to learn how to sort in the most efficient way. <laughs> Full stack. God. Oh, fuck this map, dude. Fuck that map. The keyword here is talk. Yeah, a discussion. Yeah. I know that's a, that's a radical idea. You know what? I don't think I'm even remotely in focus, am I? I don't have my flute. I gotta get my flute.
just when I thought I could put it away. Let's see. Uh, oh. Oh, and then we'll focus here. Wait. I can't believe I didn't even focus this fucking camera. That is some low quality streaming. There we go. There we go. Now we're in focus. Hakari, thank you so much for the Twitch Prime sub. Hell yeah. Now you can read chat while eating this Pop Tart. We need a flute emote. Yeah, we do. That's an awesome view. Hell yeah, it is. I used to dabble in JavaScript and Notepad++. I mean, I just use Vim. Isn't that the same? I'm a full stack develop developer, and if terrible, but the only reason why, uh, it's because I'm the only person working on the project. Yup. Can you order your two times 80 core arm server? I mean, I don't have a use for it, so no. Crazy Wix, thank you so much for the five months of support. Hell yeah. Vim lets you search and replace without developing carpal tunnel. Hey, someone's got to do regex. Are you in Washington? I am. What do you use your servers for? I use them to find bugs in software. Isn't that, isn't that thrilling? <laughs> the biggest indicator for jobs, job performance, um, is, is basically recommendations. <laughs> That's about it. Like, recommendations are the biggest thing you can get. Interviews are a fucking joke, dude. They're so stupid. You're so smart. Yeah, that's why I got all the monitors. They add to my IQ. <laughs> are they set up for fuzzing? Yeah, most of them are. In most cases, it's not how much you know, but who you know. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd actually say that's a pretty good indicator for uh, a lot of skill as well, unfortunately. That doesn't mean it's the only indicator or a good indicator, but it is definitely an indicator. If you have a, a couple of the best people in the industry who can vouch for you, you're probably not shit. <laughs> that headset looks very comfy. It is. It's fucking awesome. I've got two interviews for junior, um, I don't know what view dev position is. Um, any tips? Not really. I, I don't, I don't interview well, so I don't have really good uh, tips on that. Unfortunately, my, my tips for interviews are typically like effectively like just be yourself <laughs> and, uh, be okay with not getting a job. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, To me, interviews are more about uh, interviewing the company than having them interview me. I wanted to figure out if, if that is a, a company that I want to work for. Um, in a lot of interviews, it's pretty obvious that it's not. So, Oh, dude. Why are Pop-Tarts so delicious? <laughs> Um, 
Would I like to be on that position, but I'm looking for a first one? Absolutely, yeah. Gotta, you gotta, you gotta kind of just get in there for the first one. I would say for like a first job, here's my, here's my advice. And everyone's gonna hate this advice. But, uh, just take it. Just take it. It's gonna suck. You're gonna quit. You're gonna have to leave for more pay. You're not gonna get promoted. Just take the fucking job. And understand that that's gonna happen. And that's totally fine. Because it'll make you a much better person. And it'll make you appreciate and understand a lot more what you want. It'll look good on CV. You need to start somewhere. Yeah. I wish companies answered to my job in applications even with a no. Oof, dude. Big oof. I get responses. I just get told that I'm not a good enough programmer for the position. Especially given the current climate, take the job and either grind it out for a good recommendation, good statistics, just to try to get promoted uh, if it's a decent place. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my, my first job was shit. My second job couldn't accommodate my pay. And my third job couldn't accommodate my pay. And it was like, yeah, I, I had like six years in, or seven years in jobs that basically I was forced to leave by things that weren't necessarily related to the projects or code or interesting things like that. That's how it works. Like it's those, those years you will still learn. You will still learn a shit ton during those years. So it's important to just learn. If someone's paying you 30 grand to learn or someone's paying you 50 grand to learn, it doesn't fucking matter because you're still learning. Um, and I would say people learn less as they, uh, make more. Um, and that's largely because eventually you peak out. Eventually you peak out at the level of effort that you're willing to put into something um, and the level of feedback that you're looking for, right? A lot of people talk about like knowledge and experience and blah, blah, blah. That stuff's relatively important. But like in reality, uh, pretty much everyone who you see who's like massively skilled probably just does it a shit ton more than you do. Like Kind of how it goes. You think money over company? Hell no. Fuck no. Fuck no. I'd turn down a shitty company offer for double the pay. No problem. Turn that shit down instantly. Fuck no. Now there's a price. There's a price. Like if you want me to... If you want me to run pen tests and click buttons and, and give you green green lights and run some uh, GitHub code and make some signatures for random shit and uh, run an AV scan every couple weeks. There is a price that I will do that. It's just not cheap. What are your big red flags? Companies who don't know what they're hiring for. Companies who are hiring for a position and have no idea what the fuck they're hiring for, right? And and that's going to be like, you go interview to be an OS developer and they give you like, how would you design this JavaScript code? Yeah, I'm fucking out. I'm, I'm walking out of that interview, mid-interview, 100%. Don't fucking waste my time. Um... Will you come back to uh, WoW Shadowlands? Uh, seems like awesome experience, like an awesome experience. I haven't tried it yet. I don't know. I haven't played WoW Retail in a while, so I don't even have an itch to do it. Um, let's see. Why so many screens on the right? I, I gotta gotta fit all my code on there. <laughs> Moosh. Oh. Thank you so much, Moosh, for the uh, tier one sub for five months now. Thank you so much for that. Hell yeah. 
my current job slash inter uh, internship, every other new hire was put on well-documented and battle-tested stuff. Uh, I got put on a relatively new, very niche domain project. Oh, that actually sounds really fun. I, I, I like niche things. I'm all, I'm all about niche things. How did the Maple Story reverse engineering go? I finished that. It was pretty good. It, it went about the same as I expected. Um, what are the biggest things that first timers should be aware uh, about that you could avoid being burnt on? Uh, like, um, and, and for 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 what? Developers, security people. Oh, you know what? I I can do better than that. I can I can speak to neither developers nor security engineers, and I can give you advice for literally everyone. Soft skills are more important than whatever you think is more important at the time. 100%. Learn how, to, learn how to run a meeting. Learn how to deliver slides. Learn how to not look like you're slacking off. Uh, learn how to not be tacky. Learn how to read a fucking room, right? Like, <laughs> the, those things are uh, more important than anything else. There are plenty of people who get accepted to give talks at every fucking security conference who have one-tenth of the skills of people who go out there who have not as great speaking skills. Um... You will always get paid more, be more successful, and be more recognized by like a factor of 10. If you have twice the amount of soft skills as someone who has 10x the like actual raw technical knowledge, you will outperform in the living shit out of them. You'll be, you'll get more promotions, you'll get more pay, you'll get more recognized, you'll get more shout outs, more management will know your name. It like soft skills. Soft skills, soft skills. Um, those things are important. And don't look like you don't give a shit. Like, everyone will, will understand when you put 15 minutes to make those slides, everyone knows. Everyone fucking knows. You might think you pulled a fast one because you made, like, a good image in there and, like, you got a cool transition in it and you found a cool background template on, like, the fifth link on Google so that way it's not obvious that it's just a template. Everyone knows. Everyone knows. <laughs> Everyone knows, dude. <laughs> The Fang engineer here, this could not be more true. Yeah, the difference between a Fang engineer and like a slightly above average engineer uh, is being able to communicate your skills. Um, that's not necessarily true. There is, Fang engineers are typically top notch. But soft skills are important. Um, if you want to grow really fast and you want to be management, then you kind of have to throw people under the bus. Um, or... There's two paths to management. There's one that's really easy, and that shit talk everyone else, and then find a manager who's also a piece of shit and does the same thing, and you'll rise really well under them. And then the second way, which is a lot harder because you actually have to care, and that is put people under your wing and get people talking about you. Have people at the company who are like, holy shit, um, I asked this person this question, and they answered, like, and they helped me a lot. Like... I wouldn't be in the position I, I were in without that person. Uh, you could be that person too. That's a, that's a good good way to go as well. Um, have you seen Cutter, the reverse engineering tool? I have not. I don't really do much reverse engineering. If I do reverse engineering, it's it's typically uh, pretty pretty manually done. All right. Um, let's see, I've good soft, soft skills, uh, but I have a bad depressive personality disorder doesn't go well together. Yeah, I mean that's that that's 
that's kind of fair, I think, for most high-functioning people in tech. Um, I think I think everyone kind of kind of goes through that, um, and I think that's uh, I think that's more common than than I think people think. I actually don't think I've met anyone who's a top performer and isn't uh, pretty depressed or anxious or has some some major thing kind of going on in their head. Um, yeah, it turns out it turns out it takes a, a slightly dysfunctional brain to invest the time into work, right? Um, pretty much any functioning brain is going to recognize that it's not healthy to invest all of your time into work and that the monetary compensation that you get from work is never going to be more rewarding than just having a good friend group that you go out with and do random shit with. Um, and it kind of takes a fucked brain to, to really get uh, good at, at anything to a pretty uh, crazy level. <laughs> it feels bad, man. It's, it's kind of true, though. Um, like, look, you might, you might look at levels or some of these pay things. You might see, like, software engineers at Facebooks and Googles making you know, 200 or 300 grand a year, but those people also are basically studying 80 hours a week to do what they do. Um, yeah, it's typically not, uh, not great. Not great. Been on meds since I was 12 years old, man. Uh, and now even have an invalidity pension, uh, and it isn't getting much better, but crap happens. That's really sad to hear. I'm sorry to hear about that. I hope that there are at least some things that inspire you or get you going and, and get you excited, for sure. I think that applies to all things. I don't think any greatest of all time in any field is a normal person by any stretch. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think a depression is, is one of the big things that I think leads to a lot of engineers, or not engineers, but people in general excelling in their field. Because um, in a lot of situations, uh, those people are never happy with what they know. Um, they're, they're never going to, they're never going to appreciate what they know, how they're recognized, the money that they make, the, the fame that they have, the, the people that they make happy, the, the closeness they have with their friends, their family. Um, yeah. And that those are typically the people who get exceptionally good at, at certain things. Um, and it's also why, uh, like depressed people also always seem so outgoing and happy and friendly, uh, because, yeah, it turns out, um, turns out people, like, want to be better at being social, so they try really fucking hard and burn themselves out on trying to do things that no one does. <laughs> no one, no one is exceptionally good at a lot of these things, and, and I think uh, a lot of times, for a lot of forms of depression, it, a lot of times it's just an unnecessary, like, it's a completely unreasonable expectation uh, with your current stature in something, whether that is your your current ability to make friends or your your current ability to you know flirt with people at a bar, or your current ability to do your job or get promoted, and I th I think a lot of times people have outrageous uh, expectations for themselves, and then you then you really start to struggle. It's fucking rough, dude. Looked way different in the life of a software engineer at Google videos. <laughs> well. Uh, with eating the whole day. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, at a lot of those big companies, some people do find like good ways to coast and be casual and relax. And uh, I think that's what happens when a lot of people burn out. I think a lot of people burn out to a healthier life. Um, they, they recognize like, holy shit, why am I doing this? Why am I basically saying no to every time my friends want to hang out to make... 50% more money and to work twice as much? Is it really worth it? No. The answer is absolutely fucking no. Um, or they just die from overwork. Oof. Um, how do you get meaningful, meaningful real-world work under your belt? I have some fun side projects done, but I'm a little intimidated by larger, legitimate open-source projects. Um, then you're already getting that experience, and you just don't recognize it yet. 
<laughs> well, welcome to my every week. Oh, let me just, uh, I'm just gonna reverse this maple story thing so I can figure out the damage formulas and do all this shit. And then five days later, you're like, fuck, I have really wasted this month doing this thing. And like, the only thing that I've learned from this is like, massive improvement to my Ghidra skills, learned how to write some Ghidra scripts, uh, learned how to re reverse C sharp, which I've never done before in my life, learned a couple ways that those tools failed, made some patches to them so they got fixed. Oh shit, maybe I actually did something relevant when I was doing my random project that just seemed like it was for fun, but it actually got me some really relevant skills. Um, yeah, in reality, you're probably getting those skills. Um, yeah, uh, contributing to large uh, projects often requires some social skills and collaboration skills and the ability to kind of uh, do some give and take and, and find some middle ground. Uh, but ultimately, if, if you have projects that are engaging you and just causing you to write code and do things, uh, you're already getting that knowledge. <laughs> You're just already getting that knowledge. <laughs> you just don't realize it yet. Or you'll never realize it, because a lot of people don't. Um, yeah. Um... That feeling when you're a documentation writer and the only thing you can contribute is the thing no developer cares. Oh, sorry, you, you said a you said a word in there. Uh, you're a uh, do, 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 doku doku mentation do, doku min, do, I don't know what that word is. I've never seen that before. Um, I don't know. That's uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> oh man yes please pour me a tall glass of that imposter syndrome oh yeah let's, let's all raise raise your imposter syndrome and take a, a big swig of that uh feelings of incompetence mm. Mm. oh no one's gonna appreciate me this code's never gonna work this PR is going to get rejected. My boss is going to realize I don't do shit. I can't write code like anyone else. Cheers. <laughs> ah. Might be a stupid question, but how do you focus on work uh, for multiple hours a day? IRC, uh, you streamed like 24 hours straight at some point and probably coded for like 90% of the time. Yeah, I mean, um, I just like what I code. <laughs> I just, I like what I code. Um, I, so here, here's the thing. I'm not writing code for anyone else. Look, chat, y'all are cute. Y'all are a cute bunch. Like, it, it's obvious from, from, all of, from all of these faces that I see in chat. Uh, you're all you're all pretty cute, but ultimately I'm not writing this code for you. I'm writing this code for me I'm writing this code because I have fun doing it If there is something that chat wants or a feature that you think would be cool. I have no problem saying I don't give a shit I'm, I'm I have no problem turning down PRs ignoring PRs doing absolutely nothing that is the beauty of working on independent projects with literally no one that they're for, except yourself. It turns out I can just write code that I want to write, and uh, I can often get pretty engaged in that. <laughs> That's right, we don't care about your code. Yeah, exactly, see? Ignoring PRs increases your power level. I mean, it makes me feel bad, but it's one of the reasons why I don't like open sourcing code, because it's going to happen. Like, I'm just going to, I'm going to roll over, I'm going to see a PR in the morning, and it's going to be adding third-party code to my code base, and I'm not going to want it. I'm not going to want it, and I don't want to explain it, because I've explained it a billion times, and I'm kind of an asshole. So I'm just going to, like, sit there, and then, like, two weeks later, I'm like, oh, well, now it's going to look bad, because I waited too long, and now I'm going to feel bad, because I waited too long, 
So I'm just gonna push this off because I, I, I'm kind of anxious about doing this thing, so I'm not gonna do it. And then like a month later, you're like, fuck, I really should respond to that PR. And then two months later, you're like, they probably forgot about it, we're good. <laughs> oh man. No, in reality, like, a lot of the projects that I do, I just do for myself. That reminds me about a feature request that I received a year ago. Oof. Oof. <laughs> and I didn't implement it yet? Oh, come on, Desi. You got to get on that. Is your life and lifestyle entirely supported by your code efforts? For example, in your description, you talk about some, uh, uh, talk about some taking, uh, plus my, uh, Three months for coding? Um, is this where you make your money? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I make most of my money from my work, but I also make a decent amount doing trading on the stock market, uh, and I'll do some personal projects and contracts on the side here and there. Um, kind of varies. I don't know. Um, historically, I've made like half my income from my job, but in modern days, I probably make like 80% of my income from my job because I just don't care about money as much anymore. So I just like, I don't bother. Like my, my business, like my LLC expired. So I just haven't, I haven't even bothered to pay the $50 renewal fee. Cause I, I just don't care. I just don't care. Um, let a bot close the PR. Beep boop. One second after the PR went out. Beep boop. This is a bot. Uh, just saying, uh, you know, things are, are looking interesting here, but unfortunately, um, it, this doesn't pass the uh, build uh, test uh, thing. And then they make another PR that's to fix the build test that's just like assert true equals false uh, in the build system. And it's like, sorry, that's not a bug. That's not a bug. It, that commit did not pass the, the old build system. So unfortunately, I cannot accept it. Time for a Wall Street Bets degen chat. Oh, God. Fuck Wall Street Bets, dude. Fuck everything about that sub. Jesus Christ. So stupid. It's a bunch of, like... Just go to fucking Vegas, dude. You will make more money going to Vegas than you'll ever make trading. Ever. Ever. You're never going to be a successful trader. Don't fucking bother. It's so stupid. Stop. Stop! One second ago, implying builds work that fast. Oh yeah, I gotta provision my my VM. Stonks only go up. I mean, that's true. That's that's pretty fair. There is no reason to short right now. There there is nothing that would cause the market to go down. Made forty dollars trading today. Worth it. Hell yeah. Oops. <laughs> Wall Street bets are the best. I made thirty dollars by investing thirty thousand. Oh, man. I hope that means you kept $30 because that's a, that's a good ROI right there. Not even with the pandemic will, will it make the stock market go down. I mean, yeah. Feds, uh, we got some good inflation going on. It's nice. Um, hey, I know you use Kimu a lot, but do you use hypervisors in your lab like Overt, ESXi, or Hyper-V? No, I mean, I'm... I'm only ever going to use Hyper-V on Windows, and I'm only ever going to use KVM on, uh, on Linux. They're, they're, just the, they're just the best. <laughs> like, Hyper-V is the best on Windows, and KVM is the best on Linux. Pandemic doesn't make stocks go down when the Fed just gives out a trillion dollars. It's nice. It wasn't a trillion dollars. It was like three. It was like six trillion in total. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. Not bad. A good little stim. Um. Let's see. You search for any KVM or hyper hyper X escapes? No, I haven't. Supposedly, the stimulus bill had a bunch of copyright stuff stuck in. Yeah, I'm kind of excited for that. I'm pretty hyped for that. 
I, I hope that I hope they make it so you go to prison if you uh, get DMCA'd, uh, because it will uh, completely delete the music industry, and I can't wait for that. Um, it's gonna be a bunch of fucking idiots who think that uh, it's gonna make them a lot of money, when in reality it means that uh, no one's gonna find out new music anymore. And uh, congratulations, your entire industry is gonna half. So I'm actually all for that. I think it's fantastic. I think it is basically suicide by the music industry. Um, and I think it's fantastic. I can't wait. Did chat make you self-conscious about your mouse pad? No, I'm just cleaning it off. It's got some crumbs on it. It's annoying. For the record, uh, that part of the bill makes streaming services more illegal than they used to be. Yep. No, I'm all for it. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I can't wait for a bunch of these C-suite execs to think that people are going to go and buy physical copies of albums from the local store again. Um, when ultimately they're just going to stop and people are going to start making music without labels and for each other. Uh, because the average, like, good musician in a local town is good enough to make music that's interesting and intriguing enough. Uh, that we'll just cut out the middlemen and just delete the music industry. I can't wait. It's fantastic. No one gives a fuck. No one gives a fuck. Everyone's just going to pirate their music again. And everyone's just going to start listening to more local music, and the spread of music is basically going to evaporate. Because no one is being told what music is popular via the radio anymore, um, and streaming services will get killed if the music industry has their way, and people won't be able to hear a catchy jingle in a TikTok, and then go look up the song, and then binge that artist for a month like I do all the time. Uh, I can't wait, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. How am I supposed to listen to K-pop then? I mean, K-pop, you do have to sell your soul if you want to listen to. <laughs> oh, man. It's good. Wait a minute. You watch TikTok? Not really, but I watch, uh, I watch YouTube. I feel like uh, a lot of my, a lot of the things that I end up listening to uh, come from like random snippets that I hear that I then go and look at the music. Gamo says a PhD in cynicism. Hey, I think Cynic's a fantastic band. I, I think, uh, I think Traced in Air is a fantastic album. Everyone should be, everyone should listen to that at some point. Um, I don't know. Always been a really big fan of Cynic, to be honest. <laughs> I don't like their more recent stuff. Honestly, I don't know if other metal listeners have noticed this, but it feels like all the metal bands that I used to listen to like 10 years ago have basically resorted to making um, acoustic copies of their old albums. Cynic has done this. Catatonia has done this. It's just like acoustic spinoffs of their old songs, and it's, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. Um, exactly what I meant. See? Death Grips, ex-military, can't even be on Spotify because of some copyright bullshit with one of the samples it used. Noise. Noise. Hehehe. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right. I think, uh, chat, any other, any other questions? Any other questions before we write code? I like how many people want us to write code, but ultimately we're gonna, we're gonna lose viewers when we write code, right? The engagement with chat is what chat wants. Chat wants the warm, loving embrace of Gamozo. And that is, uh, that's what I'm giving you right now. Are you gonna rewrite World of Warcraft in Rust? Ugh. Uh, time to become a just chatting streamer. Ha, oh, ha! Oh. I'll be, I'll, I'll be able to pull that off. Tell me I'm beautiful, masters. I tell you that every day. You should just know that by now. Got to get your shit together. Stop being such a downer. Take your fucking compliments. Not even just chatting, just another, just, rather just monologue. Oh, God. I'm going to have to start getting props, some, like, puppets. I'll get, like, a, a one of the, like, puppeteer, like, curtains, and uh, I'll start, like, puppeteering. Like, I'll, I'll do, like, mock interviews with little puppets with people like that. I'll, uh, 
I'll do some mock interviews. Um, I've been trying to debug a whistle issue. The uh, most information I have is an error message. The system cannot find the file specified. Everything I've been able to extract is uh, source file name and line number. I still can't understand why it fails. Have you considered uh, showing the system where the file is? Put, putting the file in the location? Um, that's, my, uh, that's my top tier advice right now that I got for you. I don't know. Sometimes Procmon's good for debugging those things. Just look for the last, uh, like, create file or open file error. Usually that's good enough. I get that you don't intraday, but could you? Yeah, I mean, I used to intraday a lot. I used to do a lot of automated trading and stuff. But uh, I found it's just not, it's not worth it. It's, it's often too expensive. Um... Once you spend five grand a month in commission to get an extra 1% return over SMP, you start to wonder if it's really worth it. <laughs> um, it doesn't fail to any open files. Uh, sounds like someone probably, someone probably just like put the easiest error code to throw because uh, they were too lazy to make an error code. So like, I don't know, file not found error. Fuck it, throw it in there. <laughs> I'm realizing how dumb day trading is. I'll give interday swing trading a go. Yeah. The longer you hold trades, the better. It's just how it is. Just do long-term trading. You're always going to be better. Better off. Error, the operation was successful. Oh, that's my favorite. Invert a binary tree and COBOL on a whiteboard. This isn't a banking job interview. <laughs> I suggest drawing... A uh, huge red circle around the file with a big red arrow pointing to. There you go. I was about 20,000 shares of some shit stock. Oh, good job on the commish, dude. Grats on the commish. I bet the broker's really happy. <laughs> Wall Street Bets is basically directly uh, making... Um, uh, what's, the, what's the shitty trading app that has really expensive fees? And prioritizes options trading. Commissions on equities trades in 2020. Hey. I've definitely fat... F yeah, Robin Hood. Yeah. Yeah. Like... Fuck Robin Hood, dude. I, I hate that company so much. It's just... They're leaning in so much. Doesn't have fees. They just fuck you on the spread. Yeah. Sounds exactly like a, a fucking, um, Robinhood is, Robinhood has basically decided that people no longer like to YOLO trade, uh, uh, Forex, and so they just switch people to options, um, and it's basically the Forex of options. It's super slimy, they take deposits in all sorts of weird ways, um, it's like semi-official trading accounts, it, it's just really fucky, it's, uh, yeah, it feels like Forex. I don't know if anyone's done Forex before, uh, but what I used to do is I would... So basically, if, you, if you've never, never done Forex, Forex has no commission, uh, but they, they make the money on the spread, right? They, they widen the spread and they make the commission on the spread because the, the spread is like much larger than the actual underlying spread. Um, so a lot of the Forex companies would supply like, for the first month, you get to be an epic trader if you deposit X amount of money, right? So I would just deposit money into these accounts so that I could get like the premium status, which effectively had no spread. I would then just do like scalping trades for a while. Uh, and then after a month when I lost the status and the spread went in, I just fucking dip. It was fantastic. It was basically zero risk uh, uh, gains. It was fantastic. Of course there was a risk, but it was, uh, uh, gave me a pretty huge advantage. Did you hear about the guy who didn't know how option spread works and he killed himself because one leg got exercised before the other over the weekend? Um, he thought he was 300k in debt, but he, in reality, he turned a profit. Yeah, I mean, people don't know how options work who are trading options and they look like fucking idiots and it's really stupid. And yeah, the, like the SEC needs to SEC needs to uh, regulate options. Um, I think options need to have the same 25 grand uh, requirement that day trading has. 
I recognize that day trading options does have that 25K account balance restriction, um, but I think that to be able to use options at all should also have that. Same with futures. Futures should have a 25K limitation. In fact, I think futures should probably have like a 100K limitation and options should have probably a 50K limit and the day trading limit should be bumped up to 50K as well. Um, the 25K limit's way too low, uh, and it needs to apply to options. People, people need to stop trading options. It's ridiculous. It's really bad. It's, it's so bad for people. I disagree. Nothing wrong with selling covered calls and dicking around with uh, long single leg options. Uh, yeah, I do think there's something wrong with an industry where 90% of people are losers, uh, where 90% of people lose money. Um, yeah, I think that's a big issue. I, I think that it needs to be regulated uh, hev more heavily than gambling because it is worse than gambling. You have better odds in Vegas than you do in options trading or really any form of short-term trading. Uh, it's ridiculous that this is allowed. Um, it's, it's really, it's really, really high risk, uh, gambling. Uh, it, it needs to, it needs to be regulated. People do not have the self-control to do it. So it needs to be regulated. Sorry. Sorry. It's not acceptable to me that uh, there are companies that are basically profiting off of uh, people on Wall Street bets who see the allure of someone who makes a shit ton of money who's actually like a 1 in 10,000. Uh, and they think that they have a chance and they actually just hemorrhage money. Uh, indefinitely. It's uh, it's really, really, really bad. Um, like binary options got regulated for that reason and weekly options and monthly options are basically the same thing as binary options. Um, yeah, I am very, very, very strongly against that. Um, options are, are terrible. They should be used for hedge. I think people need to not have the ability to uh, uh, trade with options unless they uh, own the underlying Hell yeah, that's my options rant. It's true, I guess I never saw it that way because I've never done anything particularly insane. Yeah, um, th those stats are public, right? The stats on how many traders are successful is public. It's between like 80 and 90%, and every year uh, fewer and fewer people make money. And that's because Robinhood. Seriously, like literally single-handedly, it's because of Robinhood. Like... Five years ago, there were mainly like gambling addicts who would do trading. Now it's literally everyone. Like people who have no business trading options and have no idea the, the basic equations that go into options pricing and are trading options. It's really bad. It's really bad. Um, it's super bad. I don't like it. Uh, people get fucking faded all day long. Like... It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Um, didn't retail traders uh, mark up a uh, makeup of total investors jump by like 15% this year? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not sure. My last question, what do you think about Ethereum 2.0? I hate Ethereum. I don't I don't like I don't like the concept of most cryptocurrencies. Options explain like I'm five. Uh, basically, you get paid for the delta between the strike price of the option and the stock at the end of a fixed duration. So if you have a, an option that is a call for uh, Apple at $200 a share and Apple closes at $210 a share, then you make $10 per option. Um, uh, in some future expiration date, right? All these options have an expiration date. Um, and if Apple closes at uh, two hundred nine ninety nine, then you lost all of your money. So yeah, that's how it works. Um, basically, you got paid the delta between uh, between an option and uh, the stock, and basically pricing of that, like how are thing at when options expired, they're either worth the uh, the delta between the stock price and the um, the strike price of the option. The strike price is basically the price that's associated with the option. Um, but of course, you can't have it be worthless or worth that amount 
up until the point that the option expires. So basically, you take into account the volatility of the stock, the underlying stock, and you basically calculate the probability that it expires over a certain price, right? So Apple might be at 205, you might have a strike at 210, and the, the option will still have a value there, even though you are uh, out of the money, right? Out of the money basically is a term for that. You will not get paid when this option expires if you were to flatline until the expiration. Um, so effectively, you, get pay, you, you pay for the odds that it crosses that threshold. Um, and often it's very cheap, right? If I want to go buy a 5% a out of the money call or put on a stock, um, it's likely going to be nearly free. It's gonna cost me pennies. But once that is in the money, once it goes over that strike price, it becomes equivalent to the number of shares, right? So effectively, I can buy I can buy an option that's heavily out of the money on Apple. Maybe it's 5, 10% out of the money on Apple. And I can spend about 10 cents on that. And if for some reason Apple were to move up 5% and make it to that strike price, now it's the same as if I am holding stock, right? Um, stock with the delta. But the, uh, the, the delta between... So if it were to go up 5% and I hit the strike price and I have... 100 options contracts, and I paid four cents for them. So that means I paid $4, right, to have these 100 options. Um, now, if it were to go up 5%, if it were to go up another 5% from there, it is as if I have a 100 shares of Apple that I just observed a 5% gain on. So you are able to get leverage in the 10,000s, right? In the in the millions, right? If, if something moves in your favor by like 5 or 10% and the volatility only expects it to move like a week, uh, like 2 or 3% until it expires, you end up getting in the order of millions times leverage. And this leads to situations where people make a $100 investment and they make $100,000, right? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's effectively what options are. Um, and pricing options is very complex, mainly pricing options at expiration is trivial because it's just that. It's the number of options multiplied by the delta, uh, mined with zero, right? So if, if it went against you, you get nothing, you get nothing, um, and if it went for you, then you get something. But... More specifically, if you actually want to know what options are, a call option is basically giving you the right to buy, or actually, it depends if it's an American or European option, which have slightly different things. We're not going to talk about that. But we're going to say um, a call option gives you the right to buy stock at that price at expiration. So that means if I buy Apple 210 calls, for a month from now, and Apple is currently at $200, then a month from now, I can buy Apple for $210. It doesn't matter if it's over or under. In reality, if Apple shares are $190 and I can buy them for $210, I'm going to just not exercise those options and drop them, and that's why they lose all of their value. But if Apple is at $250 at the end of that month, yeah, I'm going to exercise those options and basically purchase those options for 200 or those shares for $210 a share. Um, in the same way, puts are a right to sell options at a specific price. And then you have selling calls and puts, which is going short those options. And that basically puts you on the other side. So if I were to sell an option, a call option for 210 and Apple's at 210, I am basically saying that um, I will get paid um, if Apple stays below $210, right? I'm short that option. I'm going to get paid that, that premium, uh, that option premium. Um, Shorting options is basically being the house. It's it's effectively what it's like to be um, uh, the the dealer or the casino, right? You have you have capped gains but uncapped losses. Whereas on the other side of options, you have uncapped gains and capped losses. And what that means is that that premium, the the basically the the difference between the true expiration value of an option and the current price of an option 
is the premium that you pay to the seller of the option to have the uh, ability. It's basically like an insurance premium. Um, and since you have uncapped losses, of course, the people who have uncapped losses and capped gains are the ones who are going to get the advantage. They're the people who are going to get that house advantage and enjoy uh, basically that risk-free gain. That is how that works. But yeah. Um... Why not just buy them more expensive and then sell them later when they're hopefully over 210 again? Because you don't know that they'll hit 210. <laughs> like, that's just trading in a nutshell. Um, if, if, you, if you don't know where something's going to end up, then you can't hold it until it ends up there. Uh, you will just, you're, you're basically taking a risk of, is it going to go up or should I, should I hold it to hope that it goes up and I recover my losses? Or am I going to keep losing more? Um, that being said, for options, since you have capped losses, there's almost no reason to close a trade. There's almost no reason to sell options once they've become valueless, uh, right? So you just hold them, and then they just expire valueless anyways. But all of that is priced in, right? There's no free lunch. No one is writing these fucking options contracts uh, and not taking an advantage, right? Options are basically insurance. They are... They are uh, they are hedging tools. They are ways to prevent you from losing more than you want to lose on a position. It's a way to change the risk of a certain asset into the risk of a different asset. Um, and you can do that all entirely with options. And of course, just like real insurance, there is a cost there. And the cost there is basically options are always priced for a slight amount more than the actual odds that... Well, we don't know the odds that something will go up or down, but basically options will always be priced in a way that you will make the minimum amount of money at expiration time. Um, and that's how it works. Have you placed a short yet? I pretty much all, only short options. Shorting options is pretty much all I do. It's uh, basically risk-free uh, gains. So... Theta gang, hell yeah. Yeah, give me that fucking theta. Sell fucking, sell shorts on highly out of the money things and sell them at ask such that people have to buy into you and spread that, uh, uh, buy that spread. And you can end up basically doubling your money instantaneously. It's fantastic. Uh, slightly related but also unrelated question. Since you said you didn't think most people should trade, uh, what is your opinion on someone who is not a very financially clued in educating themselves on this matter and then investing a portion of their income into something like an ETF? Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty basic. I would say, like, everyone should just put their money in uh, basically ETFs and, uh, and um, like, funds. We've talked about this before. Ultimately, the best investment you have is probably to spend your money on something that actually benefits you as a person. Um, but if you really are going to invest, because you are, no one's going to actually listen to my my advice. Um, yeah, just put put all that shit in the S&P and call it a fucking day. Like, it's, it's, not, it's not worth fucking trying to pick stocks. It's just, put, put your fucking money in the S&P and uh, enjoy inflation. Enjoy inflation and, and a couple percent on top of that. Any resources on learning how to obfuscate code? Uh, learn how to deobfuscate code. Uh, learn how a learn how an intermediate language works, and then learn how basically all obfuscation techniques can be instantaneously deleted because they're trivial to just delete entirely. Um, <laughs> I think that's uh, a good way. A good way to go about it is learn how to deobfuscate code, and then see that uh, all obfuscation is pretty much trivially deleted. Um, to not give advice because of law. I'm not giving advice. I'm just, I'm just saying things. Yeah, tell everyone to not be an idiot like me and just yeet it into spy so it moves with the market. Yeah. 
There, there aren't many rich traders out there. It turns out you don't make money by trading. You make money by investing. So, invest. Um... Do you consider yourself a critic of the current market? Uh, yes, I definitely am. Um, I I've been bearish since like 2010. But, but what about all the 600% gainers I see on Wall Street bets? Oh no. Any opinion on mixed binary arithmetic and obfuscation? I'm not familiar with it, so I can't speak to it. Worst case scenario for working with obfuscated code, just lift it and put it in a VM. Yup. Yeah. Yeah, if you do just like a bunch of math that just ends up evaluating into constants, it turns out, uh, yeah, if you just do a bunch of math, you evaluate the things and then they turn into constants. <laughs> Americans' paranoia of free speech being construed as advice and being a liability. Jeez, that's, uh, that's how we got uh, the scream... Um, no warranty shit in the licenses, yeah. Ultimately, a lot of that shit isn't enforceable, so it doesn't matter. I'm not serious about it. Bullish on code? I am bullish on tech. Um, tech is still gonna print money forever. The only reason Tesla is valuable is because they're considered a tech company when they're not. Otherwise, they would be priced at 1 one-hundredth of the value that they have now because they'd be priced at their actual fucking value, which is effectively nothing. Tech companies, man. It was good. Ah. Ah. Just love your stream like a cozy podcast. Hell yeah. Hello, what are you building? We're working on an operating system, but we haven't written any code yet today. <laughs> We've been talking with chat. Chat keeps asking good questions, so we keep talking with chat. Bullish on code, bearish on fed coin. Did you catch that Seagate is making Risk V? I'm not surprised. I think all the hard drive manufacturers are going to go that way. It's cheaper. Isn't self-driving tech? It is, but it's not happening anytime soon. Um, and just like any other company, the first company to do it is going to be the one who uh, loses. <laughs> like, there's no, there's no way that Tesla is going to invest all of the money to make self-driving cars and then someone's not going to come in and not have to spend the 10 years of R&D that has been spent on making self-driving cars and not be a more profitable company. Um, that's just how it's going to go. Yeah. Um, Tesla's only priced the way it is due to Elon Musk fanboys and it's, uh, it's pretty sketchy. So Kama AI is doing, yeah, I think uh, Kama AI has a, a decent chance at basically owning the DIY market, and they're definitely going to get acquired. They can do like Sony and try to patent. You can't. You can't patent that. It's too broad. There's too much money in that industry that y you won't be able to make a patent, and even if you get a patent, it will get challenged successfully, and you'll lose. Um, they're going to do it, of course. They're going to patent everything they can because they increase the cost of future companies, uh, but they'll get overruled. Will George sell though? Yeah, of course. It's the best way to make money when you start a company is to sell. Unless he's legitimately interested in, in carrying that torch, but uh, I don't think um, eventually the, the money is too good, right? Um, what's the rhythmic motion under the desk? It's, uh, it's called legs. I have legs, and I, I move my legs, you know? Yeah. Um, opinion on the stupid article that said Google and Amazon would kill chip makers like AMD? Um, I think they will. I actually agree with that. I haven't read the article, but I agree with that. I think it'll happen. I think uh, companies are going to start making their own processors. I think that's just the way it's going to go. Um, Apple's doing it with ARM. Uh, Google and Amazon are definitely going to do it. Like, there's there's no reason you wouldn't. Like, 100%. That's what's going to happen. 
read that Microsoft's making their own chips for the servers. Uh, anyone know what Arc they'll use? I have no idea, but I wouldn't be surprised. Probably ARM. Um, like, ultimately, the, the things that made chip companies actually exist was the fact that they own their own fabs. But now that they're outsourcing their fabrication of chips to other companies, um, it really just turns into a, like, architecture and design thing. And if you're already just building off of ARM, the only design that you're really doing is making the decision of the cost of the chip and the uh, manufacturer that you want to use for the chips and then like the sizes of the caches um, and like the number of PCI lanes. And those decisions are a lot fucking easy. I'm not trying to trivialize doing chip dev. It's, it's definitely real work. Um, but historically, the, uh, the cost of chips is largely just associated with the manufacturing and the R&D of the manufacturing processes themselves such that now that Global Foundries basically is a world leader in manufacturing of chips, um, the barrier to entry to making your own chip as a company uh, is basically nothing. Um, it's like a couple million dollars, which is a fucking joke, and then having a hardware team, which is also pretty easy for a 50,000-person company to do. So, yeah. That's just how it's going to go. Do you imagine ever making a custom chip for fuzzing? Yeah, I, that's kind of on my on my radar. Um, I wonder when we're gonna get EA to make chips. So with nine ninety nine month chip subscription, Turbo for fifty nine ninety nine a month. Uh, never because EA is too slow to pivot into something that would make sense. What OS are you deving in? I'm, I'm using Linux here, um, but I'm making my own operating system. Um, what else, chat? Keep bringing stuff up. I'm actually okay with chatting right now because this is kind of the worst time to stream. I don't mind too much. Fully custom chip or a RISC or ARM-based one? A fully custom chip for sure. Uh, RISC or ARM would be inefficient for fuzzing. We need snapshot accelerated RAM. Yeah, that's what I basically build a chip around. Is a, a I would build a byte level uh, memory management unit where I'd be able to basically do ASAN and hardware, and I'd I'd probably just go from there. And then I would go for super parallel. Um, ultimately, it would be kind of more like a GPU design. I'd probably have like a ten instruction IL with no multiplies or divides, and then I'd just put a thousand cores on a chip. Um, because in fuzzing, everything scales linearly with cores, and thus there's no reason to even remotely attempt to support uh, single-threaded, single-core performance. Um, so you just go as parallel as you possibly can. Um, and then memory throughput's really big there, and uh, latencies to caches is big there. Aren't Mandelbrot's lovely? I never got the fascination with them. I know people who are really into them. Never got too into them. Good night, going to sleep EU time. See you around. Hell yeah. Hope Logitech make a G60, G600 wireless someday. I hate wireless mice. I feel like I, I'm always replacing the batteries in them. And I'm pretty much always going to go for wired peripherals. I don't know. I have a wireless mouse that I have for uh, travel, and it just never seems to work or always seems to have interference issues. All right, chat, last chance before we do dev. Last chance for your questions. <laughs> for keeping questions coming. Would love to see some actual dev already myself. I don't know. What's the difference between Intel binaries and AMD binaries? They differ slightly, but they're pretty comparable. They use the same uh, underlying architecture, but some of the instructions are different. And the way that you interact with the chips and the chipsets are, are massively different. Um, like the way that you implement a hypervisor and Intel and AMD are basically entirely different. Uh, but the difference between the instruction sets on Intel and AMD are pretty comparable. Intel has AVX 512. AMD has um, 3D now, which is kind of funny. 
Uh, AMD has some different encodings for instructions. Like, uh, it has a, a long jump in 64-bit mode, which Intel does not have, or vice versa. One of them has it. Um, AMD has, uh, like, immediates to some of the... Um, some of the bit manipulation instructions that Intel doesn't, uh, that are register-based, there are some like minor quirks like that, but they're basically binary compatible for anything that a real compiler would produce or any binary that uh, a vendor would actually ship. Uh, but they do differ. Where does your forehead end? It doesn't. It's just continuous. <laughs> Intel has processor trace, it does indeed. What do you mostly do, new follower here? We mainly do hacking and OS development here. A bunch of low-level Rust development and uh, high-performance code and operating systems. We basically just don't use libraries here. That's, that's really our uh, specialty, is we, uh, we don't use any libraries. Does that mean people with hair have a discreet forehead? Wait until you discover bangs. Sounds like my neighbors are banging. That's unfortunate. Have we hacked the camera yet? Yeah, the hammer did, camera did get hacked. The hammer. Awesome, they're trying to learn programming. Hell yeah. We do some pretty low-level advanced programming here. There might not be the most things to learn, but I think we are, uh, we're inspirational and exciting. Um, I'm interested in assembly coding while uh, I'm learning and coding Python. Do you have any suggestions? I do not. I, d I don't know the best way to learn those things other than just, you know, do them and, and suffer and, and make mistakes. Um, I'm not a huge fan of tutorials and, and traditional learning, so I don't have the best advice for that. <laughs> no libraries, aka all bugs are locally grown. Exactly. What bugs? What bugs? Also trying to get into cybersecurity. Absolutely. Good for you. Cybersecurity is a, a great place to be. Best project to learn assembly. Um, save ASDF to a file. Create a file and then write four bytes to it and then close the file. There you go. There's your, uh, there's your uh, assembly learning project. Um, no libraries. And, and do it on Windows too. And no libraries, no imports. Use syscalls. Um, do it on Windows. Syscalls directly. How many displays do you have? I have 10 set up here right now. How do you feel about the audit industry? I think it's a scam. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's not that it's a, it's, it's actually a scam. It's that the value it provides is effectively zero. So like, you do get something for the money that you pay. Uh, it's just effectively nothing. Um, I think the audit industry is a, um, it's a gateway drug to real security, so there is value there. It does breed curiosity and, and gets the conversation started about security. I run Nessus, I'm InfoSec, hell yeah. What's libraries? I'm such a noob. Libraries are basically someone else's code that you leverage. Uh, such that you can build something off of someone else's previous work. What are you bullish on? Nothing. I think everything is overpriced right now. Um, I'm, I'm bullish on uh, shorting the dollar. Do you do fuzzing stuff at Microsoft? Yeah, that's pretty much all I do. I think uh, Microsoft might be my next career hop. Yeah, Microsoft's pretty awesome. Highly recommend. Do you still uh, plan to reverse engineer and patch the timeout on your camera? What uh, what what timeout? I haven't seen a timeout this stream. Seems like it's fixed. 
<laughs> All right, chat. Um, that's the end of talking with chat. I'm going to call it there. I mean, we're still going to interact with chat. Uh, but I'm going to refill my wine, hit the head, and I'll uh, be right back and we'll just. All right, now we got the the real candlelit stream going. Look at look at that. I almost need like a backdrop for the candle so you can see it flickering, because you can't really tell direct. I guess you kind of can. I, how do I how do I get that best? We get to start the romantic part of the stream. I fucked whistle. Fuck me. Sounds like a you problem. Um, join the Discord and start hacking with us. See, exactly, exactly. I'm actually pretty impressed with this camera in the dark. It's not phenomenal, uh, but it's actually pretty good. This camera is not designed for uh, dark, and it is very dark in here right now. Like, the fact that you can see the, like, sun uh, kind of behind the mountains back there is pretty cool. You can also see the, the light, the the light on a on a tower which is pretty cool that you can see that <laughs> what a cozy stream hell yeah and there's a mosquito here let me uh, just kill that there you go problem solved i do wish i had a backdrop for that candle so it was more emphasized missing a uh, black hoodie and dubstep oh man god that sunset's Fast, didn't it? Do you only drink wine? No, I drink White Claws too. <laughs> You're in a PSC right now? Yeah, I am. It is uh, uh, five thirty right now in the afternoon. No laws, drinking claws. Hell yeah. I can actually see it more clearly on your OS, OBS preview than the actual stream. What? 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 Really? Is he joking? I can't tell. About white claws? You think I don't have a fridge full of white claws right now? You think my bachelor ass doesn't have basically entirely white claws and then like a couple meats that I'll end up grilling this week? 
Jeez. PNW sunlight? What? What sunlight? But yeah. Um, I'm actually really impressed with that uh, white balance that I'm curious if we'll be able to see like, uh, uh, I don't know if we have a full moon tonight. Because when I get a full moon, it gets fucking bright out. It gets legitimately bright. Full moon on the 29th. Okay. So we are in progress of getting there. But yeah, it can, like the moon can come through and it looks like the fucking sun. It's sick, dude. Is there any snow? Yeah, we got the first snow of the year uh, last year. Is it an astronomy stream now? I think it's too cloudy, unfortunately. I see like one star out there. Are you in California? No, I'm not. Can't afford to live in California. Are you kidding me? How am I? How am I possibly going to afford California? All right, chat. Let's fucking go. It's time to write some code. Let's do it. Let's write some fucking code. All right, so uh, basically the other time that we streamed that I'm probably going to keep referring to as yesterday because I'm an idiot, um, we basically started working on the ACPI parsing. If you've never done ACPI before, uh, first of all, congratulations. You have lived without some suffering, but ACPI is actually really, really simple. Uh, so we have the ACPI specification here. It's a couple pages long, looks like about uh, uh, 1,200 pages. So the way that we're gonna start this stream off is we're just gonna read through the ACPI specification. Um, this next part of the stream will take approximately uh, 1,200 pages. We can probably do this in about uh, four days. Um, so we're gonna start off with, uh, with the ACPI spec. We'll start with the acknowledgements. Um, the material contained herein is not a license, either expressly or impliedly, to any intellectual property owned or controlled by any of the authors or developers of this material or to any contribution thereto. <laughs> chat, you don't want that? Is that not the content that you want, chat? <sighs> fine, fine. We'll write, we'll write code. In, uh. We'll write code instead. I, I guess I guess that's not the content that chat wants. Instead, we'll start with the UEFI specification. This one is more important, I understand. This is the specification people want to hear more about. This is the one that is basically the bootloader for our operating system. And this one's about the same size. This one's about 2,500 pages. Um, so we'll just start with the, the UFI specification, I guess, instead. Uh, once again, uh, the material contained herein is not a license either expressly... Wait. Wait. We already read that. Shit. All right. I guess, I, I guess we're going to have to just... We're just going to have to write code then today, chat. Is that okay? Can we just write code? Is that, is that acceptable? Is that, is that... Do people actually say impliedly? No, no one says that. <laughs> no code, only specs. <laughs> See, here's the thing. I would... I don't know if this is admitting anything that I should feel disappointed about. But I would read an entire spec verbatim and upload the like 150 hour stream just for the meme. Because somewhere out there, someone would be like, why the fuck does this exist? Why did someone narrate the Yuffie spec? <laughs> <laughs> Bedtime stories by Gamora. Oh, so I have, I have. So, one of the things that I've thought of doing 
is maybe doing a uh, ASMR stream sometime. I I know it'd be kind of weird, but I think it would be kind of funny if we had a ASMR stream and we could write code like this, and it would be like kind of funny and also really 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 chill. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what the keyboard sounds like. This can you hear the keyboard? Let me turn up the gain on my microphone. There you go. Okay. Is this good? Do people like this? Is this is this the uh the coding stream? Here. Okay, so this is how I'm going to uh, do the ASMR stream. I'm gonna get the keyboard right in there so you can hear all the keys. Uh, let me uh, turn that down. Okay, so this is the this is the goal of the ASMR stream. Um, yeah, so uh, we're just gonna write some code here. Um, we're gonna start off by uh, uh, we're just gonna go through and do some thin key presses. We're just gonna simulate what it's like when we copy and paste some code in them and go through and clean that up. Is is that? Uh Is that the is that the content that people are looking for? <laughs> Clifton shift. That was wonderful. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that is constant. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, your ASMR is really good. So I had an early encounter with ASMR when I was a kid. In like middle school. There's this, there's this person behind me in class who's kind of a cutie, and they would, uh, they would, like, whisper shit into my ear, and I would just, like, fucking melt, dude. <laughs> and then, like, it was, like, five years later that ASMR became a thing, and I just thought it was a meme, and then I'm like, holy shit, ASMR is that thing that gave me the chills when I was a kid. <laughs> Alright, I gotta, I gotta watch this clip quick. I have music plan. I wonder if you could hear my music. <laughs> that keyboard's so fucking loud. I think once I turned the gain down a little bit, because I noticed I was clipping, it worked out really well. <laughs> this is pretty good. I got to tweet that one out. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad I can make this stream entertaining for myself. I'm sorry that uh, for everyone else it sucks, but for me, I'm, I'm having fun. Let me see if I can rotate this page again somehow. Dude, this microphone boom keeps creeping on me. There we go. We'll try that. A little bit more on the game. Yuffie Spec Audiobook ETA 1. Ooh. Ooh. All right. I am thoroughly entertained. That's what we do here. We are here for entertainment and entertainment only. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically, what we worked on the last stream, uh, funny business aside, is we worked on uh, using that ACPI specification. And the ACPI specification basically designates the shape of a couple tables, and that allows you to basically create, or more specifically, these tables are a formal, standardized mechanism for the uh, firmware of a system to communicate with the operating system what hardware is present on the system, what kind of memory is present, what processors are present, if there are physical processors, or as we call them, different NUMA nodes uh, that are associated with different memory. It kind of shows us the linkages of all of those things on the system. Um, so ACPI is kind of the... the 
the specification of all the tables that tells us information about the system. Um, now, these aren't super common on embedded devices because you wouldn't have ACPI or firmware that would be baked into the OS of where to expect memory, where to expect devices to be present. Um, but in general purpose operating system development, the firmware gives that to you such that the same Linux image can run on my computer and your computer, uh, even though we have different hardware or slightly different hardware. So yeah. Um, <laughs> did you undo the changes? I, I think so. Yeah, I, I think I, th I think so. We're good. Um, Marcus Gord Gordathian, thank you so much for the tier one subarino. Don't forget, chat. You can always click the follow button or the subscribe button if you are enjoying this beautiful candle lit romantic pre-Christmas stream. So if you're feeling a little lonely, we can uh, we can keep you uh, nice and happy here by you know writing some code, doing some ASMR, having a nice little candle, a little glass of wine going. This is a nice little stream, super friendly, no swearing. We're good Christians here. We're respecting all of the wonderful Christmas traditions. <sighs> The OS better get a Santa hat as the bootloader image for <laughs> Christmas. What is this, VLC? No swearing? Whoa! Whoa, G33 cat work. I'm, I'm always going to say that now. <laughs> G33 cat work. <laughs> you. <laughs> Yeah, but we uh, uh, we don't swear here on this stream. Uh, we try and keep things uh, uh, nice and calm. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to hop into our uh, ACPI parser. And if I'm not mistaken, um, I think we parsed out most of the information that we want. It's going to parse out the different processors that are present. And I think it uh, looks like we have eight processors on the system. Let's check uh, Kimu. And yeah, we give it eight processors. So this has identified the eight different processors on the system. Uh, so that's pretty good. Um, this code quality, I think, was really good. So we're going to, uh, I guess, we don't actually use this information yet because we don't have a use for this information yet until we kind of get this running on hardware. Um, we... From EFI, we get the memory map, so let's uh, let's make sure that works. So ACPI will extract that information, and then let's go to 42. Okay, get memory map, image handle. Um, do do do, image handle. I don't think I need the. Do, do I? Yeah, maybe I do. Uh, get memory map. That takes an image handle. Okay, yes. So that is going to get that information. Oops, I got to change this environment variable here. Not environment variable, parameter. And then uh, we should be good. So hopefully this will run and print the memory map of the system. And it does. And this tells us basically uh, that we have, it looks like 129 megs free. Um, or 128 megs free, and if we look at Kimu, we give it 128 megs. So that looks like that works. So we are able to basically identify which processors are present on the system, and then uh, what physical memory on the system is used for various things. Um, and in our case, we only care about a couple of these fields that actually indicate that they're usable for us, um, but that should be good. And then EFI, let's go and see here. Um, exit boot services. If we try to exit these boot services, it will fail. Um, and then we're going to clean up the EFI code as well. Or, yeah, the EFI code. So let's try this boot services. Exit boot services. That returns an EFI status, which is a U size. Okay. Did we clean that up? Huh. Wow. Oh, I didn't know that we did that. Um, and we're going to see here, this is going to fail. And the reason it's going to fail is because we are printing things uh, during that stage. So what we want to do is actually save this information off such that we can uh, use it later. But let's see here. Oh, yeah, we wanted to get access to the serial port. Perfect. That looks like we got a panic going. Um, 
And that panic is probably going to happen here when we go to call uh, free memory or print that free memory out. So let's just see. This should no longer panic. Uh, oh, we panic at the end. Never mind. Uh, yeah, so that's still going to panic. But if we added a, a loop here where we just do nothing and spin until the end of reality. Um, and we're running debug so that won't get optimized out. Uh, yeah, that does spin. So we do successfully uh, do all of that stuff. So we're going to read through the EFI code here quickly. And we're going to make sure everything looks good for code quality. Um, ACPI, this looks good. We, I think we commented this quite well. Uh, we were good about documentation, describing what we were doing. Um, error checking, I think, was really good here. Uh, I don't think we had any unwraps. We had no uh, expects. We had no asserts. Um, this code was actually really, really well done. And that's something that we want to continue doing in our operating system. And uh, we didn't kind of start writing that high quality code uh, until we got to ACPI. So we'll check EFI now and make sure that we have the same coding standards for those as well. And I need to turn on some music because it's really quiet in my head. Um, let's get this going. There we go. There we go. We got some good music going. Um, the best part is that this is all going to end up on YouTube forever. I mean, however long YouTube lasts. See you later. See you later, Nightwolf. I'm out. Oh, wait. Masters. See you later. I'm guessing Nightwolf was saying see you later to Masters. Um, I guess I should probably catch up on the previous stream before I watch this one. No, I just, just jump into it. It's easy. What we did in the last one was simple. We kind of just designed the uh, the code quality that we wanted to use for the operating system. Um, and now I will tank engagement by leaving once the coding starts. See? See? I know that I have to just rant. I have no clue what he's doing, but I approve of it. Ask questions whenever you need. We can't hear shit. Oh, yeah, you can't hear music. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I thought you meant you couldn't hear my voice. You should be able to hear my voice just fine. Um, let's see. All right. I think we're caught up in chat. Let's, uh, let's keep going. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the code quality of our EFI code and make sure that it matches our ACPI code. Our ACPI code, we basically made a result structure um, that was kind of custom to ACPI. It returned a custom uh, error code in here that we implemented that looks really nice. At least to me, it looks pretty nice. Um, so what we're going to do is make sure that our EFI code uh, basically is of that same quality. Um, it's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> we, we, know, we know that our code quality here is, is not going to be great. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start cleaning this up. One of the first things that I want to do is I want to make the uh, this system table here. Um, I want to remove the fact that this can be copied. Since it is a pointer, it allows this pointer to be copied, and I want this pointer to be uh, moved. Um, and to do that, we're going to actually wrap it in a structure, a strongly typed structure. Um, so let's go along with that. We've got going with the monitors in the background. That's my research machine that I do most of my, uh, most of my work on. Um, I have it up there mainly for the clickbait because it, uh, it brings viewership in. <laughs> okay, so basically we have this concept of a global here. And if we look at static, you'll see that we have one global in this entire operating system. And it is to save that EFI system table. And um, unfortunately, we, we do need that for prints. Um, prints are unable to get access to a local, right? We don't pass an argument into print. And if we don't pass an argument into print, then we can't kind of haul around this EFI system table. Um, so what we need to do is actually stuff that into a global such that we're able to track where that EFI system table is, which is passed to us via an argument. So we basically save this argument into a global that we can access in another function uh, that doesn't have access to those globals. Now, unfortunately, um, I don't like that. I, I 
I don't like using globals, and I don't like the fact that this is going to register that system table by storing that global and also allow us to continue using EFI handle or system table. So here, if I were to print uh, sys table and then a pointer here, um, you'll see that uh, the system table is going to be able to be printed. Holy shit, that one's kicking in. Um, we'll be able to see that the system table can be used. And I don't like that. I want this system table to be moved uh, when we call this, such that we only have one reference of that. It reduces the aliasing, and it makes this OS follow the Rust model a little stricter. It also makes the code a little bit more strict, and as we talked about earlier on the stream, it's really important to us to make sure that the, the OS is designed in a way that it prevents mistakes from being made. Um, and I call that defensive programming, and a lot of that is making sure that things are very strongly typed and uh, basically hard to do the wrong thing. Um, and that's something that we're going to kind of go through here. I actually really like this, uh, this kind of like dark night, no lights on uh, setup here. <laughs> Can you use thread local storage? I cannot. I mean, in theory, I can in this operating system, but n no. Um, I have to implement that myself. My gosh, is that file saved or what? No. Sometimes it just doesn't save the first time, so you just got to go like 10, 15, 20, 50 times. Eventually, it will save. Okay, so what we're going to do is EFI system table. Uh, we're actually going to change the definition of what that is. Um, and we're going to make this a uh, struct EFI system table pointer. And this is a mutable reference to an EFI system table. And this is a strongly typed uh, EFI system table pointer, which will disallow the uh, copying of the raw pointer. OK. And now all we have to do, uh, we know that this um, repr... Why do I always forget this? Rust repr... It's not naked, is it? Um, Rust repr... There's a way to have it so you guarantee that it's the same shape as the underlying. Transparent. There we go. So this behaves identically to a pointer, except watch what happens now. EFI system table pointer. Now, this is going to fail to compile um, here because it's uh, not in the scope, and that's fine. We'll get that fixed. Um, pointer. I don't think we need EFI system table. So now if that exists. Then at 36, um, register system table. This is going to take an EFI system table uh, pointer, and this is going to have a pointer in here. Um, or at that point, we can actually extract the internal components. And we'll do that. Because we can't actually store that in an atomic pointer, because it needs to be a pointer. Uh, and that's why we kind of rip that out. 38. Uh, here. Oh, pointer's not defined for that. Um, yeah. We're just going to do this. We'll just ref it. And what we should get is a compiler error it is moved there. So that value is no longer present because we move ownership of that value into here and that makes it no longer accessible. So we basically have one instance of that pointer and we move that instance of pointer and then we store that pointer into a global. And that prevents us from accidentally using that pointer somewhere else in the code base, uh, which just keeps cleanliness higher. Um, yeah, isn't that kind of cool? I love doing stuff like that. So this is a public function. This is not a public static. And then this is public so that we can use it elsewhere. And then this field of this structure is not public. And thus, we are unable to access that field from outside. And thus, this pointer is useless to us. Um, so until we actually call this function, it's, it's pointless. Um, so what we're going to do is actually improve this, and we're going to impl uh, EFI system table pointer, and we're going to do pub fn register, and this is going to take a self, and this is going to uh, register this uh, system table into a global, so it can be used for prints, uh, which do not have access, uh, which do not uh, take a self or a pointer as an argument. 
and thus this must be able to able to be found on a pointer. And then register, we can move this bad boy in here. And this way, we can only register once. It's actually impossible to register twice because we cannot create another instance of this. The only instance of this that exists is the first one that's passed in. And once we call register, since it doesn't take a reference, the, the self is going to be gone, um, which is really cool. So this is going to register self.0 into that uh, system table. And now we don't even have to worry about that getting registered twice. Um, which means that this no longer has to be uh, unsafe. Although, now I have to kind of think through of whether or not I want this function to be unsafe. Uh, creating this structure, of course, is unsafe by proxy. Um, I'm going to keep it as unsafe. I think that's more correct. Even though there's no way to actually instantiate this structure, and thus there's no way to call this, um, you can instantiate it by using an external function like this. Honestly, I don't know. I'm tempted to have no unsafe on that. Because you can't instantiate this structure. I guess you can with extern fn. Um, like you could, you could, yeah. This should be unsafe because technically you can do that. You can create a pointer and use it unsafely here. Why are we using sequentially consistent here? Can we use a different ordering? We can, but we're just going to use sequentially consistent because performance doesn't matter. External FNs are always unsafe. Yeah, I mean, I don't have this marked as unsafe. Um, but you can do a non-unsafe external uh, FN. Um, and I can invoke this external FN from Ross safely. So this does have to be uh, unsafe. So you can you can technically instantiate um, you can instantiate this structure via an extern function um, without unsafe. Can you do that with like a vector in Rust? I guess there's no reason you couldn't, right? Well, it wouldn't be FFI safe. But yeah, anyways, um, we're going to keep that as unsafe because I think that's correct. And then that function no longer exists. So we're just going to do a uh, system table register. So what that's going to do is, uh, yeah, and now we'll lose ownership of system table. So if we print uh, a pointer to a reference to system table, you'll find that that no longer exists because we moved that. Fantastic. Um, and that's what we wanted. And now we're just calling register. So system table register. And that we compare and swap. If it is null, um, basically if there, nothing has been registered, then we register the pointer itself. And we use sequentially consistent. And the reason we use sequentially consistent is it is the strictest ordering possible. And performance doesn't matter. This is more expensive than relaxed. Um, but in this situation, ordering doesn't matter, um, or performance doesn't matter. And since performance doesn't matter, we're going to use the strongest memory barriers we can. We don't care if it's slow or not. Okay. Um, all right. And then a pointer to the EFI system table, which is saved upon entry to the kernel. We'll need to access to this table to do input and output to the console. Um, yeah. And there we go. And that's gone. We, we now have removed access to that. If I handle. And honestly, if I handle, we don't need clone or copy on. Um, if I status, we can do clone and copy on that. But we're going to make these as strict as we possibly can. And rep or C on those, which is good. Um, in fact, same thing here. I'm going to do rep or transparency. Um, and then those are rep or C, which makes sense. Okay. All right. Nice. So that is a good uh, code quality improvement that we made. So now we look through. Those comments look good. It starts off. Uh, we initialize the global to null. And then here, we'll only initialize it if it's not already null. Um, then output string. 
registering to the UEFI console output, we get the system table. If it is null, then we return. Uh, we basically silently fail, which is fair there. Otherwise, we get the console out pointer, uh, and we extract that out here, and we can do that uh, like this. Get the console out pointer. Then we create a temporary buffer that uh, buffers some of these characters. We go through each of the characters that we want to output in our string. We encode them as UTF-16 characters. Uh, if there is a new line, then we put a character turn in there, and then we also put the new line. And then if it's equal to length minus two, and we'll say um, if the temporary buffer could potentially be full on the next iteration, then we flush it. We do uh, minus two here because we need room for a null terminator as well as um, a uh, as well as a uh, carriage return. And does that logic check out? Um, if we go through, if it's equal to len minus two, in use is equal to len minus two. And we come through here, we could use both of these, and then this could be out of bounds. Is this wrong? I think this is wrong. Let's say it's in use is at 30. We write a carriage return. We write a new line. And then this would panic because we tried to null terminate there, because we can increment this by two if in use is equal to that. Is that true? Isn't that wrong? Let's try it. Um, if we print something with 31, or actually with 30 characters, sounds like it needs minus three. That's what I'm thinking. So we're gonna put 30 A's in here. Um, 30 A's, that'll get us to in use is equal to 30. And then I put a new line in here. Let's see what happens. So 30 characters will be in use in that buffer. Uh, am I wrong here? Um... Am I wrong? Maybe, maybe I thought this through correctly. Got 32 bytes. This is the number of in-use bytes. We go through 30 times. In-use is now 30. Oh, yeah. Um, if if in-use is 30, then it's equal to temp line minus 2. And thus, it is 30 is equal to 30. We null terminate it, which will be the 30. Uh, this would be 30. And we continue. No, this should be fine. This is always fine. Actually, can we do minus one here? No. Thought there's a chance to add both a character turn and a new line. We can. Which is interesting here. Um. Right? Let me think through that. Now, now I've got off by ones and I'm bad at off by ones. Um, in use. Worst case scenario here, this will trigger when in use is at 30. So 28. So this will not trigger on 29, right? So if it's 29, then we continue. We go through here. This writes to 29. This writes to 30. This writes to 31. That's in bounds. This is totally fine. The new line needs to be there in there originally, yes. But this is, the, yeah, this is actually correct. And it's, it's perfectly correct, um, right? Imagine if this ticks it to 30, then this matches and then we flush the buffer. But if this leaves it at 29, which is one fewer, this does not trigger, we come through. Do we have room for three characters if 29 characters are in use in a 32? Yes, we can write a carriage return. That's gonna be the 30th. We can write another character, that's the 31st. And then we can write the null terminator, which is the 32nd character and we're in bounds. This is actually totally fine. So we're good. We're good. Isn't that nifty? 
Um, if it's equal to that, null terminate uh, in use. We write the buffer by calling the actual function that EFI provides to us. And then we clear the buffer by setting the length to zero or in use to zero and we continue. And then at the end, if in use has something, then we null terminate and we flush it at the end. And that shouldn't be an issue. There should always be room at the end. Yeah, it looks good. Is it possible for in use to be greater than temp len minus two? Nope, because we only go one set at, one at a time. Right, wait, wait. Maybe that we do two characters now. If it's 29, ah, yes, I think that is an issue. If it's 29, then this does not happen. This will put it to, uh, ooh, yeah. This would then become, um, it'd be 29, then it becomes 30. Then it becomes 31, it's not equal, we don't flush it, and then I think this will result in characters that don't get flushed uh, effectively. Um, that would go to the end. Yeah, isn't that a bug? 29. So if we have 29 characters, this should panic. 28, 29, new line. There we go, look at that. So hopefully panic, right? Or maybe not flush, wait. Because we can definitely skip over that equality. Can we not? Am I, am I wrong about being on 29 there? So we have 29 in use, right? 29A is printed. So in use is at 29, we hit this 29 times. This does not trigger, this does not trigger. 29 doesn't cause this to happen, we loop again, and that character is a new line. We add this, we add the new line, and then this equality shouldn't happen, but we end up flushing it at the end. Um. Let's make sure this is 29. And then I think if I put characters afterward, because this is getting picked up here, um, and then if I do this, I think, see what happens. This will, this will panic. Look at that. Look at that. That's a good catch, chat. Hell yeah. And see, if that were in C, that would be a bug. That would be like a real memory corruption bug. That would have been a stack overflow. But yeah, you're totally right. We added this after we wrote this code. And that's a, great, that's a great example of where people make mistakes. You end up adding code after things happen. Um, now, can we just change this to a greater than or equal to? Is that correct in all conditions? Um, and I don't know if that's true. Well, let's see. It's 29. 29 is worst case. If it's 30 or greater, then this happens. If it's 29, then we loop again. This becomes 30. This becomes 31. We write to 31, and this is fine. So greater than or equal to should be okay here. Um, we can skip over the equality, and greater than or equal to is actually correct here in all cases. And then this flushing is also correct in all cases because there's no situation where... Uh, this will be out of bounds. It would require in use to be equal to 31. And there's no way for in use to be equal to 31 because this would prevent it. Um, okay. Um, let's see. We do minus two here because we need room for a null terminator as well as a carriage return uh, to, um, we do minus two here because we need room for um, a, uh, the worst case, which is a carriage, uh, a carriage return new line and null terminator 
in the next iteration. Uh, we also need to do greater than or equal to because we can potentially skip from 29 in use to 31 in use uh, if the uh, 30th, if the 20, 29th, the 30th uh, character is a new line. Okay, and that should be good. There should be no situation where that fails now. And then flushing is always fine because we can't get to here unless uh, in use is always less than that. All right, so that's good. And look at that, we fixed a bug. And this should now have AAA and then BBB on the next line. Looks fucking good. All right, see, chat, hot. I agree, chat, very hot. Um, I really want this to be a function of this. Um, and I can't expose this publicly I can't expose if I system table publicly because you can, uh, you would be able to change the pointer there with safe code. Um, but what I could do is I could actually wrap the atomic pointer if I system table in a strongly typed structure, and then I could implement output string on the if I system table, which would be kind of cool. Um. Is there any need to do that? Not necessarily. I don't know if that helps or hurts. I still would need to do the same check, but this would be on self instead. Um, but that still is lazily filled in and we're using atomic pointer for a, uh, a safe, lazy fill in. So we might leave that as is. Here, this is going to get the base of the ACPI table RSDP. Uh, we have the GUIDs of the ACPI tables here, and I like to format uh, these with spaces, so we're going to do that. I like spaces between my elements in arrays, and thus we're going to clean those up. Overflows that line, but that's fine. And we're going to get the system table. If it's null, we can't do anything. Uh, get a Rust slice to the tables, and here we're going to yep get a slice of those tables. And then we're going to search. Um, if the GUID is equal to the ACPI table GUID, then we'll use this table. Um, find map that. Uh, then sum table. Is that right? I think that's wrong. Um, Get the EFI configuration table. Get that. Then some table. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, then some is on the bool. I forgot. Um, if it's equal to this, then it's the table. Otherwise, if we couldn't find this, then check if it's equal to the table GUID. If it is, then it's that table. And then if both of those fail, then we return that we weren't able to find it. Um, if uh, EFI did not report an ACPI table, then we return none. And I don't think we need to make error reporting here. There's no reason to really report an error. We're just looking for those tables. And that looks good. Uh, we look for the ACPI greater than or equal to 2.0 table. So we look for the newer table first. And if we don't find that, then we fall back to the older table. And if we don't find that, then that will return none. And thus, we will have a failure. What are your reasons for not using Rust format? I don't like automated formatting tools. They produce uh, not the best formatted code, in my opinion. Uh, code formatting is not uh, something that you can just apply arbitrary rules to. Um, and in that situation, I like to be um, in that situation, I like to be um, like there are some things that I like to format on multiple lines that Rust format wouldn't format on multiple lines. Uh, I like spurious uh, padding. I like to line things up horizontally. Uh, on the screen, and things like Rust format will get rid of those formats. So I think it leads to lower quality formatting. TLDR.
I am strongly against it. That being said, it's better than having normal people write code. I put a lot of effort into the shape of my code. Um, why this is not that? Why not Rustock? I mean, we use Rustock. Right? We're using Rustock for all of this. Um, Yeah. Uh, cargo doc open. Here we go. Thaws OS. ACPI. Ooh, MADT doesn't have anything. Ooh, bad, 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 bad. Uh. M A D T. I don't know what the M A D T stands for, so we're gonna go find that. Uh, multiple APIC description table. There we go. So ACPI. If we look at these things, we have documentation on what these things do: checksum, init, result. Uh, M A D T. This gives info about what from address does. RSDP, information about those fields, OEM ID, we don't have any info on that. Well, that formatting looks a little fucked. I think we do have OEM ID, yeah. What's going on there? That seems like a bug in, uh, oh, ah, look at that. We didn't have three. Nice. Here we go. MADT, these look good. RSDP, these look good. RCP extended, these look good. Table, these look good. Error, good. All of these are described. Table type, described. Checksum, init, result, that looks good. Uh, EFI, um, looks pretty good here. If I boot services, all of those are pretty solid. Configuration table, if I GUID, if I handle, input key, memory descriptor. Ooh. I got some weird characters there. We'll want to fix those. And that's because of uh, copy and pasting from the. Uh, Virtual starts. These are issues with copying pasting. Yeah, those are just weird quotes. Bink. And we'll just single tick a couple of these, try and clean these up a little bit. Bink. Bink. Number of pages, virtual start, physical start, uh, EFI physical address, virtual, oops, better. Um, really? What? What's going on there? Ah, one of the, like, white spaces is fucked. There we go. Fixed. That looks good. These look good. If I memory type, we can put those in wax. Let's whack those. Better. Okay, and that's the unfortunate reality of dealing with copy pasta. And then allocate pages. We can tick those as well. Good. That looks nice. That looks much better. Okay. 
boot services. These ones we can do the same sorts of things. So we'll start cleaning those up as well. Tick and tick and tick, tick. Those look pretty good. Those look good. Those look good. Uh, type. Better. Good. And we'll fix this up. Whoa, Vim, what you doing, buddy? Vim, 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 Vim. Vim, what you doing? What's going on there? Uh, we'll just manually do this one. We didn't break the code, did we? No. <laughs> Of course, we can't run that. Um, okay, good. Output protocol. Burp. Output string. Bink, bink. Bink, bink. Bink, bink. Uh, cargo. Oops. Cargo doc. Stuggling now. Those look better. Um, EFI status, status code, fun with that. Ooh, that one's got a lot. EFI system table, okay. So I was just gonna leave these be, but we're gonna just clean these up better. It just, I, I don't know what it is, but I, I like this stuff. I think it's good. We are going to leave them original. We did change some of the names of these things to Rust names, so we're gonna leave the original names um, as they were in the comments, because I want them to be as true to possible to the spec. Okay, and then this one overflowed. Oh, yeah. That is beautiful. Um, that looks good. Table header. Uh... In the range of zero to 99, blah, 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 blah. And that should be better. Yeah. Um, honestly, I think these deserve some ticks. So we'll do that as well. We'll tick these out. Beautiful. That is some code quality right there. Memory types. Uh, we don't describe these. I'm okay with that. That looks good. ACPI table. That looks good. 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 All right. I think we have improved that, so good improvements. Gosh, I feel horrible. This is a huge tangent. I mean, it's improvements. No one's upset about improvements. Am I the only one who gets stunlocked sometimes on what to name a variable? Oh, yeah, of course. What's wrong with 10 words? I love Rustoc. Yeah, it's amazing. It promotes documentation. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, that looks good. So let's keep reading this code. Uh, we read this code. This looked good. ACPI table. That looked good. Memory map. Um, create an empty memory map. We allocate 4K on the stack. Um, free memory is just for statistics. We can get rid of that. Okay. So this is um, set up the initial arguments to the uh, get memory map uh, EFI call. We do the EFI call. 
If it's zero, uh, let's start returning some errors on these. Do you ever use Clippy? I do not. Clippy, uh, sen Clippy can sometimes be more verbose than I like it to be. It tells me to use like print line, and I have reasons to not use print line. Let's uh, let's check for assert. Got a couple a couple unwraps. Uh, expect. Okay, so these assertions need to go. If we want to get rid of assertions, then what we want to do is we want to make an error type. We're going to do the same thing that we did for Acby. And we're going to do uh, that right uh, wraps and EFI error. And then we're going to make an error here in the same way. Uh, errors from EFI uh, calls. And we could maybe make an EFI result enum, which would be pretty exotic, but we could do it. Um, we're going to split that quick. We'll go to the first assertion, and then we'll say if ret dot, uh, ret dot zero is not equal to, and then here we're going to make some, this is an EFI status, and let me see what uh, EFI status codes look like quick. EFI stats code. Here we go. There's a lot, but I think we're going to do them quick. Deny Clippy pedantic as hell. I'm the resident cargo Clippy. Oh, hell yeah. Fuck, that line is good. We're going to impl EFI status. And I want to make an enum, but I can't repr transparent in enum or repr c in enum while having uh, openness to errors that are undefined by the spec. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is EFI status code, and then we're going to do uh, we're going to do an enum. EFI status and assert. We check status codes on both of those, um, and I'm gonna further wrap those. So we're gonna wrapper. We don't have to wrapper see that uh, or derive anything on that. Uh, we do have to drive debug on this. And these are um, EFI status codes. Woo! Oops. Maybe maybe uh, too much wine there. Um, let's go find that quick. EFI status. And then here we're just gonna, we're gonna do some typing chat. Cause that's what you do when you do good code, qual uh, good code quality. Gotta do some typing. So we'll find these status codes and go through these. So we have a uh, load error in. So what I'm doing is I'm basically uh, writing this right here. So all of these things. Writing all of these out. So, welcome to hell. Um, success is equal to zero. That's implied. Uh, we'll do a repr C. Not that it matters in this case, but we'll do a load error uh, invalid parameter unsupported. Chat, make sure I don't typo. Bad buffer size. I'm mainly uh, looking at another screen. Buffer too small, not ready. Device error. Um, write protected out of resources. Volume corrupted. Volume full. No media. Media change. Whoops. Change. Any typos, chat? Not found. Access denied, no response, no mapping, timeout, uh, not started, already started, aborted, ICMP error, um, TFTP error, protocol error, incompatible version, Security violation, CRC 
error, end of media, end of file, invalid language, compromised data, IP address conflict, HP error, warn unknown glyph, warn delete. Oh, these are warning codes. Uh, hide it clear. Okay, so a status code. Warning codes are in that range. I'm confused then. Hybit set for errors. Hybit clear for warnings. HTTP error on EFI? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. There's an HTTP uh, part to uh, EFI. Um, warning codes. So, success is apparently a warning. Um, okay, so we're going to implement just these. And now we get to do copy and pasting. Uh, first, let me make sure these are sequential. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 16, 17, uh, uh, 28 to 31. There's a gap there. Any other gaps? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, seven, 10. I'm mainly looking for gaps. I see a gap from 28 to 31 here. Uh, that's it. That's all I'm seeing. So. I'm copy and pasting right now. This should be two. This should be three. I missed. I missed my click. So how's chat doing today? Tell me about your day. Oh, this one's a tough copy pasta. Oh, I'm a champ. Tell me about your day. What have you been up to? A resource has run out. I like that. That's a that's a good one. A resource has run out. Okay, the multi-line ones are harder to copy pasta, so I'm slow. Pog champ, hell yeah! This is uh, this is some real coding here. This is basically Stack Overflow co coding. I'm just gonna take these errors. I should be reading the errors, making sure they're lining up. That one obviously lines up. Timeout. I think we're good so far. Not started. Already started. I'm gonna get rid of Repper C on this as well. I had a change of heart in there because we're gonna be implementing a, a from and a to on that. So we'll make that do. God, this music's so good. I'm jamming. Got that little wine going. It's pretty good. Wow, this one does not want to select as a single line. Dude, fuck PDFs, man. Copying and pasting from PDFs is fucking impossible. Bank, security violation. Ooh, that one copy pasted. CRC error. Chat, I will check in on you in a minute when I'm done with this thrilling copying and pasting of comments. But this increases the uh, quality of the code, so unfortunately I have to do it.
Wow, look at that. Code quality looks good. Um, on my job, I've implemented most, uh, the most robust endpoint in the entirety of the backend, sadly. What do you mean, sadly? That sounds awesome. I'm surprised you didn't just copy the table in a macro. From PDFs, it's just too hard to automate. I, I knew it would be faster to manually do that. I uh, rewrote part of the ASP net core web server system. That sounds awful. <laughs> Um, operating system, StarCraft edition. Oh yeah, high APM. We're only here for the highest APM. We're, we're constructing the most pylons we possibly can. I've been working on a compiler for my language. What's your, what's your goal of your language? That sounds really cool. Um... Working a bit of shopping before stores are too crazy. Nothing too exciting. What do you shop for? Christmas presents and stuff? Currently working on a write-up for a hack the box machine. That sounds super fun. Hell yeah. Doing like a blog or something? You may not like it, but this is how top programming performance looks like. Yup. Nice, helpful, descriptive error messages. Hell yeah. Um... I never knew why PDF uh, took off there. So annoying. Yeah, I, I don't either. I guess it just worked pretty portably. That room looks like it's out of a movie. Hell yeah. Because <laughs> I definitely uh, intentionally make it look uh, hackery for fun. Man, it is dark out there. Where's the moon at? It was awful, but I gained like a 15% performance boost. What's wrong with that? That sounds awesome. Perf, man. Uh, I can't install Linux on my laptop because of the NVIDIA's, NVIDIA Optimus arc. Oh, weird. Huh. PDF took off because it's a portable document that looks the same on different devices. Yeah, uh-huh. If you have the exact same font and rendering engine, sure. A bit of Christmas stuff. Most of that is done, though. Uh, uh, a bit of a blog, I guess. I do them uh, publicly eventually. It's mostly for myself, though. It helps me make sure I remember things. That's really, uh, that's really awesome. I love doing stuff like that. I have like a, a wiki that I keep on my offline computer to kind of keep track of things that I've historically done. And it's, there's something beautiful about going back through uh, old projects and code that you've written and kind of reading through the things that you've done. I, I, I basically have archived every, every piece of code I've ever written since 2012. And I really wish I had that going further back. There's a there's a lot of nostalgia and, and cool things in kind of reading through old stuff that I, I really like. It's currently called Textile because it's a very comfy language. I'm just horrible at naming things. Oh, that sounds like a good name. I like that. That's cute. I'm writing my Cards Against Humanity clone in Rust before I eventually make the jump to the React client. Ooh, okay. That's pretty cool. Map the mouse buttons to common Rust keywords uh, and commands for more APM. I, so for Ghidra, I'm thinking about doing that. I'm thinking about mapping my Ghidra bindings to my mouse. Um, I actually think that would be useful because I do high APM in Ghidra and Ida. Oh God, I hate looking at old code. It's so bad. On the other hand, you can see how you've improved. Yeah, if if your code... If you wrote code three months ago and it doesn't look bad, then uh, you gotta you gotta get your progress going. Yeah, that nostalgia is a uh, the nostalgia bit is fun. Not sure I want to look at my old code. The I find that so strange, man. I hate the culture of like cringing on the past. Like I look back to dumb shit I did in like elementary and middle school, and yeah, it's all cringe as fuck. But also like. I see the progress and the development and the changes and the improvements to myself. And I, I think those are, those are really cool to, to look at. I, I love seeing those things. I know, um, response to shadow mind. Uh, let me see here. It's been supported since 2012 or something like that. There are NVIDIA drivers. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
I see. Um, I've been working on other people's code, uh, but I love looking on my looking at mine. Abs <laughs> I hate wait. I hate looking at other people's old code, but I love looking at mine. Yeah. Yeah, I think there should there should be beauty in seeing progress in yourself and seeing change and improvement. I think that's uh that's wonderful. Uh did you go to university? I did not. Alright, I need I need to take a bio break. I need more wine and then uh I think we can get back at it. I'm gonna need to make dinner here. Probably in the next, like, two hours, but uh, I think I have some uh, tortellini that I can make that I'm actually looking forward to. Be right back. All right, Art hates my laptop, but I know why. I mean, it's because you're using a uh, uh, Linux on a laptop, which is uh, an awful experience. Hey, Lucy Mass, how's it going? What am I witnessing here? We're doing some uh, OS development, and I'm trying to find a, a shoe under my desk, and I found it. <laughs> Yeah, we're writing a little operating system right now. We're mainly working on some of the documentation right now, improving the code quality of some of the code that we already have. Um, so we just added these new error codes, and we just have to do some really boring stuff right now. I'm sorry about that, uh, but we have to just kind of get that going. So we'll do uh, impl from this. Um, for convert from that, and then this doesn't need to be pub. Let's uh, let's make sure our pubs aren't too egregious here. Um, error does not need uh, that will be pub. Register that needs to be pub. Output string needs to be pub. Get ACPI table needs to be pub. Memory map needs to be pub. If I handle um, that needs to be pub. The status code does not need to be pub, and the system table doesn't need to be pub. And we should be good. We have uh, kind of restricted the publicity of those things, which is good. Um, implement from EFI status code for EFI status. Dude, I am fucking jamming to this music right now. Uh, from Val, this is going to be an EFI status code. We're going to yield an EFI status. So we're going to convert those into that enum. Uh, more specifically, this is just going to be a self. Then we're going to do a match on val.0, which is going to get the components. And then we're going to say uh, self 
uh, unknown, and then um, technically we could handle the warnings versus errors here. I don't know. I use Arch PTW. Oh man. I'm running my laptop with full Ubuntu. Yeah. Ubuntu out of the box actually works pretty well. I want to figure out why the double audio out just doesn't work. Uh, so I have no speakers. What do you mean about that? What am, uh, am I missing something there? I love that fucking emote, Kristen Twitch. That's so cool. Who is that? Who's Kristen Ray? What what uh, what what do they stream? So what can this OS of yours do so far? Pretty much nothing. Um, we just started it a day ago, so uh, pretty much nothing yet. It'll it'll probably be do, able to do something. Uh, at the end of tonight, and that we'll probably be able to allocate memory and, and do some basic things. And thank you for all of the follows. Yeah, don't forget, follows are, are what matter the most here for getting people to come in and hang out and chill. She's an Overwatch streamer and actually a friend of uh, mine. Really cool girl. Oh, that's awesome to hear. Yeah, that's a cute-ass emote. I love that. Ah, oh, man. I need to hire someone to make emotes. I gotta get some cute ass emotes. Okay, so <sighs> I could have warnings and errors, right? The spec kind of defines uh, errors as if the high bit is set. And then, so warning codes in here, error codes all have the high bit set, that top bit set. And then different ranges, I don't care about those. Um, Oh, shit, that would make another enum here. Uh, I don't know if I want to do it. Uh, it's like a lot of bloat for something that I don't think I care about, but maybe, it's fuck it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to not be lazy in this OS. Every time I get, I, I get the urge to be quick about something, I'm going to ignore the urge, and we're going to do it right. Um, so we're going to have EFI status codes. And then we're going to do em, uh, enum EFI uh, error. And these are uh, EFI error codes. And check this out, chat. You're going to love this. You're going to love this. And by love this, I mean you're going to put up with this and say that you enjoy the content that we produce here. Because, uh, yeah, this is going to get really boring really fast. Woo! Woo! Fuck, this music is jamming. It's probably because uh, I drank that wine a little fast, and kind of everything sounds good right now. Um, and EFI warning. Warning. So we'll have uh, success, a warning, and this is going to be an EFI warning. And then we're going to have an EFI error. Uh, top bit set, and this is uh, top bit clear. Why do you like Rust? I've got to bang Rust, but uh, mainly I think it's a, a beautifully clean language that's really easy to understand what it's doing, um, and extremely high performance. Fuck, dude, I need more of this music, but I just ran out of this album. Um, let, me, uh, let me throw in another album quick. Shit. This is good, dude. These fucking album covers are so bad. I don't think I've listened to this full album. Oh, fuck yeah. What's the music? I'm wishing it a night wish. I just finished listening to the entire album as a... Elm of Century Child, and now I'm listening to Wishmaster. I know a couple songs off of Wish Wishmaster, but I've never listened to the Elm in full. Nightwish is amazing. I saw them live. Oh my god, I'm so jealous. Uh, when did you see them? Did you see them when Tario was the singer? 
It's just, it's doing something to me right now. I saw them with all three. Oh man, that's wonderful. That's so awesome to hear. Taria is the best. Yeah, I, I agree. I think Taria was the best singer. Am I saying that right? Um, Nightwish is... <sighs> Taria. Uh, it, it's one of the Scandinavian countries. Finnish. Huh. Dude, I need to go to fucking Europe. <laughs> I need to go to Europe so bad. So there are a couple things that I want to do in Europe, which are really stupid. I want to go to, um, I, so like my, my heritage is, is, is German and Swedish, right? So I've got like second com cousins in both, uh, Germany and Sweden. Um, so I'd like to see Sweden. I'd like to go to Sweden. I'm definitely going to Germany because that's where like a lot of security things go. I want, I want to go to Sweet uh, Germany and kind of like do a round of, uh, kind of visit a couple of the universities there that produce a lot of cool, like, fuzzing research, and then um, go to, like, one or two conferences there. Um, but I really want to, this is, like, a guilty pleasure of mine, I really want to go to uh, the Red Hair Fest in, uh, I think, Netherlands. <laughs> it just sounds really fucking fun. Like, I don't know if anyone has ever seen the Red Hair Fest. It's, like, Root, root Garden, root, root Garden or something like that. Um, and see, like, a bunch of concerts go around, just do shit like that. But the Red Hair Fest just sounds like a fucking, uh, really fun time. <laughs> it's just such a silly thing to have, like, a festival about. Um. Go to Belgium and hang out with, uh, Lucy Mans? Am I saying that right? Belgium. I'm trying to think if I'd go to Belgium. So, here's my plan for a Europe trip. I'm planning to basically um, fly into, I don't know where, probably Germany. And then um, I'm going to probably rent a like Ferrari or Lamborghini, Lamborghini or like McLaren or Rolls Royce or some exotic car, right? Um, and then just drive around Europe for like two weeks to a month. That's kind of my current Euro trip plan is to just like... I, I want to drive through some of, like, the back winding roads. I want to drive through the Alps. I want to drive into Italy. I know, like, the mountain pass into Italy is really interesting. Um, and I, I just want to do it in, like, a super fun car. Not even to go fast, but just to, like, I don't drive around in, like, a super fun car. Don't kill yourself in the Autobahn. I mean, I have fast cars. I already have a very fast car that is very risky. Um... I don't know. I actually kind of want like more of a luxurious car, <laughs> to be honest. Don't drive the Ferrari in France. There are terrible drivers there. You'll crash and have to pay the fee. Really? Ooh. Maybe I'll maybe I'll drive a uh, drive a. So. I love. I I absolutely love like. Some European cars, um, like. No one in fucking America has driven a Citroen, right? No one has driven one. And I'd love to just drive some of these random-ass European compact cars that don't exist in the U.S. at all. Um, and just doing stuff like that would be kind of fun. Um, but yeah, I have, a, I have a Lotus Elise right now, which I, I love. It's, it's such a fun, amazing car. Um... Nice and unreliable, but that's why I bought it. Uh, but yeah. Rent a Clio 1 or a Twingo? <laughs> what? Clio 1? What the fuck? Let me see what that is. Oh! <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Renault. Renault? Renault? I'm guessing it probably varies by country how people pronounce it. Those look pretty cool. Hatchbacks? I have a Twingo, it's adorable. Oh man. R Renal? 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 Fuck! <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Damn it, EU people! Um, I don't know. I. I really like. I enjoy things that are not common 
where I live. And I think, like, driving just a random fucking car like that would be really fun. Have you never heard of the brand? I've heard of the brand, but it doesn't exist in the U.S. at all. Like, you will never see one. You'll never see a Citroen. You'll never see a Renault. Um, like, I've heard of it, right? I watch Top Gear. Uh, but, like, Renault? Oh. Yeah, they don't exist in the U.S. at all. Like, it, it's not even that they're rare or, like, 1% of the market. They are 0% of the market. They don't exist. Volvo exists. Um, I actually drove my first car that I had was a Saab 95. Um, obviously not a Volvo, but come on. We see, we see the similarities there. I fucking love that car. I fucking love that car. Uh, like, oh my God. Having the, like the key in like, uh, basically where the armrest is on, like on the driver's side. Fucking amazing. The switches in there felt so good. The car drove amazing. I fucking love that car. So nice. Um, <laughs> Peugeot is also a thing. Yeah, Peugeot's in America. I, I don't think exist at all here. But yeah, I'm familiar with that too. <laughs> Are there not rebadged versions? I don't think so. You do have cars like BMW and Mercedes. Yes, we do. Uh, BMWs are actually made in the U.S. here for the U.S. market. So I think um, like North Carolina or South Carolina, I think is the main manufacturing for BMWs in the U.S. In a wealthy area like Seattle, like I live in, uh, BMWs are extraordinarily common. Like BMWs are common. Porsches are common. Teslas are common. Uh, Mercedes are common. And when I say common, I mean like if you stop at a stoplight and there are 20 lights at the stoplight, there's one of each of those there. They are very popular. Um, so in the U.S., like Toyotas and Hondas are probably at the top of popularity. Um, but Mercedes and BMWs are definitely status symbols, but also affordable and pretty uh, popular here. Do you know the Chaos Communication Club in Germany? Yes, I do. Um, that's what I plan to go to. Um, I actually, it's remote this year, and Jiska, I think Jiska is the correct way to say uh, her name, uh, said I should join, and I got, I just fucking got served jury duty, ju jury duty for the first day of CCC, so I don't know if that's going to be multiple days or not. Congress, not club. Yeah, sorry. Chaos Computer Club. Yeah, Congress. Chaos Communication Cam. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's like, I don't know. I, I'm super excited about that. You're an angel. Aw, thank you so much, Syrian. Syrian Eldroth, hell yeah. Do you stream for a living or do you have a coding job? I work at Microsoft as a security engineer, so I actually don't do any programming as part of my uh, official job. Um, but I do a lot of programming. <laughs> Um, the uh, Congress is multiple days. RC3 uh, is going to be going as well. Okay, sweet. Hell yeah. Um, and therefore, you're allowed to write your own stuff. I mean, look, in reality, in reality, I just do kind of whatever I want, and I haven't gotten punished for it yet. So, like, you know, let's just keep this on the lowdown. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, I ultimately kind of just do whatever and, uh, make up for it with, uh, really productive weeks here and there. Um, <laughs> cute computer camp. Yeah, exactly. That's what it, that's what it's actually. Bunch of cuties there. Hell yeah. Um, from what I've heard, Microsoft is, uh, pretty out, pretty ouch. Uh, we uh, own what you know stuff in their contracts. Pretty much every company has that here in the U.S. They are unenforceable in law. <laughs> tip tip typically. Uh, not a lawyer. Uh, there's no way that someone's going to win that lawsuit. Um, and second of all, um, yeah, no. It's, they're unenforceable. They're not, they're not going to hold up in, law, in, in court. 
Um, they're they're for intimidating people. Now that being said, um, if you can't afford the legal fees, then yeah, you know, <laughs> that's uh, you know risky. But uh, yeah. And hey, with Megan and OS, while well, you work for the Windows company, oh, sh 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 I like how I'm covering this on the screen, even though you can't see my hands on the screen, even though you can see my hands on the screen. I renegotiated contact to remove the clause. Yeah, uh, the Microsoft one had a big enough loophole that I didn't renegotiate re that, but I have renegotiated that clause out of every single one of the companies I've ever joined. Um, I have turned down offers that have made it to a final stage because of those uh, agreements. And people get really fucking confused. But it's like, I don't, I don't need to work at your company that bad. Like, I don't really give a shit. If you don't want to remove this clause and won't let me do things in my free time, then fuck it. I, I really don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I can go work for the plenty of other companies that would hire me. Like, fuck off. <laughs> To remove the claws, we need them for Christmas. Oh, that was good. That's really good. <laughs> and thank you so much for the one bit Luke Mans, Loose Mans, Lusk, Luck Mans. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I love having an international audience. It's fucking amazing. Oh, man. Still under NDA for the company I used to work for. <laughs> Yeah, I think I have some NDAs that will never expire according to the NDAs. It's only like 3.58 at the moment. Oh, yeah, super early. <laughs> we'll keep coding, but I'm going to try and interact with chat when I'm doing this boring stuff. Um, we're mainly just implementing the stuff to generically handle warnings and errors in EFI. Kentucky, thank you so much for the tier one sub. Hell yeah, how are you doing today? Hope you're being all cute and stuff. Warning codes. <laughs> loose man sounds the best. Go with that one. Is that like the lo loose those? All right. Uh, warn. Ah, unknown glyph. Then we have a delete failure. <laughs> delete failure. Uh, right failure. We have a buffer too. Small, stale data. I love how cute chat's being today. I like this interaction. Uh, reset required. All right. Unknown glyph, delete failure, right failure, buffer too small, stale data, and file system. See, unlike that, stale data from EFI chat isn't stale at all. You deserve it, man. Keep up the dream. Hell yeah. Yeah, I need to figure out what I want to do with the uh, with the Twitch revenue if we want to do a donation or something like that. Um, I don't want to commit to donating Twitch stuff forever, but I think right now it's at a great level to donate. But of course, if it gets substantial, then eventually I'll be selfish and uh, turn it into some cores. But right now I'm thinking of... Uh, where I would donate it, probably when this year wraps up. Because I think I've made a, a couple hundred bucks from Twitch. Which is fucking crazy, chat. Fucking crazy. This chat seems pretty legit. This chat is amazing. I love this chat. Everyone's so nice and friendly, and it's fucking adorable. I don't blame you. I, would, I wouldn't mind some more hardware. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Like, and that's the problem. Like, honestly... I hate saying this. I hate saying this because I wanted to believe it isn't true. I seriously think this stream could average a thousand viewers. Like, I could add some quality of life. I could add some overlays. I could improve the stream a little bit. But I, I seriously see a thousand viewers being a normal thing on this stream. And though, like... Unfortunately, that becomes, like, real money that I can do real things with. Um, and while we're a smaller stream right now, of course, I'd like to just do donations or other things or do giveaways or something to give back to the community. Uh, but eventually, it might turn into, like, I, 
I might want some of that, so I'm kind of hedging for that. What are you using to run your code right now? We're using Kimu right now, uh, and I can print that script. This is the script that we're using to run Kimu right now. We're using Kimu and KVM, but there's no reason this wouldn't run uh, directly on hardware. Make yourself an anime a VTuber, <laughs> oh god. So like, you're pretty huge with 200 people watching, I know! And this 200 people is because of a shitty time right now. This is the worst time for me. In four hours, it'll probably be 300 or 400 people. Unless this content is really boring. Um, it's fucking crazy. Like, I, I watch a lot of streamers. Like, I, okay. Like, I don't know how to describe this, but... I watch streamers and have watched streamers for years who I consider like amazing streamers that I love their content, mainly like speedrunning people who have fewer viewers than I have. And I consider them like very serious streamers who put in a lot of effort into their streams. It's, it's mind blowing. It's fucking weird. Like it's like there's 200 people here. What the fuck? Like seriously, it is nuts. <laughs> I, I I seriously don't know how to describe it. I'm still like processing it mentally that I will like go in and watch like streamers that I really enjoy, and. They'll have, like, production value, and they'll have transition, like, effects, and, and bit buckets, and things showing up on screen, and notifications, and all of these things, and, like, I put in very little effort to this stream, and this many people show up. It's fucking amazing. It's fucking amazing. Uh, I, 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 I don't get it. I really don't get it. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> Them terminal multiplexers, though. Mm. Um, sadly, not about the content quality, but mostly luck. Yeah, I, I've i definitely had some luck. I got very lucky when um, uh, Michael Reeves hosted me. Um, that basically... I managed to keep a lot of those viewers around and a lot of people come by and basically once you get momentum more people show up and more people are curious why there's 200 viewers on this random coder and you get some weird stuff going on and it's it's phenomenal. Um, heard about you from a Swedish homie I have on IRC? That's so cool. First of all, love to hear about IRC still in 2020. Hell yeah. You have nine screens on your webcam, bro. That gives you a, like 11 out of 10 Arch BTW street cred. Hell yeah. Arch for life. IRC for life. I, I just said for life. Uh, found you from a blog post. Which blog post? I'm actually interested about that. So you had a Twitch from your Twitter. Hell yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Irish Gordo. For the hundred biddies, cheers. Find you from Hacker News. That's god damn it, chat. Oh, that's so weird. <laughs> Karstein shouted me out. Oh my god, dude. What a fucking cutie, dude. Of course, IRC is still alive. Yeah, IRC will never die. Twitch has IRC. Yeah, and yep, someone's that Twitch has IRC. Yeah. Oh, man, dude. Oh, this album's good. I'm vibing. This wine's good. I got another bottle if we need to dip into it. I'm feeling pretty, feeling pretty good tonight. Twitch chat is IRC. Yeah. I remember... So, um, I don't know if anyone here watches Dota or plays Dota. Uh, so, I, I played Dota way back in Dota 1 days. Um, I used to do like LAN parties in high school where I'd physically lug around my monitor and my, my physical desktop and do uh, Dota LAN parties. Mainly, thanks to my brother. My brother had a group of friends who played Dota and for some reason, my older brother decided to bring his three-year-old or three-year-younger uh, brother to his fucking like high school LAN parties. 
And I'd play uh, a shit ton of Dota 1, and, I, and that was super, super fun. Bunch of crazy memories there. Um, and then uh, Dota 2 came around, and, and I, have a, I have where this story is going and why it's relevant to IRC, but Admiral Bulldog, um, I don't know if anyone has watched him, he's a very popular Dota streamer and a very popular Twitch streamer. He's like a top Twitch streamer. He had a bot, I don't know, three or four years ago that had uh, IRC command injection. And, you know, I've done IRC command injection before in my life, and maybe I gave myself moderator privs, and maybe I got basically the entirety of chat to follow in my footsteps, and I've got a, got a nice permaban from his channel. <laughs> um... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was like, um, if I remember correctly, there's like a so, um, basically IRC has null terminated or like CRLF or sorry, uh, line feed terminated lines or like CRF CRLF terminated lines, and uh, effectively, um, there was they had encoding on the bot, but they did not have encoding for the Unicode character, uh, for ODOA, um. And I can't remember what the character is. It's like some, uh, yep, it's this one. It's this character, uh, this. So this character is Unicode represented as a 0D0A. And the bot was able to be escaped with that character. And basically I could do like foobar, this character, and then uh, priv message you know, whatever the channel name was, and then foop, um, right, and I was able to escape my message and basically send an arbitrary message as the bot, and once I was, once I was the bot that happened to have admin privileges, I was, you know, I win, because <laughs> they were a moderator, so I could mod myself from the moderator, but yeah, <laughs> oh man, dude. I don't think I'll ever forget IRC uh, syntax just because of how many times I've abused IRC bots. <laughs> hey, Dev Angels, how are you doing today? Hope you're feeling really cute. Hell yeah. I've got a little bit of wine going. We've got a good thing going here tonight. We're uh, pretty chatty, having fun. I'm having fun. IRC, those are the days. Hell yeah. Does that happen when they accept Unicode but parse it, parse it as ASCII? I don't know. I never had source code to their uh, bot, but I would imagine something like that. It was, a, it was a blind exploitation on that one. What kind of wine? I don't know. It's probably a Cab Sav. It doesn't taste like a Syrah. I, it, I have a couple bottles of Cab Sav and Syrah, and I don't know what bottle this was. This is definitely a cab salve. Yeah, it's a cab salve. Red, red wine. <laughs> hey, Rurkel, how's it going? All right, let's keep, uh, let's keep adding a little bit of code. Is it the kind that gets you drunk? I mean, depends on the day. So typically, I don't get very drunk at home because I drink slower. I find that... Um, the, some of the awkward times of being at a bar with people or like ha going out with friends, you know, if you have something you want to say, but you don't have a time to really say it yet, um, and you take a swig from your drink, right, that is what makes me drunk. Uh, so at home, I typically don't get drunk because I drink so slowly. Um, drop by to say hello and good night. See you around. Thanks for stopping by. Hell yeah, glad you're in here. Get some, get some good sleep. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Okay, have fun, absolutely we will. We'll probably be around when you wake up. Okay. My uh, new M1 Mav Mini comes tomorrow. Ooh, is that an ARM uh, build machine? <laughs> or are you actually planning to use it? 
Because I'm planning to get one for an arm build machine, but I'm not going to use it. <laughs> arm build machine? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I know you better than that. Oh, let me find where I was. Here we go. Uh, what's going on? Set. Must have closed this and I lost my text with. Uh, set. Have an M1 as my arm build machine? <laughs> it's actually sitting next to me, yeah. What's an arm build machine? Does it just mean you need to be on arm to compile for arm? You don't need to be, but it typically makes things a lot easier because uh, sometimes setting up cross compiler tool chains can be a p pain in the ass. So building things natively is typically easier. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's exactly what it's for. It's you like SSH in and you just build stuff on it. But yeah. That impl from generic for thing is wild. I have no idea what it's doing. Rust is fancy. Okay, let me uh, let me explain what that's doing. Thank you, Dev Angels, for the hundred videos. Hope your day is fucking fantastic. So, for more wine, god damn it, <laughs> we will we will be drinking some more wine this stream. I think this is a uh, I haven't uh, I haven't had a a night like this in a while. To be honest. Why is it a pain in the ass? Compiling doesn't really rely on the current architecture, does it? It does, mainly due to build systems that don't allow you to override the compiler or the build environment or things like where is the, like C flags, right? If you can't specify where the include directory is for the architecture you're trying to build for, you're gonna have a bad time. Same with if you can't override the compiler. And unfortunately, so much code is written with build systems that don't take those things into account that it can be a, gen uh, a genuine pain in the ass. So it's like, if I want to build code that targets another architecture, it's typically trivial. Um, but it gets very difficult when I want to build a standard libc application for those architectures. So yeah. Um... That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. What kind of candle are you enjoying right now? This is a Fraser fir. This is giving me the aromas of a Christmas tree. Unfortunately, when I have a candle visible on stream, it doesn't smell as potent. Um, you kind of need to have the candle at a distance such that you have the delta. You have the like transition that you get that wafting every once in a while. When it's right next to you, I kind of have a basically acclimated to the smell, um, but yeah, it's mainly for the uh, atmosphere, right? We're getting the, the cute flickering, right? See that? Isn't that, isn't that cool? We got the romantic stream going here. <laughs> um, no smell is quarantine time COVID detector. <laughs> yeah, your room is pretty dark, yeah. I'm trying to get an atmosphere going here. That's uh, that's why it's dark. I do have lights that I could turn on, but I like the uh, I like the dark atmosphere. It brings out the candle more and more, <laughs> which is kind of kind of the point of this uh, this stream tonight, which is pretty fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, so basically, we're going through and we're just making nice little enums for these uh, warnings and error codes here, such that we'll get nice status messages. So um, someone asked basically in Rust what this means. So the impl means implements. And we're going to say, I want to implement the behavior for converting an e EFI status code into an EFI status. So this is saying, um, for EFI status, I am going to implement a way to convert it from an EFI status code. Sorry. Um, and that's what we're doing. So then this is basically called a trait. And a trait in Rust is something that you define. Um, it's similar to like implementations on other, or interfaces on other languages, where you have a trait foobar. And we can say trait foobar expects that you implement a moose. And the moose takes an i32 and it yields a self. And basically this means that if your 
structure implements foobar, then it must define a function that is moose and takes an i32 and returns a self from that. Um, now, you can have these things be automatically derived. So we could say that takes a moose, and then we have a, a caribou here or something like that. I think that's spelt wrong, something like that. And then this takes an i32 and returns a self, and we can have a generic implementation of that that we can then do, like, more stuff on and generically implement this. But ultimately, a trait, all you're doing is specifying functions and uh, basically constants that are required to define and types that are required to define for a certain structure such that it can implement that. And then in that, uh, you can start using generics where I can say uh, struct foo takes a generic type t that implements a foo bar, and we know that a foo bar must, in, must implement the function moose, and thus I can put ASDF as a t, and then when I do something on a foo structure and I use ASDF, I can call moose on that because t, the generic type t, implements foo bar, and thus foo bar requires that you implement moose, and thus we can call moose on that. And that's basically how the object-oriented style of Rust works. It's very straightforward. I love it. It's super obvious, um, and there's no um, there's no overriding, which makes it really nice. Um, Fancil, thank you so much for the two months of support. How are we doing tonight? We're doing fantastic. We got a got a little little bit of wine going tonight. We're a little bit chatty. We're having some fun. Yeah. Traits are basically C sharp uh, Java interfaces or C plus plus abs abstract base classes. Yeah, exactly. Um, badass, thank you for walking through that. Traits, I dig them. The pattern matching thing is dope as fuck too. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and we're about to do some pattern matching. Um, how did you learn Rust? I read the Rust book, which is not a physical book. It's a free thing that's a community effort by the Rust community. If someone has a link to the Rust book, I would appreciate that in chat. Um, but yeah. Um, that's seriously how I learned Rust. I actually read the Rust book cover to cover or page to page uh, and ported my operating system into, uh, into Rust. Um, the Rust book was amazing. I read it in the version one days of the Rust book. That would have been in 2016 or 17. Um, I basically ported my operating system to Rust and that was how I learned Rust. And the Rust book... Seriously, seriously, covered everything I needed to know. Um, it was a very easy trans transition from C to uh, Rust. That feeling when you're a Haskell developer and everything that Rust has uh, that Rust has have been invented uh, decades ago. Oh, for sure, yeah, um, for sure. Rust is largely derived from Haskell. It has enough differences that do make it. Uh, uh, Different enough from Haskell, but yeah. Another good book is Programming Rust from O'Reilly. Oh, I haven't read that at all. <laughs> Rust is relatively new to me still. I didn't read it, failed to concatenate two strings and gave up. What? Gave up and read it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the Rust book is fantastic. It's almost uh, time to refill this wine. We're going to finish up these EFI status codes and we'll... Uh, We'll take a bio break and uh, refresher of wine. Fuck, chat, you got me going tonight. I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling kind of social tonight. I like this. Yeah, to be honest, I haven't been streaming because I've been in a slump. I just haven't had any motivation to do anything. Um, and I'm feeling really good right now. So thank you, chat. Chat, you are the reasons why I'm feeling good tonight. So that's fucking awesome. Um, okay, so we are going to match Ride the Wave, man. Hell yeah. Thank you so much for that, Efi. Efi, 80493. I have no idea the significance of that number. Glad to be a service. Thank you so much. Oh, the end slum. Oh my god, chat. You guys are awesome. Oh, oh man. Thanks for all of the love. Hell yeah. Chat, you're amazing. <laughs> Aww. 
hearts hearts to all of chat as well. I know I should have transitioned to the full screen thing, but it's I've committed to the heart already. Chat, you're amazing. Thank you so much for that. Uh, die go die. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's see all the ways I can interpret this name because if I pretend like I'm botching the name, then it, it doesn't feel like I don't know how to read this. Digotos is one way. Digotos is another way. Digoto SS is another way. Uh, die got OSS for uh, die got op uh, open source software. A bunch of ways I can interpret that. <laughs> Diego Toss, <laughs> that's another way. Thank you, Fabio, for that. Uh, say Diego with your Spanish. Diego, say it with your Spanish accent. Fuck. Uh, Diego, Diego Toss? <laughs> Diego Toss. <laughs> uh, hola, como esta? <laughs> Fuck, chat. You got me going tonight. L-O-L. Hell yeah. <laughs> got my high school Spanish. It's not good with names, you know? It's actually really true. I am really bad at remembering names. And it makes me feel so fucking bad at times. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to say um, if the raw value is a zero, then it is a success. Otherwise, it's not going to be an unknown because we're going to encode the warnings. And we know that these are specified by the top bits, and we're doing use sizes, and this is a 64-bit uh, operating system such that we should be able to do range syntax. So I'm going to go and look at kind of what Yuffie does. For 64-bit architectures, we know that warning codes are in this range from here. <laughs> Yikes, that looks pretty bad, but uh, we'll make it work. Um, up until this, and not inclusive for this one. We're actually going to do inclusive syntax for this, because um, we're going to have to do inclusive syntax on the next range. So the next range is going to be this uh, to this. Honestly, it's just that top bit being set. I have no idea why the specification says this range. Um, this would actually give me an error in Rust, but we're going to say uh, EFI warning unknown use size, and this is an unknown error. What uh, unknown warning uh, was found or uh, was returned, um, or we could just say an unknown warning. Hell yeah, and then we can go down to here and we can say an unknown error here and this is going to be a use size as well. And we're just making these enums such that we have nice pretty code here. Um, 216, of course. So expects an EFI status code, that one has done it. And then here we'll just say self, uh, self warning, EFI warning, unknown. And val.0 is the way that we're going to do that for now. And then here we have an error. And this should give an error when we go to compile this because we don't exhaustively handle this range. Um, Self-warning error. From has an incompatible type that expects a... Um... Oh yeah, it doesn't want a reference there. Okay, and then we need to put some errors in here. Arrows in here. Let's see how that works. And what I'm looking for is that we'll get an error, basically indicating that we don't correctly handle uh, that entire range, which is true because we don't handle that end range for the errors. So let's see, uh, EFI status, um, 173. If this is not equal to EFI status, Success. We're going to keep the assertion for now just so we can get this code working and getting it compiling such that we can determine kind of what's currently the bottleneck. Uh, if I, yeah, no dot zeros on those. And we don't have not equal on EFI status. 
And because of that, we're going to have to implement a partial, eh, not on those. We'll add partial EQ and EQ. And that's basically giving us the ability to compare for equality. And we'll need to also add those uh, to these EFI warnings because these are parts of those structures and they are recursively implemented for these as we go through them. Um, okay, 174. Red dot zero. Uh, we should be able to just put a question mark on there and give an actual error code. And 226. EFI error. Oh, there we go. There we go. Look at that. Easy fix. EFI success or status success. EFI status on 33. Oh. Uh, so that is an EFI status code, which is kind of the raw representation. Um, raw EFI status code. That's what we'll call that now. And then should be better here, and we'll grab that. I didn't know that we were returning that from that function, but it makes sense. Okay, and then we have some patterns that are not covered. So if we put an F in here, this hopefully... We'll cover that. Um, maybe not. Zero to seven, eight to F. Um, we'll just say this is unreachable because it should be, but we'll see. I don't know why that would be happening. Um, donde esta la biblioteca? <laughs> Hell yeah. Why is that a thing? Why is that a meme? Is that like printed in one uh, like Spanish learning uh, like textbook and, and, and textbook and everyone like has learned that now? I have to go now, but the stream is awesome and I'll definitely be back. Thank you so much, Mixtilinear. Mixtilinar. Mix. I don't know why I'm so bad at names, but thank you so much for stopping by. Can you really do a uh, result is status success, or do you have to do a check for warning success? So what we did is we made EFI status success as its own special thing. It's from community? Really? No, I, I think... I. Look, we're going to have to get our sleuths on that in chat, but I'm pretty sure that comes from, like, old uh, 90s and 2000 textbooks. Because that was a meme, I think, before Community when I was in school, to be honest. I wouldn't be surprised if they proliferated it, um, but... <laughs> me, me amo T-Bone. <laughs> How many people here are Spanish speakers? Let's get a, let's get a hola in chat if you speak Spanish. And then we're going to ignore that because everyone's going to say hola because it's Twitch chat, which means you're a bunch of shitlords, which means I can't actually determine how many people in here speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Ish, I can speak a bit. Un poquito. <laughs> si. Está bien. Hola, shitlord. <laughs> Hola, ¿cómo estás? <laughs> oh, chat. You got me riled up tonight. Ah, si, chico. Ya habla español. Está bien. <laughs> <laughs> si marido rico gracias <laughs> does welsh count um does welsh count do you actually know welsh hello <laughs> that's how welsh sounds <laughs> Actually, I know Welsh. That's crazy. <laughs> um, tell us some more Welsh. That's really cool, actually. 
Better throw that Spanish tag on your stream. Yo, holy shit, well, <laughs> I don't know why uh, Twitch chat keeps trying to tell me to ban Welsh. España, see, sí. Spain. Uh, I I live something uh, in in Portugal. Oh my god, dude, Welsh is just gibberish. <laughs> why is Welsh blacklisted? Because it's painful to read. <laughs> Uh, de España, from Spain. I live beside Spain. Okay, nice. <laughs> Welsh, man, what is that fucking language? Okay, how many people in here can actually speak Welsh? <laughs> that fucking language. I was told my message was being checked by mods, though it was because I said shit, though. <laughs> I don't know. I think it was actually because of Welsh. <laughs> Guten Tag. Hello, geek at work. Are you German? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? <laughs> ich sprech Deutsch, <laughs> kinda. Hell yeah. It's because of Welsh. <laughs> Welsh is apparently a bannable offense here on Twitch. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> And a bit of Dutch. All right, chat. Should I move to Europe? Should I move to... I, I'm thinking about moving to Switzerland. Should I do that? <laughs> we all speak Welsh when we sneeze. <laughs> yes. Move to Europe. Oh, man. Now? During COVID? I mean, I'll wait. I'll wait. Yo, Switzerland is dope. I've thought about, like, Switzerland or Sweden or uh, Norway. I kind of really want to, like, I want to learn a new language, but by force. By, like, moving to a country that I've uh, never, like, learned the language of and I have to kind of learn it. Uh, where are you? I'm in the U.S. Switzerland is better for tech? Yeah, that's true. Switzerland has Project Zero, which might be my poll. Uh, it might be my goal, and I was reading Poland at the time. Move to Poland? Polish is nice? Does that mean I have to eat brats all the time? Eat sausages? <laughs> Learn Japanese then? Ay -ay -ay! Ay -ay -ay -ay! <laughs> I speak Portuguese, English, and sometimes Spanish and German. Ah, Portuguese. I've never learned Portuguese. I've learned a little bit of slang, mainly from tibia. You've heard that, Fabio. I, I've seen your name a lot in chat. Thank you so much for coming by all these wonderful times. Wales is the best flag because it has a... Because it has a dragon? All right, all right. <laughs> okay, that's a pretty sick flag. I gotta say, that is a pretty cool flag. Can anyone, can anyone beat that flag? Can anyone beat that? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Shitlords of chat. We have to get up and kill it all. What is a CYMRU? I have no idea. I actually don't know. <laughs> Should have a Gator Dragon on there. Flemish flag? Flem Honestly, I think... I think, unfortunately, I th I, I, the Flemish flag is good, but I, I think the Wales flag is slightly better. I think it's slightly be better. Um, it's Wales in uh, Welsh. Oh, cool. Nepal's flag can bite you. <laughs> okay. You know, that's actually what I pictured in my uh, head. Interestingly, uh, are there faces on there? Or is this like a extrapolation of the flag? Coat of arms. Oh man, coat of arms. Albanian flag. <sighs> okay, that's pretty sick. I feel like that's pretty dark too. That feels pretty intense. <laughs> that's pretty good. Portuguese flag is boring. 
exactly what I'd expect to see on my screen when I'm looking at a, a football match. A foot, a football match. <laughs> the American flag is boring, boring and I'm American. It's, it's boring, but it's, it's definitely been hyped up pretty well. I speak Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> football. <laughs> Oh man, chat! I'm glad my uh, Americanism can rub off, rub off on everyone, where I can't speak shit. All right, so we have to further match this, and we're gonna match uh, Val.0 zero and um, this. So we're gonna mask off the top bit of that, and then we're gonna gonna convert this into a warning. Now we could implement it on this, but that's kind of weird. So I'm actually gonna do it directly inline. So we're gonna match on the value and that. Um, and I put I put some vim in there. <laughs> WQ in the number, yep, yep. <laughs> he caught me. Uh, Non-exhaustive. I'm surprised these aren't being picked up as exhaustive. That's really strange to me, but I think it's because it's a U size. I think if I sign extend that, I'm okay. And there's overlaps here. We'll do one. And there we go. That's better. So we're going to uh, basically sign extend that value, and that's going to propagate that top bit. Vim life. Yeah, I wonder how many projects on GitHub have a colon W in them. <laughs> Check the last links, Wales. What is this? <laughs> Wales. <laughs> Risky click of the day. <laughs> Chat right now. Welcome to Fun with Flags. Yeah, one of my uh, one of the uh, Vice City speedrunners that I watch, uh, KZ Fru. Um, does like uh he's really into world flags and he'll do like the kind of like the geo guesser but for flags i don't know what it is but go through and like try and name all the countries associated with their flags and it's kind of a cool way to get introduced to a lot a lot of the flags of the world oh kz fruit is awesome yeah i've been watching him for five six years pretty long time i think his content is fantastic one of, one of the best GTA speedrunners out there. And that's mainly because I'm, I'm a really big fan of Vice City. He has done a decent amount of San Andreas in 3, but I really like Vice City. I watched him a couple years ago when he was doing Vice City any percent. Yeah, for sure. This one? Do you guess, Sarah? What's this? Flags the... Yes! Yes! Actually, this is exact one. Around the time they started to use the Ace Bug? Yeah. I remember watching that stuff. He does really good uh, 100%, which is kind of cool. I suck at flags. Yeah, flags are really difficult. Okay. Um, let's... Um, ooh, uh, let val is val as i32 as i64. And we're just going to say... Um, um, assign extend the error code to... Um, Make this code more, uh, make this code not tied with a specific uh, bitness. And then we can just say match val, and then down here we can say match val with this noisu val.0. Sorry. That looks really good. i64 is a primitive type. Yeah, um. Yeah, we'll convert these into uh, I-64s. Obligatory this? What is this? Barbarian fun with flags. I gotta not have that on stream, probably. <laughs> Two hundred twenty-seven. 
Um, match that. Non-exhaustive pattern. Perfect. And now we actually uh, perform these encodings. So I'm going to split uh, source EFI.RS, and we're going to grab the warnings. Yeah, these are warnings. DMCA. Oh, no. Rip. Rip. Oh, no. What am I going to do? Off to prison for me. Um... We're just going to convert these. Wow. I am struggling to uh, release the shift key today. We're going to replace instances of four spaces with four spaces and a um, self error EFI warning. No, we're going to do an EFI warning. Shit. What? Why is that not working? Um, if I replace four of those with this, is it the colons? It doesn't like those? No. Hello, Vim. What am I doing? I feel like I've seen this before. And I don't know why. Is it due to these colons? No. Okay, I'm doing something stupid. Uh, that. That's why. You know, I realized I was making that error the day before. A couple days before. And I vowed that I would never make that mistake again. And then I made the mistake again. So, these are what we want to return. So, I'm actually going to change this slightly into... Uh, if I into a arrow space, if I G. Okay. So now, uh, honestly, we can do better. We can do four spaces. And now, all we have to do is fill in this number here. And I'm mainly just referring to this table with this morning codes here. And we'll just say uh, a one, a two, a three four, five, a six, a seven, and then everything else. And for the everything else case, we just encode the value directly. And then here we can say EFI status warning, and then we wrap that. Now that is a warning. That's at a range. We'll do that. Oh, shit, that built. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that to build yet. Uh, one is an unknown glyph. Two is a delete failure. I know you can't really see this. Uh, three is a write failure. Four is a buffer too small. Five is a stale data. Six is a file system. And seven is a uh, reset required. And then we have everything else turns into we just directly encode the value as is. OK. And then we can do the same thing. I guess errors we actually encoded into the uh, unknown variant. And then we'll go through and do the same thing here. This is going to be an EFI. This is an error. Isn't this thrilling, chat? Isn't writing code correctly and actually making enum variants for things so that the code is actually fucking readable? Isn't this just thrilling? Because it's, uh, it's got me in a tizzy. All right, let's copy this code. Let's see what we can do here. We're going to try some uh, vim regex here like a champ. Paste. I'm going to copy this. And then we're going to say lines that do not contain a comma will get deleted. And then we're going to say that lines containing four spaces will get replaced with an EFI error and four spaces. Not that it really matters for spaces. And that looks pretty good there. And then we'll tab this in. So 
Cyphertex, thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. What the fuck are you doing up this late? Don't you have like a normal life? Isn't this late? Thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. I hope you're having fun. I hope your life is going wonderful. What is the keyboard? This is a DOS keyboard. Uh, keyboard. There you go. DOS keyboard. Cherry MX Blues, baby. And we can uh, do this find and replace better because we want to add the uh, arrowy boys on here. <laughs> Fuck. It's almost time to make that dinner. Okay, then errors, and then we're going through here. Isn't this, isn't this just thrilling, chat? Uh, ooh, I want to change all the occurrences of an arrow, and I want to turn them into... <sighs> all right, we're going we're gonna to do some ugly things, chat, but we're going to make this work. Uh, success. Get rid of that. It's gone. Bye-bye. Um, one, load error, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They are basically in order until end of media. Nine, 10, 11. There's probably a better way to do this in Vim, but I don't know how to do it, so we're not doing it. 14, 15. Uh, 16, 17, 18, 19. Isn't it fun when I just count out numbers? I bet that's really fun for the people who aren't actually watching the video, but they're listening to my voice. And I'm just counting out uh, sequentially incrementing numbers. Uh, 28. That was the one. End of media. Sweet. Now we're on 33, uh, 34, 35, uh, 36, 37. 38? What? No. What am I doing? IP at... Wait. 33... <laughs> now I'm confused. 31. What am I doing? Why was I going to 33? 32, 33, 34, 35. And then everything else is an unknown, and we encode that as a value. Thank you. Thank you, chat, for catching that. And then we'll just do a couple up arrows here. And look at that. That looks good. What happened to 29 and 30? I have no idea. They got they got eaten. Um, load error, invalid parameter, unsupported, buffer size. Buffer too small, not ready. Device error, right protected. Auto resources, volume corrupted. Volume full, no media. Uh, media changed, not found is 14, access denied, no response, no mapping, timeout not started, already started, aborted, I'm trying to fill this in with things, but my head is uh, saying these things out loud, and then I actually am trying to Twitch chat, so I'm actually saying things out loud in reality, which sounds really weird, so I'm trying to compare these things without sounding ridiculous, which right now is somehow kind of working, <laughs> how's it going chat? <laughs> 31, 32, 33, 35. Okay, that looks pretty good. And this now will convert that uh, EFI status into that code. <laughs> I always find those magic numbers interesting, for sure. 29 and 30, bro? Yeah, they're, they're not present. They're not present. See, see this gap? 28, no 29, no 30. They're missing, MIA. It's a tragedy. Can we, uh, can we uh, pour out some 40s in chat for 29 and 30? One, two, skip a few. So zero goes to success. Those map, these map. And then let's check these out. Never use results. Yeah, baby. We'll, uh, we'll get that added in here too. Type. Local APIC address. That's an ACPI? Let's get all of these uh, warnings and errors fixed before we continue on here. And CypherTech, I think, I, I hope, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you for stopping by, having some fun, chilling with chat, writing some code in the dark, and not hitting shift when you're uh, typing keys on the keyboard. 
Um, no one knows Cypher Tech is the uh, the genius behind Binary Ninja. Shout out to Binary Ninja in chat. We don't use it enough, although we do use it for when we do code coverage stuff, which is something we actually do a decent amount of time. Uh, Moose. Yeah, we don't hit that. And then RSDP not found. What do you mean we don't construct that? Oh yeah, of course we don't construct that, no shit. 180, type on EFI, not used. We will use it shortly, okay. So now what we can do is we can make this return a result error uh, here, and that's going to, no, that's implied. Uh, this is gonna return our result, forget memory map, and then we'll return an okay. And then 149, uh, return okay, uh, error. Um, and we'll say EFI not um, registered. And this means the uh, EFI system table has not been registered yet. Uh, not been registered. Okay, and then 149, return error, error, EFI. I will just say not registered. It's implied by the namespace that this is EFI, and we're going to try and get better about doing that. And I say that every time, and I keep doing it. Not registered. Okay, that looks good. Fantastic. Um, and then we can go down to these, and we'll do a question mark on that, and that should fail. Cannot be implied to an EFI status, and we'll do a into. Um, I don't know if I can do that. This is going to take an EFI status. And then hopefully we get a warning that we're using an FFI thing. Because EFI status has become our Rust representation. So anywhere that we used EFI status before should be an EFI status code. And then we'll convert those into our Rust representations of those. And there we go. And now we can say if that's not equal to. That's failing on the next one. Okay, sweet. Um, and we can say uh, uh, memory map EFI status. And this is the uh, we failed to get the memory map from EFI, and then we have the EFI status code that we can return out of there. And we'll say if ret is not equal to EFI status success, then we'll return an, uh, an error EFI, uh, an error, whatever we called that, memory map, uh, and then just ret, and we should be able to encapsulate why that failed. 192, and then here we can say um, exit boot services. This is uh, we failed to exit EFI boot ser services. My typing accuracy is pretty bad right now. Sorry about that, chat. If ret is not equal to EFI status success, I wasn't kidding when I said my typing accuracy was bad. Holy shit. Uh, EFI status, and then we'll do an into on this. I'll read chat in a minute here, sorry. Uh, EFI status, return error, error, um, exit boot services, ret. Beautiful, uh, cargo check. 468, not using that yet, but we will shortly, and that's fine. And then main is not checking the uh, error of that. So this we can say expect failed to uh, initialize ACPI. And here we can say expect failed to get EFI memory map. 
and then expects there are fine. That is the root level error here. And then uh, private type in public. Yeah, I guess you can construct those. So we'll just say pub on those. Um, puby num on that. I have no problem with this being pub. And then that's going to complain on the next level for the errors. Yep. So warnings and errors, we'll make these public as well. And now we should have some pretty good code. OK, so what we want to do is cause this to fail. And we can cause this to fail by just printing out this information from the entry here, this memory descriptor. I'm going to hex print that. Doesn't really matter, but then we see that error there, and we can see what we got. Distraction. <laughs> All right, uh, chat, I will be right back. I am going to read chat. I'm going to refill my wine, and uh, I'm going to start boiling some water so I can make some tortellini so I can eat some food because I'm getting hungry. Um, but that looks good. We have a failure, failed to get EFI memory map, and then our failure was on exit boot services, and that filled with a warning with a delete failure, um, which is awesome. Sweet. All right. I'll be right back, chat. See you in a, see you in a minute.
Oh man, music transition to Epica? Yeah, that sounds about right. Let's uh let's do that. Fuck yeah. Just blasting through these albums. How's it going, chat? Let me uh let me catch up on chat. Is that Apex supposed to be AP ACPI? Probably. Did I say Apex somewhere? No, this one actually isn't. That one is correct. And that one's correct, and that one is correct. These are actually referring to an APIC, which is uh, the Advanced Programmable Interrupt Controller, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, that's a little confusing, but nope, no error there. So if it's zero success, if it's in this range, it's a warning. If it's in this range, it is an error. And we can see that we are getting a delete failure error out of that. Okay. That looks like a big improvement to the code. Um, the Vim trick you're looking for here is control F, incrementing selected numbers. That seems really difficult. Rusty's the real genius and I know he watches the stream more than I do. Oh yeah, Rusty's here all the time. You're the best moderator of hack is that. Oh. I'm only better than Rusty at only two things, casting CTFs and speed cubing. I mean, come on, what's, what's, your, uh, what's your AO5 at now? You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't flex a big game of speed cubing unless you uh, mention your AO5. <laughs> I was really impressed with Binge One doing flare on this year. Thanks for an awesome tool. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Come a long way in the past five years. Is Binary Ninja scriptable? I'm looking for something that can disassemble a given x86-64 executable and basically uh, have it return addresses of basic blocks. Yeah, um, Binja is, is built for script, uh, scriptability. It is designed for that. And it's, uh, it's relatively cheap, too, uh, for all the people in chat. I think they raised prices recently, but Binja is, is pretty cheap for uh, what you get. Um, not saying you need to increase your prices. I'm just saying. I'm just saying it's relatively cheap for what you get. Uh, especially, uh, basically, it's a, an individual can afford Binja. You don't have to be a corporation to afford it. It's not extraordinarily cheap for a lot of people in, in, in non-first world countries out there. Um, but if you're in a first world country, it's, it's pretty affordable. Cypherdeck coming in with the five gifted subs. Thank you so much for that. And the emotes getting shared. Hell yeah. Can it see the screen? Oh yeah, I don't remember if I was doing something on the screen or not, but um, I'm mainly talking with chat right now. Um, the screen. Just got a single PR last night of 1365. What did he have? Did he, did he have an F2L skip? An OLL skip and a PLL skip in the same uh, shuffle? <laughs> That's actually phenomenal. Congratulations to that. That's awesome. Are you getting your kids into uh, cubing as well, or do they think you're a fucking nerd for doing that? <laughs> you just select numbers uh, in visual mode, and then hit G, then control A? Calling bullshit. I'm calling bullshit. Damn. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's gonna be a cool thing that I'll forget to use uh, for the rest of my life. Glad I learned that. Sick. Sick. <laughs> Can't wait to never use that one again. <laughs> Didn't see journalists here? Hell yeah. Two thirds can solve it. The third wants nothing to do with it. Aw. I mean, it's a good party trick, to be honest. There's always that, like, opportunity for that, you know, sitting in the, the hiring manager's room where they have a Rubik's Cube on your desk and you're like, Prrr! and they're like, holy shit, this is a genius. We better hire them. For sure. Sophia and I are probably the biggest binge of shills. Uh, for easy program analysis tools? Oh, for sure. Ah! I feel like there's a decent binge talk at most of the conferences that I care about these days. 
Control A is increment, number under cursor. See, that's pretty advanced. <laughs> While we're praising Vincha, the support has been great as well. Yeah. I mean, I can't speak to the support of Binja because I'm just going to always ping uh, Jordan or Rusty directly and I'm going to get special treatment. Um, <laughs> I knew Control-A incremented. Didn't know it would do smart incremental under visual mode. That's super. That's pretty great. Yeah. Yeah, I was on VS Code for a while and then I switched, uh, I switched back to um, Vim. It's just too good. It's not too dissimilar as the pleb to. That's awesome to hear. That's the treatment everyone gets. Aw, thank you so much, Jordan. You're in a great community. I'm really sad that I haven't been able to physically see you in so long. Oh, God. Is Infiltrate going to happen in, like, April or May? Can we solve COVID by then? It's been so long. I need to see people. <laughs> I'm hoping, yeah, I know. I also, I, I don't, low-key, I really hope that the infiltrate ticket carries over to this year because I'm going to be really upset if I paid two grand for uh, online talks that I haven't gone to a single one of. Miss those AfterCon hangouts? Yeah, I'm going to be doing some karaoke for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be doing uh, Infiltrate and Recon if I can. I have zero interest in online cons. Yeah, I'm only I'm only going to conferences for the social interaction. I don't go to most of the talks. I'm, I'm there to see people that I, I care about and uh, meet new people. It's really important. Man, we were talking about soft skills earlier on, on stream. Those are really important. Give me in Infiltrate, please. And recon, yeah. I went to my works conference because it was free and had to set up shit. Uh, <laughs> and Mesa didn't break. Oh, man. Microsoft actually has a pretty decent conference. I think my water's boiling beer back.
Mamma mia, I have some pasta. How's everyone doing? Sorry for neglecting chat. Oh yeah. This is gonna be good. Did I overcook the noodles? I don't think so. I think I fucking slayed it. Um... I like VS Code. The C Sharp support is in it kind of annoys me. Really? Is it not good? I'm surprised it's not good. Oh, it's phenomenal. Fucking love pasta. I want bagels and beer. Bagels and beer. I haven't had a bagel in so long. Line 186 looks really weird. Um, well, it's mainly because it's a line that I split up into multiple lines. So hopefully that's, that's why it looks confusing. We need the backronym being able to binary ninja is life. <laughs> Any garlic bread to go with it? Nope. Honestly, I like garlic bread, but the last couple times I've had garlic bread, I haven't been all for it. The ASMR. Yeah, I'll move, I'll move the uh, the mic away from the food a bit. Dude, why is pasta the best food? Chat, what do we do during an intermission like this? <clears throat> carbs. Carbs. Yeah, carbs are good. All right, we'll, uh, we'll do a uh, GeoGuessr Flags of the World. It's going to be bad. I need an account to play. Shit. I'll make an account. <clears throat> All right. All right. A single player. God, it's going to be bad. I do not know flags. Wait, no, this is just GeoGuessr. No, this is just straight GeoGuessr. Dude, I... Is that, uh... French? <laughs> French? France? Is it a Suzuki? If only you could see license plates. Something Spanish? I guess... LL is Spanish. Okay, I see a mountain. That seems pretty, uh, something. <clears throat> La Grau? I don't know, that doesn't sound like a city to me. It sounds like a route. The flag? Where's, where's the fucking flag? <laughs> I feel like I don't see a flag. Oh, um, shit, uh, so I think Barbados has a similar flag, but not with that crest. Is that Portugal? What do I have to guess here? One of the regions of Spain? How advanced is this quiz? I can't do a region. Romania with stuff with it on it? Uh, 
Historic, historic district. Oh, there's a map in here. Yeah. This is tough, dude. This isn't what I signed up for. I feel like GeoGuessers and CTFs have very similar, like, things with them. Enhance. I actually always thought about getting into GeoGuessr. I think I'd enjoy it quite a bit. Well, that wasn't what I wanted. What else is entertaining? <laughs> GeoGuessr bot? Oh, God. The world's not the same without Flash games, you know? I need a good old-fashioned Flash game to pass the time. Spin up Sp Cyberpunk? I haven't played it yet. Try this one. What is this? Japan reasons Japan regions quiz I can tell you right now I have no idea what any of the regions of Japan are we have to click on Okinawa okay um well I've heard of it so it's probably a prominent region um You can't just tell me what it is. That's not how this works. I mean, I'm, I'm now going to listen. Um, God, Twitch chat. <laughs> All right. So what do we have here? Yeah, none of these mean anything to me. Can you do it for America? Yeah, 50 states. Let's fucking go. Let's go. Florida. Kansas, Oklahoma, Iowa, fuck, I always get these ones, these ones confused, one's Mississippi and one's Alabama, I feel like this one's Alabama, nah, fuck, Alaska, Montana, Wisconsin, Arizona, Maryland, Nebraska, Arkansas, Tennessee, New Hampshire. It's uh, uh, this one. Pennsylvania, North Dakota, New York, Oregon, South Carolina, Virginia, Vermont, Illinois, Maine. Wyoming, Idaho, New Mexico, North Carolina, New Jersey, fuck, Nevada, uh, Ohio, I misclicked on that one, Indiana, Michigan, Louisiana, Utah, Missouri, California, West Virginia, Washington, South Dakota, Kentucky, Connecticut, <clears throat> Hawaii, Colorado, Georgia, Minnesota, Delaware, Rhode, I Oops, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Texas. Oh, there we go. Fucking slayed it. Mer American. America. I think I misclicked two of those. <laughs> now you're up. Oh, God, this is going to be bad, dude. This is going to be bad. Fuck! It starts with a hard one. Sweden. Finland. Um, it's this one. Oh, jeez, this is a hard one. <laughs> Hungary. God damn it. It could be so many! 
<laughs> I gotta get more food. Be right back. This is gonna be easy. So Hungary is probably like this. Fuck, that's Be Belarus. Uh, so, nah, it's Poland. So is, th is this one? It's this one. Fuck. <laughs> Czech Republic. This is this is not gonna go well. Eastern Europe just has too many countries, to be honest. Too too many countries. Malta? You mean the MIPS architecture? Isn't that like one of the things up in this territory? I think it's I think it's a sea a sea based thing. Malta is an island? That's what I thought. That's why I hovered over islands. It, no, that's Cyprus. What the... What? It's not It's not like up here. No, it's down here. It's... What? What the fuck? Oh, is it this? Ah, it's just a dot. <clears throat> Austria. God, these are hard, man. These are tough. One of these two. One of these two. This one. Yes! Easy! Kosovo. Um... I feel like I know the shape of Kosovo, but I, it's going to be on the, in, in more of the Russian side of things. Definitely Eastern Europe. I don't think it's north. The shape is on the flag. I know, I know, but now I can't think about it. Fuck. No, that's, that's Serbia. I knew that one. <laughs> it's not up here, is it? No, I think it's down in more... Oh, baby! Bosnia and, and Herzegovina? What the fuck are these places? Um... Jeez, like, I didn't even know there were this many countries here. This is, like, a lot of land. I thought Europe was just, like, France, Germany, and England. I didn't know that there were, like, other countries here. <laughs> Dude, I have no idea on this. Bosnia? It sounds... I want to say more south. Just from the name, knew it was south. United Kingdom? That's fucking easy. Romania? Oh, Jesus Christ. I think Romania is a, a middle, a medium sized country. I don't think it's tiny. Um. I think it's relatively large. No. Fuck. It's not that. It's like one of... Son of a bitch. Portugal. Albania. Shit. Shit. Albania's gonna be a tiny little boy. Fuck, I was close. I had the right ballpark. <laughs> Ireland. Serbia. Serbia's cold. It's going to be a, one of these... 
What do you mean? I thought his Serbia was cold. Fuck. <laughs> Is <laughs> Slovakia? It's got a it's got a Polish like flag. Serbia's cold. Nope. I think Slovakia is like is is one of, is one of these bad boys up in here. It's inherited that that. <sighs> Oh, fuck off. Come on. San Marino. That's an island. It has to be an island. You don't call something San unless it's an island. Um, that, is that a... That, no. No. Please tell me this is an island. Shit. <laughs> it sounds like an island. Well, it's gonna it's gonna be a coastal thing. Oh, well, that's Greece. Um. Oh, what the fuck? Oh, fuck off! Come on. What is that? A, a small carving of of Italy? Some revolt probably happened, and they're like, "Sure, fuck it, we'll be a country too." That's not fair. Come on, dude. This is rigged. Oh, let me guess. This is going to be the Vatican? There's going to be a thing for the Vatican? Fuck off. Liechtenstein? Never going to find this one? It's, 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 it's in... Oh, no! It's going to be... It's going to be in this, in this ballpark just because it's got a Stein in the name. It's not this, is it? No. Fuck. Oh, God. It's this one. It's, it's this. That's Denmark. God damn it. No. Where? Oh, it's, it's literally this. I thought that was Greenland up there. I mean, the shape doesn't match. Um. Fuck. What do? Hmm. Mamma mia. I didn't even know these were countries up here. I just thought this was uh, USSR up here. I feel like, I feel like in uh, the late 1940s, this map was a lot simpler. Latvia. No. Moldo. Fuck me. Spain? Got it. Greece? Got it. Belgium? Hmm. It's one, it's one, it's one of these things, isn't it? It's not. I knew that. I knew that. Oh, I, I wonder, I wonder which one this is. Hmm. 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 <laughs> Andorra, that's definitely going to be Mediterranean. Oh, oh, it's just a made up random village in Spain. Dude, you Europeans suck at conquering shit. There's way too many nations here. If this was America, there would be just states, and it would be one country. Bullshit. Pick up your, pick up your slack. Estonia? Fuck, dude. Oh, baby! 
North Macedonia. That's not in the north? North of what? Greece? Come on, fuck off. <sighs> Bulgaria. Mmm. God, that's so embarrassing. Ah! Uh, ah! Uh. Ha! 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 God damn it. You're doing better than I would. Oh man. Moldova. What the fuck? That looks like a Spanish flag. I should probably look at when they tell me that it's something. It's, it's, uh, the Belarus is massive. Oh, Vatican, v Vatican City. I fucking got that one. Monaco. Bam. Switzerland. Croatia. Oh, fuck me. Now they're, I don't even know what colors mean that I clicked them or not. Oh, shit. Fuck! Easy. Easy. Forty-seven percent! Forty-seven percent! Hell yeah! One of the best Americans to ever do this. Why didn't they ask for Israel? Oh, Jesus, dude. Jesus. Sorry, Eastern Europe. Shout out to all the Eastern European viewers. Sorry. Passing in public schools? Number fucking one, dude. Number one. Not bad for never going to Europe, to be honest. <laughs> I feel like if I if I actually traveled to Europe, I would have actually fucking known half of these, because I would have looked at a goddamn map. <laughs> Not even passing in here? We're in America. Chinese regions? Yeah, no fucking way, dude. South America? Oh, come on. What even is this? The fuck is this? It's going to be small. It's going to be... Ugh. There's not islands on here, too. No, it's just South America. God damn it. Oh, Colombia. Bolivia. Fuck. Fuck. <sighs> uh. Uh. No, that's Peru. There it is. Paraguay? No, that's Argentina, you dumbass. Uh, Chile, that's easy. Ecuador. Uh, Argentina. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> Dude, where's, uh, where's, uh, where's Falkland Islands? Come on! I could have done Falkland Islands. <laughs> Not much room for air. It, there aren't many countries. That's for sure. Pacific? Oh, I can't do the Pacific. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me, mate? Oh, fuck off. New Zealand, Australia. Okay, give me the easy ones. Fiji? Fuck. Fuck! Tonga. Ha! 
how, how do people know these things? They're islands. Shit, I should know this one. Fuck! Fuck! Aw, oh, come on! Ah, oh, dude, these are, like, I don't even know half these places. I feel fucking bad. Oh, what the f- There's nothing even there! Not bad, not bad, not bad. Honestly, not bad. <laughs> not bad. Is there a guess the time zones? I mean, that's pretty easy. What about North America? Oh God, what if I can't do, oh fuck me, dude, these are tough. Fuck! I knew it was small. I feel like I should uh, know this one. <laughs> Best country in the world. Easy. 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 <sighs> Come on. I'm one of the most smartest people here. Let's do Asia. Oh, fuck. These are tough. This isn't, includes the Middle East. Oh, son of a bitch. Fuck. Oh, geez. Georgia. Oh, fuck me. Uh, it's, one, it's one of the things that, uh, that Russia tried to take over. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, fuck. Okay, okay. Um, oh shit. Um, no, that's UAE. No, what the fuck? God. Oh, come on! How, that's not fair. Sri Lanka? Holy shit. Um, I should know this one. Easy. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. I'm just guessing here. Uh... Okay, okay. I was in the ball... Uh, east. East something. East gonna be somewhere in this area. Oh, holy fuck, dude. This is... Im oh, come. Oh, fuck off. That's not fair. Uh... Uh, Turkmenistan. No, that's Turkey. Uh, fuck. It's up in... It's Azerbaijan. Turkmenistan. Okay, okay, okay. Fuck. Thailand? Dude, I'm always so bad at these. Jeez. Oh no. Fuck! I had the ballpark! Oman? I, I feel like I, I hear golf. It's it's one of these. Isn't it? Kurdistan? Oh fuck, dude. Oh come on! Philippines? 
It's, uh, the use. Okay, Laos. There we go. Russia. Kazakhstan. Saudi Arabia. Bernoulli. Mmm, fuck, this is gonna be one of those tough ones, isn't it? I'm thinking, I think, I think it's gonna be small. Um... Fuck. Fuck. Myanmar? Jesus, this is bad, this is bad. Really? Oh, that's so... Uh, Kuwait. Shit. Shit. Kuwait's not that big, is it? There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh... Pakistan? Fuck! Maldives? That, those, are out, uh, those are out in here. Somewhere. Fuck. Oh, come on. These, these bad boys. Mon Mongolia? Singapore. Oh, shit. Oh, oh. Malaysia? UAE? North Korea? Bahrain. Fuck. How do people know these things? There's so many, like, things. Oh, jeez, I wouldn't have gotten that one. Taiwan, Indonesia. Turkey. Oh, shit. Lebanon? What? I can't even ballpark that one. Where's a... Uh... What? 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 <sighs> 52? 52, not bad, <laughs> not bad. Whew. 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 God damn. That's fucking tough, dude. That's tough. <laughs> that is tough. God damn. I don't think I've ever tried, I didn't even know there are that many countries in Asia, Africa, there's no way, there's no way, I can't, I can't, I can't do, <sighs> Western, I got West and East confused like a fucking idiot, oh, uh, what? How am I going to know that? Djibouti? I feel like it's, uh... I was going to say small Zimbabwe. Oh, shit. This one, this is one that I should know. If I don't know this, I'm literally just randomly guessing, right? Uh, <laughs> NA education. <laughs> Fuck. It's gonna. It's one of the. It's one of the big ones. It's not. Oh jeez, this is bad. This is bad. I'm literally guessing for these. Uh, this is gonna be up in in this area for sure. Hundred percent. Okay, islands. Yeah, Togo. That's inland. I'm pretty sure. Fuck no. Is that an island? Oh, it's so close. Shit. Uh, Senegal. Uh, 
Fuck, I don't even remotely know. This is so bad. I, I like, I don't even, I can't, I can't even ballpark. Oh, I mean, that one's easy. Uh... Fuck! <laughs> I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't. I literally, I don't know. I'm literally just guessing. Fuck, dude. That's embarrassing. Fuck. I need to practice a few times. I'm, I'm pretty sure I could get that down. If I, if I practice a couple times, I could figure that one out. All right. The other day I learned Swaziland changed the name. Really? I didn't know that. Thank you for making my day. It's not easy. Damn it. Twitch chat. Um, okay. Let's, uh, let's, let's get back to something I know how to do, which is write code. Uh, uh, get memory map. Okay. Uh, we allocate some room on the stack. We then pass that stack information, the key, description size, which we populate with our expected size. Description version, we get all that information out. Go through each entry in the memory map. Uh, read the entry as a descriptor, so we just read that data. And then convert it into a Rust enum. And then we have the entry there, and this will tell us all the memory regions. There's an exit. This uh, that stuff, and then these are all the structure definitions, and I think we commented these uh, quite well. So all of those don't really matter. Okay, um, that's actually looking pretty good. So what we need to do... God, that's so embarrassing. Chat, help! What did I get, like 50% on all of those except for Africa, which I got a zero? How is it possible? How can people know all those countries? Jeez. It's okay, I just got 30% on Europe. It's the wine, that's what it is, it's the wine. It's the NA education. Be right back, I'm gonna get rid of this dish so it doesn't stink up the room.
All right, chat. Let's get some code going. Uh, EFI memory descriptor. That is the raw descriptor. And what do we care about? We care about the type. Honestly, we just care about the regions that are usable as uh, actual memory. So, uh, we want avail past post boots. Po post boot. What? Av available post exit boot services. And I think what we want to do is basically, um, we just want to probably make a fixed size array that will hold the information. Um, and then we'll return that out. So let's try that. Let's do um, the uh, Rust memory map and uh, let me usable memory and we'll make this a none for, I don't know, 32 is probably acceptable here. And then these are going to be a struct usable memory drive debug we don't care about the type we just care about the start address and the end address and i don't know if they use start and end so we're going to see if it's start and size or start and end uh number of pages okay um this is a uh, start address inclusive of the memory region, and I might pull in my range set uh, code here in a second, and address uh, inclusive of the memory region. And this is um, holds a range of uh, usable physical memory. Seventy-three. Um, Used equals OU size. If entry something post something something. If this entry is usable, I think it's on the type actually. If the type is uh, check if this memory is usable after boot services are uh, exited, then we can do a uh, used plus equals one and usable memory uh, used is equal to usable memory start entry uh, probably patter physical address. Physical start, end, entry, physical start. We'll say if um, entry uh, num pages, number of pages, okay, number of pages. If there is a non zero amount of pages, then it will be equal to the number of pages, and then we can do uh, let bytes is equal to entry number of pages to u64, uh, checked multiply by 4096, um, get the number of bytes for this uh, memory region. Man, my wine's wearing off and I gotta fix that. I gotta fix that. Okay, and this is uh, some and this is going to be a uh, memory map overflow and this is an integer overflowed occurred when CC uh, when processing uh, EFI memory map data okay. Okay, um, checked mole, uh, okay, or error. 
uh, memory map overflow. I'm gonna say integer overflow. I'm gonna say integer overflow. Integer, okay, so we're going to get the number of bytes for this memory region. And then we're going to uh, end is equal to entry physical start, uh, checked add, um, entry number uh, bytes, uh, minus one. We know that that's going to succeed because this is greater than zero. Uh, so we'll subtract one from that. That will get us an inclusive range. Okay, or error memory map integer overflow. This is um, compute the end physical address of this region. Beautiful. So we should have a start and an end. And this is uh, set the uh, usable memory information. Uh, 176. Okay, uh, let's just do a clone and a copy here. Beautiful. And then we will do a memory map out of entries. And this is uh, the uh, EFI memory map had more entries than our fixed size array uh, allows. There you one, okay, and then we can say that down here. Um, let's, okay, eh. let um is equal to usable memory get used, get mute, used, uh, question mark, uh, get the entry for uh, the next free usable memory range. Honestly, we're probably going to replace this code. I'm not 100% sure how I want to do this. And then we'll say, um, okay, or error memory map out of entry use, I think is what we called that error. Oh, yeah, hell yeah. Uh, increment the number of used entries. Okay, and then we have a delete failure, which of course will happen when we print, and we can get rid of that print. And now this, we can return from this function a uh, usable memory for 32. And then we can say uh, const num memory regions, u size is 32, and this is the number of memory regions that we expect. Uh, the number of usable physical memory regions that we expect from um, that the maximum number of usable physical memory regions that we uh, can uh, save from EFI. Okay, catch up on chat in a minute here. And then here, we just return usable memory. Done. Uh, option? Oh, yeah. Because that will give all of the memory regions. Cannot leak private type. I agree. We'll make these public. Beautiful. ACPI was pretty good. We'll be coming back to that shortly. Now, uh, you should be able to do is uh, initialize ACPI, um, system table register. This is uh, okay, uh, init. ACPI, and then this is get the memory map. Um, and exit boot services. 
be able to get the memory map, and then we can say memory map is equal to this, and then we can print, we can pretty print this as hexadecimal, and then this was going to fail. Um, and the reason this is going to fail is because we exit those boot services, and we're probably going to have a failure, uh, yeah internal error, and that's going to be happening due to this exit boot services, so we're going to comment that out temporarily so that we can use prints for a second. How does returning such a huge array look like in the in assembly in the Rust ABI? Um, it's just uh, uh, the, like, it's reserved space on the stack on the, uh, basically, parent, and then a pointer to it. Wow, there's a lot of regions. We almost used up our 32 here. Let's see. How big is that? Uh, 32, and then we have 8 bytes times 2 for each entry. That's 512 bytes. Might be an extra byte in there. That might be 1024 on the stack, but that's not too bad. Um, I don't know how much they allocate on the stack, but I'm assuming we can go to a little bit larger size, and this will be more accommodating to other firmwares. Because I don't, I don't like being that close. Uh, to the capacity, especially in Kimu, which is going to use a pretty virgin uh, memory state. Okay, this looks pretty good. So here we have all of the memory ranges that are usable, and then hopefully that excludes ourself. I don't know if it does or not, but hopefully we are not included in that. What are we doing? We're doing some OS dev right now at the very early stages. We're trying to basically determine what memory is free on the system. Um... I think I'm gonna pull in range set. It just... I can't rewrite it in a better way. It's just there's nothing I'm gonna do to really improve that. Um, let's see. Let's check out our other code first. We know that EFI is looking pretty good now, pretty well commented. Uh, let's do a cargo doc. Make sure that actually checks out. Good. ACPI is good. EFI, good. Oh yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, this is looking great. Okay, um, core requirements, good. This parameters, returns, that's really nice. EFI, good. MM, we don't really do anything in here yet. Fizz slice, that might actually get moved into uh, ACPI. Online T from physical. Level. Yep. Print. Nice. Easy. If I main and panic. Don't have comments on those yet, and we'll add those. Okay. Um. I think we're going to pull in uh, range set. And range set um, basically allows us to have uh, regions of memory, don't need a no standard on that. Uh, compare, we'll have that. And then we're just gonna audit this code, make sure it's good before we pull it in, of course. Uh, mod range set. So this should just build, to be honest. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. No surprise, my code typically can copy pasta pretty well. Library which can, uh, provides, uh, we'll say module. 
Odulich provides a range set which contains non-overlapping sets of U64 inclusive ranges. The range set can be used to insert or remove ranges of U64s and thus is very useful for physical memory management. An inclusive range, we don't use range inclusive as it does not implement copy. Okay, so this is the um, start of the range inclusive and this is the end of the range inclusive. This is a non-overlapping inclusive U64 ranges, fixed array of ranges in the set, number of entries in ranges, uh, it's not a U size to make it fixed size and we can pass it directly from protected mode to long mode. Um, we're going to say U size here because we can do that now. We only have one operating mode of our kernel. Create an empty range set, yes, zero and then in use is zero. Get all of the entries, that just returns a slice. We don't need to as you size that. Delete the range. Um, assert the index. And that is not public, so I'm actually okay with an assertion there. And then uh, go through all of the ranges. Ranges.swap. Okay, so I swap it to the end of the list, and then I decrement the number of uh, valid ranges. Okay, so I basically swap it to the end, uh, which will put the last thing in that place, and then we remove, we decrement the number of in-use entries. Okay. And then we have insert a new range into this range set. Um, if it overlaps with an existing range, the ranges will be merged. Uh, if the range has no overlap with an existing range, then it will simply be added to the set. Um, this, we're going to assert that the range is in the correct ordering. I'm fine with that. I don't need to return an error. Then here we're going to try merges. Uh, here we're going to make sure we have room. Um, I'm okay with an assert here, I think. We'll think about that. I don't know if that's what we want. We might actually want to return errors here then. Uh, try merges loop, go through each range, get the entry. If there is overlap between the range we're about to insert and the range that is currently present there, uh, if there is no overlap, then continue. So just keep looking. If there was overlap, make sure uh, this range is a combination of the existing ranges. Um, okay, so we basically make the superset, delete the old range, and then we keep looking. Okay, so we, we basically, in place, we go through, we check if there's overlap. If there is overlap, then we compute the superset, we delete the old range, and we keep looking. And this is going to basically consume everything that has any overlap. And then once we've discovered there's no more overlap, uh, then we actually insert that range as a new entry at the end of this structure. And then remove. This is kind of the same thing. We're going to try subtractions here. Go through each of the entries, get the entry itself. If there is no overlap, then there's nothing to remove. If the range is entirely contained in the entry, then delete the range and then just keep going. Basically, if we remove something and it's a superset, just completely delete it. Otherwise, there's partial overlap. So if the start um, is prior, then we know that the uh, overlap is on the low end and we just adjust the low end. Um, if it's on the high end, adjust that end. And then it fits inside, in which case we actually have to split a range in two uh, and we compute that here. And that looks fine. Uh, everything's good here. So... Basically, we adjust one of the ranges, and then we insert a new range, and this is going to basically split that range in two. Uh, subtracts a range set from self. Um, okay, for each of the entries in the range set. Okay, that just allows us to do a range set on a range set. Uh, sum, this is going to accumulate the size of all these ranges. Okay. Allocate, this is going to... Allocate size bytes, which is going to basically find size-free aligned bytes. 
and then allocate prefer is going to allocate it preferring to allocate out of these regions. And this is what we're going to use as the core of our physical memory manager. Just played around with Godbolt. It's not even copied, written directly to a pointer living in the color st stack from. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. Don't allow allocations of zero size. Make sure uh, alignment is non-zero and a power of two. Generate a mask, uh, and that's fine. We know that that subtraction is, is fine and won't underflow. Then we go through each of the entries, and this is going to search. Determine number of bytes needed to pad. So we're going to figure out basically the padding that's required on this region. So we have like a bunch of different memory regions, and we're finding which one we want to allocate from. Validate it's addressable in the current processor state. Um, I don't need that. Okay. Um, check if it has enough room to satisfy the allocation. If it doesn't, go to the next. Then, if there's a specific region the caller wanted to use, then we go through uh, all of the regions. We determine if there's overlap. If there is, compute the rounded up alignment for the overlapping region. Uh, check if we are wholly contained uh, in that region. Um, then, we know we can subtract one from size, right? Yes. Um, make sure it fits in the addressable space. Uh, we don't need that. We know that the uh, allocation can be satisfied starting at align overlap, in which case we return that as the allocation. Uh, compute the best allocation size to date, and that will update the previous size. If the allocation is none or that is greater than... Okay, what is this doing? If we haven't found an allocation or the previous best size is greater than this size, then update the allocation. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's the logic that I want. Align fix. Determine the number of bytes for front padding. Compute the base and end of the allocation. Check if it fits. If it doesn't, just go regions. Here we are going to, if allocation is none, or this is a smaller allocation and base, I don't think that's what I think it's supposed to do. Align overlap. Huh. Um, this is like the core of our, our physical memory management. So it does matter that we get this right. Compute the best allocation size. Previous size is equal to the allocation, okay, so we basically determine the size of the previous one. Allocation is base and end. Align overlap. I don't know if that logic applies anymore. I think this is trying to find the smallest allocation that satisfies the requested allocation. Um, but I don't think, since we changed some of this code, I think there's a chance that that no longer applies. Um, preview size, n minus base, update. I don't think that'll ever happen. Mm. Oh, no. This is the start of the entry. Okay, it is correct. Yeah, this is good. This is going to find the smallest allocation that satisfies the request. Um, 
Unfortunately, that's not always going to be Numa local. Oh, if we found one, break allocation search, which is this. So we basically um, uh, break out immediately as we prioritize Numa over uh, size. Okay, so basically if we found a Numa region that satisfies this allocation, get the fuck out and then just remove that uh, allocation, return the pointer, otherwise we return the none. Uh, swap these ranges, swap these ranges. If A starts prior to B and B starts prior to when A ends, then there's overlap. Uh, if it's contained, swap those and then check if it is um, entirely contained and that logic is good as well. Okay, so. We're gonna switch this code then. In here, memory map. This is gonna return a range set. Um, two forty three. It's going to be a uh, usable memory. Usable memory. This is going to be a range set new. And then we'll want a range in here as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, starting and end. And then we can do a uh, usable memory insert. Uh, range set, start end. Something like that. It's not uh, completely perfect yet. Uh, 219, start and end. Uh, I think we don't name things that, oh, this is a range. So insert into that range set. Uh, we want to insert that 219 start, not a value. And that is going to be uh, start is entry start, end is equal to the end, uh, physical start. Uh, 47, that is on this. Range set doesn't implement debug, which uh, we can just do that here. And that should work in modern Rust. Okay, so we can see all of the entries, and more specifically, what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, dot entries, and this is going to slice it up, um, and that's what we actually wanted to do. We don't want debug on that. So this will give me all of the different physical memory ranges, and this has combined them. Before there were like 32 entries, and now there are fewer entries because we've collapsed them into uh, basically anything that was contiguous before has been collapsed and combined. Um, and this looks good. This looks really good. Um, yeah, and this is all the physical memory that we have free. So I can then print, uh, print uh, physical free this mm.len. I think that'll give me the number of bytes. I might have called it sum. Yeah. I'm going to just com uh, say len there. Uh, maybe I will keep it as sum just because I return an option. Try fold that checked add. Uh, yeah, we'll just do an unwrap here. And this will give us the number of bytes that are free. Yeah, 128 megs in that ballpark. And then if I do a Kimu and we set this to like uh, eight uh, gigabytes. Um, what we should be able to do is divide this down. Oops, 
Take this divided by 1024 by 1024, and we have 8,187. So 8192 minus that, we'll see that 4.97 megs is just overhead and shit, and that's kind of out of our control. Uh, target debug. Let's just see how big our kernel is. Um, Fuzzos.efi. Looks like our kernel is about 2.1 megs. That's because we have debug. Um, information in there and we haven't stripped it so that's not too bad yeah if we were to strip that let's just see uh, strip this yeah we have two uh, 200 K which is not too bad oh yeah and that's not optimized either um, Let's just say opt level Z. Uh, profile, it's not debug. Um, profile dev, I think. There we go. So this is gonna build it uh, basically as small as it possibly can. Once again, we don't care about the size, um, but this is something that is just uh, interesting for me to understand. Um, since we use some of these string formatting things and some pretty printing, I expect this kernel will be relatively large. Um, it's probably going to be like 60k or so. Uh, two megs there, we'll strip it. And, okay, it's 44 kilobytes in size. Um, yeah, and the reason that is 44 kilobytes is pretty much entirely due to uh, the print macro. So if we go into source prints... And we were just to make this a knob where print doesn't do anything. Let's see what happens now. Um, and we're also not doing LTO, but we'll see. 30, 37 kilobytes. Hmm. Uh, LTO is uh, fat. Fat? See what happens. Best behind play. How many monitors do you need? Come on, so yes. It's pretty accurate. That's pretty accurate. When we saw something before. Undefined symbol. Uh oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. But why? Wide shift left? What the fuck? Risk five. You size leading zero is risk five. What? Might be a weird compiler bug, to be honest. I don't care too much about it. Uh, cargo clean. Sh kimu. All right. Anyways, we don't care about the uh, size of this kernel, so we'll just build this, get this running, and then um. Should be able to make a physical memory allocator relatively soon here. Which then means we'll be able to allocate stuff. Okay. And where are we getting loaded to? I'm actually really curious um, if EFI is relocating us or assluring us.
What? I'm just trying to get the address of EFI main. Uh, it doesn't look like we're getting relocated. Um... If we take a look, and let's see, does this line up? If it does line up, then we know that we're not getting relocated, but I, I know we're not because, yeah, uh, that looks good. So, um, basically, this code is getting compiled as uh, pick position independent code, uh, and that's causing, causing a lot of um, kind of bloat to the, to the code here, and I really don't like that. So... You can kind of see like these move absolutes, uh, these calls here. Uh, these are things that can be fixed up in relocations. Um, and I kind of don't like that. So um, let's take a look at the relocations that we have. What flag is that? Dash R. Wow. Well, that's what I would have expected. Uh, target uh, uh, debug os.efi okay no relocations oh because it's a uh, pe and i don't think object dump is parsing this yeah fuck There's a relocation model. Um, okay, uh, let's try this. C uh, relocation, uh, print relocation models. So static would get rid of that, I think. I actually don't want it to relocate. Let's see what happens here. Um, I'm gonna take a look at what I do in Chocolate milk's bootloader. Um, because we're going to actually want to make a copy of this kernel. Wow, and that ran? Shit. Uh, so what we should see is there shouldn't be as many of those, uh, things going on here. Let's take a look at this entry point. Okay. There's still a move. Absolute. I'm curious if that's EFI requiring that. Build release. <sighs> Panic is abort. LTO is fat, debug is true. I'm gonna try this quick, I just wanna see. Still using chocolate milk? No, we're stealing some code from it, but we're not really using it. Uh, 
Uh, 51k, not bad, not bad. So, lower D. I don't like this relocation. The fuck? Host flags, relocation model static. I just want to make sure this doesn't build. Doesn't. Create type. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if it's overridden with the uh, uh, compilation environment. I wonder if EFI requires relocations. I mean, that would make sense to me that it would require that because it's hard to satisfy that you can load it at a fixed address. Um, code model. Uh, let's try that quick. Rust C print code models. Yeah. Don't care about those. Link arg, link args. Self-contained. So you're unsure about whether this will be open source? I mean, I'm probably gonna open source it, but I'm in no rush to open source it until it's doing something. Target feature, target CPU, save temps. Um, prefer dynamic, no stack check. What? I'm confused if that's getting overridden by something, which would be kind of annoying. Um, I don't know why that would be happening. Huh. It doesn't matter too much, but it is a performance penalty. Like... That's... Relocation model static. That's on the code gen side, and then we're not getting that. I feel like that's getting overridden. And maybe that's the correct thing. Maybe uh, EFI is uh, supposed to have overrides. Raven XQ, thank you so much for the follow. Hell yeah. Glad you're enjoying this interesting content as we try and figure out the basics of how linkers work. 
Random fanboy donated a dollar four hours ago. I completely missed that. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, random fanboy. Cheers. Thank you for all quality and instructive content on YouTube. Hell yeah. Um. Ah, oh, man. Why is that getting uh, relocated? Who's doing that? I forget how I get the uh, config. Faust Petrovic, thank you so much for the five gifted subs. Hell yeah. Holy shit, dude. Glad you're enjoying the content. Um, do you ever use the computer on your right? Yeah, I use it all the time. Uh, let's see, print uh, config. There we go, okay. So then what we wanna do is uh, target. Let's see, uh, target. This print config. That it's not what I want. Print config target list TLS models. Ooh, I am curious about those. These are the thread local store uh, storage models. Huh. Okay. Uh, thread spec or target spec. That's what I want. This is where I think things might be getting fucked. So this is going to give me the JSON spec of uh, that target. So this basically internally tells me how the compiler is going to treat uh, this target. And we can see LLD link, right? We can, we can see that it's going to be using LLD link as the linker flavor. Uh, we can see that it's using soft floating points. Um, the way that data is being laid out, uh, red zones disabled. Don't emit GDB scripts. Weak linkage is off. Code model is large. Panic strategy is abort. Single threaded is true. Ooh. Stack probes, true. What? What? Really? There's not stack probes in the EFI, no fucking way. Maybe that's just to, so it crashes harder. I don't know. Frodo, how's it going? How you doing? What a morning, hell yeah. Code model large. Disable red zone, that's good. Suffix for the exe. The soft float is interesting. Is built in. I don't know what that means. Max atomic with 64. Technically it's 128. Oh, this is Yuffie. Arg subsystem EFI application. C int width is 32. Target Indian. Yeah. Um, those things seem reasonable, and I don't see any reason why it would be. What's info? Um, we don't need this either. So, <sighs> it 
It's not code model large, is it? I don't think so. I think large just means that it expects that things should be 64-bit. I'm pretty sure if we said uh, small, these would change uh, some of the um, some of those constants we see in the binary. See, uh, I think this will change it from using the 64 bit immediates, but it somehow I got to convince it to be static, and I. Okay, it definitely affected code gen. If I main. Brust probe stack. Oh, there it is. Wait, call probe stack. Yeah, there's the call to compare. What the fuck? So if I do a large code model, I think that implies that we need 64-bit values for these addresses. Yeah, dude, it's that. It's, um, hmm. So what if I said code model is kernel? I don't know why that's an option. I don't know what it means. Um... I think these come from LVM, actually. I'm trying to find info on it. Let's see what this does. Yeah, that's much better. Uh, probe stack is kind of interesting. I feel like probe stack is not needed here. Uh, that's gonna touch each stack a page at a time. Um, I highly doubt EFI uses stack probes. Like that would make no sense to me. Let's see if I can find information on a stack here. Um. Stack after this on uh, Intel. 128K or more of available stack space. No, that's titanium. Um, Hmm, stack space. Okay, this is for x64. 128 kilobytes or more of stack space. Must be 16 byte aligned. Interrupts are enabled. Yeah, like... Um... For an operating system to use Eufy runtime services... And during boot services time, the processor is in the following... Uh, mode 128k of stack space. That's a fuck ton. That's a big ass stack. I don't think I need probe stack then. So we can turn those off. Code models defined by the system uh, v ABI spec. Not in this case. Not in this case. We're not making an elf. Um. So we prefer static, target feature. It's currently in soft float mode, I think. Yeah, let's see what we have here. Floating point quad word, a uh, zero zero uh, EM and TS. Direction flag is clear, GP undefined. 
So MMX might not be supported. Okay. Um, so... Where's the stack probe? Do we have to make our own config? Probe. Hmm. No. What? Huh. So I don't think we can turn off those stack probes unless we make our own config. I'm curious what a tiny code model is. I feel like I've tried like tiny code model. Okay, it doesn't support it. Mm. We'll just uh, keep it at kernel. Um, we just don't want large is the main thing here. And then static is good. Um, I want to turn off those stack probes. And I don't think I can do that unless I uh, make my own config, my own spec. Um, hmm. Hmm. I don't know if I have to do a custom target spec. I, I really don't want to, but I will. Um, it's just making a, a custom target spec is, is scary to me. Fuck it. We're going to do it. Um, uh, target.spec.json. And then Rust C config target, uh, spec JSON. Not config, uh, see help. Is it Z? Um, Hmm. Ah, where did I do this? Where did I make a custom config? I did this recently. Um, God, where would I have written this? What project did I do this on? And how recent was this? 
Maybe I did this offline. Cargo hell, uh, rusty help. Oh, I give it a target, uh, dash dash target. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, cargo targets, target, uh, spec JSON, right? Cargo build for that. Yeah, 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 JSON. Otherwise, there can be some fucky things that happen. I remember. It's all coming back now. C matrix in the background? Hella hacks. Hell yeah, it is. Hi, Dim Dim. How are you doing? Okay. And then let's see. Let's see if this works. Um, relocation model static. Link args debug is dwarf. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cargo build release. Really? Uh, if I call this JSON D, what happens? It doesn't know what to do. Okay. Shit. Shit. So this is basically the spec, uh, and it's kind of defining the way that we want the compiler to generate code. Isn't that fucking cool? Um, so if we look at target debug, Release. Oh, I did build release. Fuzzos.efi vim dash if I main. And we should see uh, this is going to be the, the stack stuff, and then these are going to be um, sweet. So, what we can do is code model, we can say kernel. Um, we can say a relocation model, I think. Moose. I just want to see if this fails, um, which hopefully it does. Uh, moose, not a valid relocation model. So we're going to say relocation model is static. And then code model is uh, kernel. And then we specify all this information. We disable red zones. Emit GDB scripts. We don't want that. Is built in. Is true. Um, sure, LOD link, flavors link, LVM targets, max atomic width, OS is a UFI, panic strategy is abort, single thread, is, I don't necessarily want that, and then there's the stack probe, so now if we take a look, um, we'll see that we have this Rust probe stack that we want to get rid of, and I think that'll probably default, uh, we'll just say false. C int is definitely in a 32. Indian is little. Target pointer with 64. Single thread. Uh, I don't think that matters. And then uh, for flags, we'll say uh, debug dwarf. And that will make us use uh, dwarf flags. And we should really reduce this. Basically, set the default target to use uh, Ufi. Uh, .json, which is our local JSON file, and then set uh, build standard to build core for us. Here we go. 
What are the generated, generated GDB scripts for? I think um, such that you can do like uh, Rust evals. I could be wrong. Undefined check stack. Reference by EFI main. Mmm. Mmm. Really? Um... Check stack sounds like stack canaries, yeah. Stack probes. What? Whoa. It's looking good. Um You can make a dummy function. Yeah, I know that. Uh, but I, I, I don't want that code to even get emit. Hmm. So... Hmm. I'm gonna build a non uh, release build just to see here. That. That's really weird to me. And then this will build. Check stack probes. Hmm. Like of of course we can we we can thunk that out. Like we can get this to build. I, I know that. That's not that's not hard. Uh but I just don't want that code to get emit at all. Where's my uh, debug info? Um, what? I'm going to see if this uh, cargo build. I feel like those link flags aren't being used. Is it in data layout? It, I don't think so. No. Okay, it feels like these are not being used. That's really weird to me. Why wouldn't they be using these link flags? What? Uh, uh rust flags? Rust flags? 
I feel like I should be able to specify those. Link arg uh, debug dwarf That's really weird to me JSON not supporting trailing commas is annoying. Yeah, I agree. Everything should support trailing commas. Okay. And now we have debug info. Yeah, and there's the probe stack. Okay, turn off stack probes. I'm curious if it's not using this for everything. Kind of weird. Yeah, what the fuck, man? File format is ambiguous. How do I specify the file format? <laughs> Target object code from it, yeah. There we go. Let's try that. Um Let's try, uh, it should be a cough. If I main. <laughs> uh, where's the use of check stack? Like, it's not calling check stack. <laughs> um... Call 47. What? What's this fucking call? Is that going to get fixed at a later stage? Um Oh, these these are uh these are going to get fixed up. Okay. Uh so these are this is one of these is probably referencing check stack. I just want to see what code this gens. I just don't want to lose perf to this, right? There's the call to check stack. Well, fuck off, dude. Hmm. How do I turn that off? Oh, this is Yuffie. Is built in LD flavor. Uh, 
I don't know where to find the rust uh, spec information. I'm trying to find it now. Requires LTO. Stack probes. Whether or not probe stacks are enabled. If they're not enabled, then... Oh, this is Yuffie. Hmm. Do have relocation model. We got that earlier. Defaults to pick, and we set it to static, which is good. Um, fuck. Um, is that going to get LTO'd from us? Let's see. Let's try and build a release build. I also don't know why those link args aren't being used. Oh, do they not use it? Because it's not uh, pre-link args. Before any user-defined libraries. Yeah. Why the fuck aren't those getting passed? Okay, check stack's gone, if I main. It, it got optimized out, but I still really don't like that. Um, drop in place? What? the fuck's getting dropped? No. That's the... That's check stack. Um, what would cause that? I like that. Um, let's see, uh, let's see the rust code. Uh, stack probes. Okay. Um, Yuffie stack probes. Uh, when building Yuffie images, we don't link to CRT libraries. We need to provide a stack probe. Without Rust probe stack, the linker ch looks for check stack and fails to link if there's a function with large lo uh, with large locals. And I can't can't disable stack probes. It's really stupid. Um
Let's see if LVM can target Yuffie. Okay. Um, differs from this. 271, 32, 32, 72, 64, 64. Uh, 1632, 64, S128. Okay, let's, uh, let's see. Let's try. The default LVM layout. It's really, uh, uh, I think, a 32 changed to a 64. They added a 64. There shouldn't be stack probes on Yuffie. That would just be ridiculous. I think uh, the rest stuff has kind of a hack on that. Unknown file type. Unfortunate. That's filling on the linking phase. It just has no idea what those binaries are. That's fucking weird, dude. What are these? These are not P. Uh, they're elves. Whoa. Whoa. Entry if I main subsystem lib path. Huh. That's fucking weird, though. Stack rose is false, yep. Yeah. Nibble stack probes. Um what's it called? Like Rust Stack Probe or something like that? Um, check stack. Uh... I just don't understand how they're able to override the, uh... Stack probe. Uh, there's a test. Um, flag your internal probe stack as the stack probe symbol. Maybe there's no way to tell LVM to not use stack probes, which is ridiculous. Are you fucking serious? Hmm. Why though? Uh, 
Um. The sales ABI required stack probes, if any. Come on, LVM. So we, in theory, can do that. I don't know how we pass a LVM flag in Rust. Um, hmm. Oh, yeah, and then uh, we want this to be instead of kernel, we want this to be small. Um, a stack. I don't know if I can pass uh, those flags. Target. Hmm. Um. LD link, check stack. There's got to be a way I can pass those link args. There's got to be, or like custom LVM args, 100%. There's got to be a fucking way. There's got to be a way, right? Um... Hmm. Oh, we have a trace. Fuck. I see LVM args. Oh, nice. Sick. Sick. Thank you. Um, And then, uh, see, stack probes that open like here, right? Stack probes. LVM args, sick. Unknown, oh, uh, this uh, is Windows. Hey, we iced it. Nice. Oh, yeah, and that data layout. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So this is originally what it is. We'll set this to small. We'll set this to false. Those are the only changes we make so far. Cargo clean, cargo build. Um, set the code model to small. Oh yeah, and we also want um, a relocation model. Uh, static. I think that's right. Nice. Okay, so then we should be able to add um, LVM args moose. This is probably going to be a list. Hey! Okay, didn't like moose. So let's try no stack probe. And how do you specify that? Mno dash mno. Mm. Yeah, shit. Uh, targets. Let's try this. Uh, unknown windows MSVC. What? Uh, a uh, PC windows. Okay. Come on, dude. Come on. Really? Fuck. Not all of them get exposed by rust for some reason. <sighs> Come on, dude. Two, two dashes? Is it two dashes? Please. Nope. Nope. Um. No stack arg probe. <sighs> you serious right now? Son of a bitch, man. That's fucking ridiculous. Is anyone even talking about this?
I find your lag of monitors disturbing. Thank you so much, Lord Alpaca. Hell yeah. Mama fucking me a pizzeria. I can I can use this, but I can't use other shit. What do they selectively pass through here? Hmm. Is it? Config. What's LV and Polly? What is Polly? Anyone know what that is? Sounds sounds fun. It's a super optimizer. Oh, cool. Why would they restrict that? That's so frustrating, man. <sighs> I'm so disappointed in you right now, Rust. Come on. Costing me so much code. Saving a little bit of this candle for another day. This candle burns fast. Um. Fuck, man. There's no way to turn that off. That's ridiculous. Fuck. I'm so mad right now. Um... What do I want? Build spec? Something like that. Uh, relocation model small. Uh, oh, static. And then code model small. Comma, space. Can I do, uh... Can I do white space in here? Can I do new lines like that? I hope so. Uh, code model small. Okay. Relocation model's static, code model is small. Well, we fixed the, the main thing that we wanted to, which is those, uh, those relocations being ass. I'm not happy about it, though. Um, Cause those probe stacks aren't fucking cheap, dude. They're only gonna happen on big stack functions, so it's not that big of a performance loss, but I don't want that code to exist because it's a it's a knop. It's a it's a very expensive knop. Um so probe stack. Okay, um and then we're gonna do uh profile dev LTO fats. Oh yeah, we had problems with LTO, didn't we? Um opt level is Z. 
Let's try those for now. Let's see what happens. We'll see if this uh, fails to link. And it does. I don't know what that is. That's kind of fucked. Seems like uh, fat uh, LTO is broken. Let's see if thin LTO works right now. I wonder if it's only uh, LTO doesn't work on a debug build, which honestly is probably fair. Let's, uh, let's change this to profile of release. LTO is fat. This should build. I guess LTO isn't necessarily the best for code size, but... Okay, nice. Nice! Then we'll look at release. Oh, yeah. So still called a probe stack, but I expect that. Yeah, that compare exchange, that got inlined. Fuck yeah. And then this will just be a gigantic function. Uh, calls into core, makes sense. It's good. That's good, relative calls, that's what I like to see. Call into the ACPI table. From address. Nice. That looks pretty good. Um, oh yeah, how big is that probe stack? It's it's non-zero code, but whatever. Um, we can get rid of check stack because that won't get used. Cargo build release. And then there should be no debug information in there, right? Uh, we should be able to just strip that. And let's see how big our kernel is. 25 kilobytes. <laughs> not bad, not bad. And then uh, we can disable print. Because print's gonna be bloating our code quite a bit. 14 kilobytes. <laughs> not bad. Not fucking bad. That's pretty damn good. It's a reasonably sized uh, OS, um, and that's the size of the um, that's the size of the PE, and that's gonna have padding. Yeah, like look at all this padding. It's actually much smaller than that. Yeah. Uh, panic information. So a bunch of strings due to panics. I'm actually surprised this didn't get optimized out. Let me uh, let's see what happens here if I do this. I don't, this shouldn't affect anything, but maybe it will. Thirteen K. Wow, that had an effect. RC pointer, SRAT, right? Those are magic strings. I'm surprised some of these strings aren't getting deleted. Index out of bounds, range set, uh, too many entries, range set. Uh, cause those assertions will pass that info to panic. I guess things aren't getting optimized across the panic boundary. Reasonable. Um, and then of course we just have a bunch of, uh, zero padding because, uh, these are going to be padded out to probably 512 or 4k boundaries. Um, so those don't like really count in my, in my, uh, opinion. Some space <laughs> wasted on this doesn't work on DOS. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's pretty fucking good, mate. Uh 13k. It's it's a lot smaller than that. If we were to actually just strip the like text section out of there, it's gonna be much smaller. Um Yeah, here we go. Text section. Is that many bytes? Uh, eight kilobytes plus uh, the EH frame doesn't matter. Yeah, it looks like it's about 10 kilobytes in size. 
Um, and a lot of that's going to come down to having strings, right? Using strings is going to be a big issue. Um, and these things blowing up into strings is, is kind of a problem. But that's, uh, we want those strings because we want our kernel to have uh, decent error messages. So we're not too worried about those. Okay, um, get rid of those. Honestly, I'm gonna do uh, debug is true and uh, profile release, and we'll just say debug is true on release builds, and then we'll uh, convert this to using release builds. Uh, yeah. Um, and what changes between release builds? I think, um, obviously debug assertions, uh, those align checks. Yeah. We'll, s we'll still work on debugs for, for now until we run into performance issues. Uh, just because we get some stricter assertions. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we can't really fix that stack thing, which is stupid, but whatever. Uh, okay. What's going on here? Is this? Technically don't need that right now. Um, not that that matters. Uh... Do we need a large code model? I mean, maybe. Was that dude at Rusty gating LVM flags? Maybe? I don't know. Let's see if this works. I hope it doesn't. Fuck. So a small code model doesn't work? Because I think that's the only change, and it looks like this is probably going to fail. Yeah, um, okay, so let's try kernel. Hopefully this works. Nope. Don't tell me that needs to be a large code model. Medium? Does it? What? How much does that actually change, though? So that works. We can do medium. But is that back to being fucked? Okay, that one's okay. I don't know what uh, <laughs> I don't know what the difference between those code models are. Uh, 
Um. If ASLR is enabled, you'd need to use medium or large code model. I think it is, um, I think the code model, uh, basically, I think if you use 30, if you use greater than 32 bit addresses, I think you need to use medium. Um, kernel code model, uh, it's usually rather small, but runs in the negative space. Medium code model, uh, data section is split into two parts. The data section is still limited, blah, blah, blah. Only 64K. And then large code model makes no assumptions about address, uh, and sizes of sections. So... Um, so large code model basically uses 64 bit addresses for everything. Medium code model only uses it for certain things in certain sections. Kernel code model assumes everything fits in like a 32-bit address space. Basically that you can use sign extended 32-bit values. It's basically trying to determine whether or not you can use immediates. Um, small code model. Virtual address of code executed is known at link time. Okay, yep. Uh, additionally, all symbols are known to be located in the virtual addresses. All symbols are known to be located in the virtual addresses in the range of zero to two to the 34, uh, two to the 31 minus 24 minus one, or from zero hex to seven E F F F F F. So it allows the compiler to encode symbolic references with offsets in the range of uh, those directly in sign extended immediate operands. Um, and basically, okay. I like this, I like this. Um, it's the fastest code model, and we expect it to be suitable for the vast majority of programs. The kernel code model assumes that the addresses are in the range of F8000 to F, basically that you can use signed addresses once again, but in the negative domain. Medium code model, data section is split into two parts. Um, and you are right, it is specified in the system v ABI. Um, even though we're not doing sysv stuff, that is where they define these things. The program layout may be uh, set in a way that large data sections come after the text and data sections. Uh, requires the compiler to use move ABS instructions to access large static data and to load addresses into registers, but keeps the advantages of small code model for manipulation. Okay. Um, We want to do a small code model. Now the question is, can we get uh, EFI to be okay with that? Um, let's let's see. Um, it's full unless fixed. We could also set fixed. I don't know if we need to. Uh, base, 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 base. Oh, it's just base. Uh, let's, let's try it. We're doing some YOLO stuff here, chat. 
link arg base uh leet. <laughs> so this will set our base address to leet. The question is, will EFI be okay with this? My guess is no. Woo! Look at that, EFI main at leap. Okay, um, sick. We'll set fixed. We don't need to necessarily, um, but fixed will disable base relocations. Just Bye bye. Just get rid of that shit. Dude, I'm surprised that EFI can accommodate that. I'm impressed, EFI. Good job. Good job. Proud of you. Fix debug is dwarf. Relocation model is static. Code model is small. Oh, trailing comma. Is it? No. It's no commas. Hehe. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, fuck yeah. Get fucked. All right. Um So where's lead at here? Oh, here's lead. Does it load it there physically? <laughs> oh, no way. No way. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, 1355. Five. Yeah, that's probably the end, roughly. Yeah. And that's the end of the region. Nice. It's literally loading it into physical memory. Cool. I'm pretty impressed with that. It has to? Virtual memory is identity mapped? Yeah, I guess, does it know that it has to do that, though? Is that like a special case that it recognizes? I'm all for it. That's fucking sick. That's really cool. Alright. So now we can use the small code model. And now this binary is going to be looking more top. More tops. Oh, yeah, look at that. Oh, beautiful. Oh, wow, look at that. Using relatives. Oh, man. Oh, look at this. Is, is that loading an address using a 32-bit immediate? Let's get some claps in chat for 32-bit immediates being used for addressing. <laughs> Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> that uh that's really nice. That's a big improvement. Move abs. Okay, what's going on here though? Why is th why is this using a 64 bit? Why oh, it's not optimized. I was like, why the fuck is it doing that? Um, it's not being optimized. It's like there's there's no reason for the compiler to admit that. Uh profile Release, uh, debug is true. There's no reason for that. Static, no relocations, fixed base. Fuck yeah. That is what I like to see, a nice, nice clean kernel. Okay, object dump. Let's take a look at the release build. Should be looking real good. Oh yeah, look at that. Lock compare exchange right off the bat. That that is uh that's this register code in here, right? This register. There's the compare and swap right away. 
Uh, check with EAX. Using Rip Rel. Beautiful. Love to see Rip Rel. Love to see it. Um, ACPI, initialization. Compare some shit with 7. This is probably some stuff that got inlined. We got a mem copy call here. All of these things. Uh, move. ABS. Not an address, not an address, not an address. Yeah, all these things actually need a move ABS. Yep. 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 No addresses being used for that. Oh! We did it, chat. We did it. We still didn't get rid of the stack probe check, but whatever. Yeah, you got what you get. Okay. And now we know it's not going to get relocated, which is nice. A pug, ew. Yeah, and then th that is verified that we know that the binary itself is being excluded from the free memory, uh, which I also wanted to see. It's really cool. Yeah, everything's just on the up and up here, chat. Um, all right. Now, I don't know how much memory is identity mapped. Um, any memory space defined by the Eufy memory map is identity map. The mappings uh, to... Any memory space defined by the Eufy memory map is identity mapped. So that means literally anything, anything, the, the way I interpret that is anything in the memory map that Yuffie gave us, which is what we're using to get which memory is free, is identity mapped. Um, that is beautiful. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, right? It makes sense that they don't just map in like four gigs and they're like, fuck it, if you want to access more than that, figure it out. Um, but uh, basically, if it's in the memory map, it has been identity mapped. Um, beautiful. And that means we can, uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're done. We can basically allocate physical memory now, right? We can, we can do mm.allocate 1024 by 1024 and we can get an address. I don't know if that's actually how I uh, implement that, but what, you know, in that ballpark sort of thing. Um, okay, and then we'll unwrap that, apparently. Oh, unwrap, assert, expect. Okay, we cleaned up that code. Good. Good, 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 good. Allocate size and align. Okay, so we're going to say, I want a 4K aligned. 44, mute. So I'm going to say, I want a 4K aligned thing uh, for one meg. And this will just give it to me. And there it is. That's, wait, wait, wait. This, allocated this. Uh, was this the first 4K aligned address that was present? No. Oh, these aren't necessarily sorted. OK, yeah, that's fine then. Um, Hey, Alphalius, Apalius, how are you doing? How are you doing, buddy old pal? Okay, so. Um, yeah, and what we should be able to do is loop, and eventually that unwrap will fail, because we'll run out of RAM. Isn't that cool? We'll run out of RAM. This is a really high-end operating system where we will run out of RAM if we... Look at that! We ran out of RAM! <laughs> what a... what a concept. Um... Size align, size align. Why are those, like, one mega lines? I think that's just a fluke. Ram goes brr. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, that. Let me check something quick. Ram goes burr. Okay, so that looks good. Um, I think what we're gonna do is do a little bit of a feng shui. Um, make dir mm. Move mm to mm. Um, mod. Range set to mm. Um. Okay, close that. Obviously, this is gonna fail. Um, we're gonna do mod mm, and then this is gonna do a, a pub mod range set. No longer have a range set. Create mm range set on ify. Uh, yeah, just the top. Uh, core, create, range, set, and then, okay, here we go. Never used, never used, what? What? Oh yeah, uh, that's fair. Okay, those are actually real, uh, real errors. I guess they get shattered when we run QMU. Uh, print. Unreachable statement. Oh, that's just some, uh, super, 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 because of these. Um... EFI status code, EFI status success in, um, oh, we can just do zero. I'm curious what happens. Oh, nice, it just goes right into the BIOS. Okay, so we do want a loop there. I'm gonna get rid of that pub because we won't need to return that status code. If I main, physical free, did that allocation. Um, chat, chat. I think we're like, we're in a good spot. I think we're ready to uh, probably do a virtual memory manager now. Initialize CCPI, get the memory map. We moved MM, uh, we put range set inside of MM. Let's take a look on uh, range sets. Um, unwrap. If allocation is none, or this dot unwrap is greater than that, we know that that unwrap cannot panic because if allocation is sum, then this is sum, and those are evaluated in order. Expect, panic, assert, index out of bounds. Too many entries. Chat, 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 chat. We said no asserts in this kernel, right? What did we say, chat? What did we say about asserts in this kernel? What did we say? What did we say, chat? What 
We don't want him. Really? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, errors associated with uh, uh, range sets operations. Good job, chat. I'm proud of you. Remove the unwraps. I don't think we have any, but we'll, we'll take a look. Uh, well, these we have, because that's test code that we j literally just added for testing. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're working on it, chat. Damn it. If index is greater than self in use return error error um okay this is uh make sure we're delete delete the fuck that doesn't look right. Oh boy, uh, <laughs> make sure that we're deleting um, a valid index. So if the index exceeds in use, wait a minute, greater than or equal to, thank you. Thank you, chat. Um, make sure we're deleting a valid index. If the index is greater than or equal to self in use, then it is an invalid index. Um, equal is obviously out of bounds as well. Um, copy the deleted range to the end of the list, so we... Why do we do a loop? <laughs> Why do we... How do we do a loop? Why don't I just swap it with the last thing in the fucking list? Why do I loop? <laughs> I don't think I expect uh, ordering of these ranges. Ah. Uh... <laughs> Ah. Um. I don't. I don't. Uh. Um. Uh. In use. Unless I wanted to maintain that kind of. But yeah, I definitely don't make any assumptions about the ordering. Chat. What am I doing? And these use sizes. Okay, so swap the index. Yeah. Swap the index with the last thing, right? Um, if it's greater than in use, and then here we, uh, that, basically this assertion makes sure that in use is uh, non-zero. If it's zero, then this will never pass, right? Th because all of, if in use is zero, then this will never pass. And then here what we do is we swap, the index with the in use, boop, put it at the end and then decrement in use. <laughs> I have no idea why I did a loop there, chat. How, how did that code live for like a couple years like that? Not that it really matters. Um, right? If it's greater than or equal to in use, it's bad. Otherwise, then we go into here, we swap the entries in that list between the index and the in use, which will swap where, wherever that index is with the last thing, and if it is the last thing, then nothing happens. Swap it and then reduce the length, which will then cause that in use to fall off. Um, so let's think through it. If we had a, If we had an empty thing, then in use will be zero and nothing 
or everything will be greater than or equal to zero. So if we had a length of one, uh, then a zero would be would not be greater than or equal to z uh, one, and thus a zero would be acceptable. We would use the zero index, we'd swap it with the zero, it would then cause one to swap with itself, and then we'd set in use to zero and empty that set. Okay, if we had one, two, and we said, I want to remove zero, then this will swap the one and the two, it'll become two and one, then we uh, remove everything and it becomes two. Yeah, I, I, like that logic definitely works. It's definitely deleting. Yeah, yeah. Like it's 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 it's, it's fine. Um, I don't know why I had the for loop before. Um, in use is zero entries that just slices it up. Then here, uh, here we'll say if range dot end. Assert the start is less than or equal to range end. So if the end is less than range start, return error, error, valid range. And this is uh, check the range. This will return a result. Um... An index to a range entry was uh, specified, which was out of bounds. And then what we can do here is um, a range uh, was specified with an invalid shape uh, start greater than end. Noise. In use is use size. Yeah, so we don't need those casts anymore. Get rid of those casts first. Look at this improvement going on here. Okay. If the end is uh, before the start, then that's an invalid range. I'm back. We're still doing EFI. We're doing a physical memory allocator right now, which is related to EFI. We're mainly doing code cleanup. Uh, outside uh, loop forever until we run out of merges with existing. So try merges. Go through each thing. Get the entry. Um, and then self.delete. Continue try merges. Okay, so go through everything, get the entry. If there is overlap, um, okay, and then the saturating adds make the uh, make touches uh, overlap. Um, Yep, makes sense. If there's any overlap between the two, then uh, continue. Wait. If it overlaps, then continue? Oh, if, uh, if it does not overlap, then yeah, continue. Otherwise, there is overlap. Uh, make the superset of the ranges, delete the old range, which was at II, and then we continue and we keep growing this range. We basically uh, find things that are touching this range and we grow this range more and more and more. And then once, uh, and we delete anything that we were touching, and then uh, at the very end, we'll actually insert that new range. So if uh, self.ranges.len Yikes. Um. So this would only ever delete. I think I can do a bounds check uh, early on. Basically, I don't want to modify the data structure. 
until I've done the check. I don't want to return an error after I've deleted a, a, an entry. Oh, it doesn't matter. Because if I deleted something, then it's guaranteed I'd have a slot. Yeah. If self in use... Um... is greater than or equal to self ranges len uh, return error error out of uh, space or uh, um, um, I don't know out of entries um, make sure we have room for insertion uh, it's import uh, um, if we deleted Anything above, it's impossible for this error to occur as we know there is at least a space for one entry. Thus, we don't um, have to do, uh, thus we don't have to worry about restoring uh, removed ranges from above, right? So if the in use ex, uh, is greater than or equal to the uh, length, then return out of entries, out of entries. Um, an operation was performed on the uh, range sets, uh, but there um, was no more space in the uh, fixed allocation for ranges. Okay. So if in use is greater than or equal to length, then out of entries. Otherwise, um, just fill that shit in. And we could do maybe a get here. I don't know if we want to do that. Um, if let uh, sum ent is equal to this dot get mute this ent is equal to range in use is that. Otherwise. Error. I think that's better. Um, okay. So, um, try to get access to that thing. If we can, replace it with the new range update in use, and then return. Okay, and then same thing here, invalid range shape. Check the range. And this is a result. Um... That's the last assert, baby. Um, get mute self in use. And let's fucking go. Uh, return. Okay, so this is going to remove a range. If the end is before the start, obviously invalid range. Try subtractions. Go through each of the ranges. If there's no overlap, then there's nothing to remove. If uh, it's fully contained, if the range is fully contained in the entry, uh, Returns true if the entirety of A is contained in B. Okay. If ent is inside of range, delete the entire entry and continue to try uh, subtractions. Okay. Um, at this point, there's partial overlap. If the start of the range that we want to remove is prior to the start of the entry that we're currently looking at, then we know that we have to adjust the start to be equal to the end of the range. It, that's basically uh, low overlap. Then we have high overlap. 
and then we have um, basically being in the middle, in which case we adjust the start of the existing range to start at the end of the range that we're removing. Um, and then this is um, insert uh, new range for the tail. Um, and then this one will go from the start of the old entry to the start of the range that we removed, saturating sub one. Um, any benefit over a cert though? Not really, it's just uh, better, uh, Better air checking allows you to recover from it potentially. Not that you actually would, but it uh, it just uh, plums that information up higher. Um. So I can't remember why I do the saturating ad here. Oh, because I removed that. Yeah. 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 Um, start is equal to the end plus one. The end is equal to the start minus one. Uh, this, the start is equal to the end plus one. So we treat it as a uh, start overlapping. And then we make, uh, that basically has adjusted the start to be at the end of what we've removed. And then we subtract one from the start because that also got removed. And that's the new range. Update the number of uh, in use and then try subtractions. Good. Um, and this is uh, no more subtractions uh, could be found. And then we return out. So that allows us to remove a range. Delete. Fuck yeah. Now we can do merges. Insert. Delete. Yep. No. Cargo check. Um. Never use subtract. Huh. Oh, it's because I don't pub that. Where is subtract used? Oh, that is the range set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's not used anywhere. That allows us to remove a range set from a range set, but we're not using that. Um, allocate. Let's take a look at these ones. Uh, EFI 215, usable memory insert. That question mark is going to fail. That's fine. Um, 305 in range sets. Results that's not used. Ooh, map. Is there a try map? I don't think so. There's a try fold, but I don't think it, there's a try map. And that's on a what? An option that I'm using that on right now? <sighs> okay. Um, results three on nine. 
Return out the pointer. Allocation map. Um, uh, OK or error out of memory. Question mark, OK or. Um, isn't there an and then on results? Yes, there is. Calls up if the result is okay, otherwise returns error. And then. Oh, that's a closure. Um, do I even want a closure there? Can I just do and? Ah, I will do an and then. Does that expect an arg? Yes. Um, you know what? I'm, I'll just I'll leave the question mark. I think this is fine. Question mark will unwrap basically the internal of the map. Don't see any candles. We just put it out. What am I doing, man? Allocation map, OK or out of memory. That turns the option, option results, becomes a result result, flatten. How do I, how do I want to do this? Dude, what are these uh, little skeeters coming in here? Um, map that. Um, okay, or I really want to use flatten here. I don't know if we're actually getting flatten. Let me check. Um, Am I just doing this wrong? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, a request for a free range uh, failed due to no valid ranges. Uh, uh, to not having um, a free range with the size and alignment requested. That's an OK. So remove it from the available set. Sick. Then this. Two twenty two. Results. Just a clean little wrapper. This one expected that uh, two thirty four. Um, um, zero size allocation, and this is, uh, zero sized allocations are not allowed. And 
Not a good description. Um, zero size allocations are not supported and thus uh, result in this error. No reason to ever allocate something of zero size, so we fail on that hard. And then this is a uh, alignment uh, error. This is uh, the alignment specified uh, was not a power is, was not um, a power of two or uh, was zero was not a power of two or was zero. Okay. Error error valid alignment. Okay. Two sixty one. Check dad. And what's this doing? Um, what is this doing? Okay, option, option. So that one, it's intentional that this returns an option because it returns the range that is the overlap. And this one uh, returns an option because uh, the summing of all the bytes can fail. It's possible that you can't return the size of a range. Um, allocate prefer, this takes an optional uh, list of ranges, so all of those are good. I'm just making sure I'm not using options uh, egregiously anymore. 261, these checked ads. Um, and then x, right? Compute the base and end of the allocation as an inclusive range. Uh, before I was failing pretty tightly on that. Um, so we're gonna loosen that up a bit, 265. We can say, uh, if end is none, continue. Um, this, is, this range cannot satisfy this allocation as there was an overflow on the range. Okay, let end is end unwrap. Um, I hate this syntax because it means I have an unwrap in here. Um, but ultimately, I'm going to take the base of this range. I'm going to add the size that I want to allocate to that uh, minus one, which we know is non zero, so the minus one is fine there. Uh, and then we add the alignment uh, that is required. What's this? Align minus this minus align mask. Uh, that can't underflow because that is always a subset of this. And then and with align mask. And what if uh, it was 4096? Okay, 4096, uh, something and FFF. And a line mask, that would be zero. Okay, sweet. Um, so that's the number of bytes required for front padding. Uh, as there an overflow in the range, and that's fine. That is not a hard error that there is an overflow there. It just means that this range can definitely not satisfy the size as the size uh, overflows the bounds of that range. Um, and that's totally fine. 215, okay, insert on that. Nice, uh, unwrap. I don't like that I'm using an unwrap there or here. Thanks for all the follows, everyone. Cheers, I see a lot of follows coming in here recently. Holy shit, thank you so much. Holy shit, viewership is climbing. Dude, ah, that's the trench, man. The past four hours are the trench for uh, streaming. It's just the worst possible time to be streaming. EU's asleep, US is starting to go to bed. 
It's rough, man. It's frustrating because, like, I try and, like, dodge streaming at those hours. Like, that's, ah, it's stupid. It's so stupid. But it really sucks to see viewership drop because every time I feel like, is there something I'm doing wrong? When it's ultimately just the, like, the world's going to bed. But we're, uh, we're getting this going. I'm trying to think if I want to refactor this to not have unwraps. Um, this I could turn into an if let or a match. Um, um, you have to work on Asian marketing. Like learning a uh, learning a language that's relevant in uh, that part of the world. Um, there we go. No more unwraps on that. Fuck. Um. And is equal to this. Woo! Doozy. Um, cannot satisfy this allocation. There's no overflow. Just like Australian English. Just learn to say good day. Good day, mate. I'm gonna put another shrimp on the barbie. Eh? <laughs> Bruv. <laughs> Oi, cunt. <laughs> We're gonna go uh, fuck up this code. <laughs> Dude, Australians have the fucking craziest slang. I've been watching a new uh, Australian uh, car channel, or they're not a new channel, but it's new to me. Um, Mighty Car Mods, and they're fucking two Australian dudes who do like a bunch of like car mods and. Dude, the amount of slang in Australia is unreal. <laughs> you, like, don't even know half the shit they're talking about. You have to, like, use context clues to figure out what the fuck they're talking about. Uh, like, a lot of tools have random, random fucking slang. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, man. A bit too British. Yeah, I, I don't know Australian, to be honest. I, I can't even mimic it. I have, I don't know why. I guess I, like, don't even know what goes into it. Uh, if previous size is greater than that. Um... Um, compute the best size. Previous size is that. Hmm. I don't know how I want to restructure that. I, I want to get rid of this unwrap, but I don't want to make the code look ridiculously stupid. Um, I'm basically doing a, a glorified max, right? I'm storing the, the, or in this case, a min, right? I'm storing the smallest allocation that satisfies an allocation. Um, and then here, satisfy out of there. If if we can satisfy out of it, uh, out of those ranges, then uh, we do. Oh, oh, fuck, dude. The thing is, this this unwrap is totally fine. It's it's impossible for this unwrap to ever fail. It will always succeed. Um, however, uh, it just makes it hard to like grep. 
right? I want to be able to grep the code base and see, okay, no unwraps. That's good. That's what I want to see. Um, and sometimes it's nice to eliminate things like that. Um... I don't know if there's a good way to do that. <laughs> like there, there are many ways that I can do it, but there, there aren't many ways that uh, wouldn't look like absolute shit. <laughs> and that's what I'm trying to avoid. I'm trying to avoid the absolute shit aspect, if that makes sense. Um, if the allocation is is none, the previous size is uh, unwrap. Hmm. Like I can, I can do the comparison inside of a map, um, and then I can basically do a, a check for uh, that being a, a, a some true, right? Um, let uh, smaller is equal to previous size map. X, which is the previous size, and we can say if it's greater than n minus base, uh, and we'll say if the end minus the base is less than x, uh, then we can say if or smaller is some true, right? It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. It's the same effect. Uh, and this is going to be a uh, check if the new allocation uses uh, less memory than the previous uh, allocation. Um, if the allocation is none, if there isn't any, or um, smaller is some true, if it's none, then it, it, it will never be the case, but um, it, it eliminates the unwrap. And the compiler's probably smart enough to actually recognize that, which is good. Okay. Unwrap. Expect. Uh, these expects are fine. These are top-level errors. We, we can't bubble up the error past here. We can't return an error from here. This is the root of our kernel, um, and thus we actually have to expect. And those are acceptable unwraps here. And then these unwraps, these are just testing. It's random things that we are hacking on to test. So um, at this point, we have a couple errors. Uh, a couple of things not being used here. Uh, get memory map, of course, that's not being used. No memory regions is not being used anymore. Um, and that's fair because we got rid of that construct. Um, and let's take a look at pubs. Table type. Yep, for errors. Um, initializing ACPI. The screenwriter needs to be public such that we can do prints. Uh, range set needs to be public so that we can access the range set structures. Um, the physical address needs to be public, of course. The physical slice, those are nice routines. Length, discard, and consume. Read fizz, uh, that. The error, and then the range of a range set. The fields of that. Creating a range set, getting the entries. Um, inserting, removing, getting the size, allocating, using a preferred allocation. Um, system table pointer, we need that for the entry points of our kernel. Um, registering, we need to be able to do that because that's how we register EFI. Outputting string, getting the ACPI table, of course. Uh, get memory map. Um, if I handle all of these things, uh, which are used, if I status code, that's used as a return value. If I status warning and error, those are used as errors that we want to be able to return and thus have to be public. And then these, of course, are public uh, extern FNs. Although we don't even need to mark those as pub, do we? Um, source core requirements pub. I don't think that affects anything. Should be able to have those as non-pub. Um, 
We don't really want to be calling those from our Rust code anyways, directly. Okay, so this should run. We still have to fix that error, of course, um, but that's an improvement. Beautiful. Okay. Now, um, I feel like this code could be kind of shuffled around a bit better. If I'm not mistaken, a lot of people in Rust, uh, in modules, they only import the other things, uh, and they don't actually write code in here. This is something that one of my coworkers told me about, uh, and basically asked, you know, why do I put why do I put code in uh, mod.rs? Um, and I think that's not really encouraged. I think it's encouraged that mod.rs is where you kind of define the modules in your module um, when you're using like a folder-based thing. So I might do that. What's bad about the unwrap? Are they expensive? No, they're actually really cheap, but they're um, typically, uh, they're, they're a place where you can cause a panic. Um, and thus, uh, I want to avoid panics and pretty much everywhere in the kernel um, and in those situations, they could never panic, but I still didn't want them because I want to be able to search for unwraps to see if I accidentally leave unwraps in the kernel somewhere. Um, you have such a nice voice, so relaxing. I'm kind of surprised, but thank you so much. Hell yeah. Um... So let's take a look at our folder layout. ACPI, sure. EFI, sure. Main, sure. Print and core requirements, I'm kind of tempted to stuff somewhere. Just get, get them a little bit out of the way. Um, just because they're, they're just not things I'm ever going to be looking at. I don't want them to be clobbering up the root level of my source directory. Thought mod mod.rs files weren't needed any uh, more. Oh yeah, I think they did get rid of that. Um, I think if you use a folder, you still have to use them. How does that work? Um. I can't remember how they changed that. Add a file called module name.rs in the parent directory. Yeah, but I'm try I'm intentionally trying to use a folder. Um so there's not much here. Mod.rs is no longer needed when placing submodules in a subdirectory. So does that mean I can go directly into, uh, like, I can directly use a module? What does it do? It just marks them as use or something? If you have a submodule, it can live in foo or foo slash mod rs. If it has submodules of its own, if it's of its own, it must be there. In 2018, you can have a foo.rs, okay, in the parents, and then bar in a foo, okay. Um, eliminates the special name. So then here I would have an mm.rs, and then that would pull in range sets. I mean, that's nice because you don't have a bunch of mod.rs files, but it does add like an, a little bit extra clutter to the higher level directory, which I kind of don't like. Um, hmm. Um, I mean, that's the direction they clearly want it to go, so we're still going to do that. Um, so we'll just do a split source mm.rs pub mod range sets, uh, 
pub mod fizzmem. Uh, and this is, I think I can, I just want to see how these, uh, docu comments show up, but we'll say this is, uh, memory management. Okay. Um, and then this will become source mm, uh, fizzmem.rs. This is, uh, physical... Memory management for the OS. RM uh, cargo check. MM found at both those locations. Uh, MM source MM mod. I was wondering if it would uh, yell at me for that. Source MM mod. Okay. Um, fizz add or fizz slice. So these are things only related to physical memory management, and that checks out. Um, uh, fizz mem. Okay, and then I'm just going to call that read, and I'm going to call this read unaligned. Do I just imp impulse on a fucking fizz adder? What am I doing, mate? ACPI, read fizz. Okay, so we just have a fizz adder. Um, and then we can probably also implement a uh, slice. Fizz slice uh, for size bytes. Unless I want to do dot slice on a fizz adder, but I don't know if I want to. Something like that. Seventy two. Three eighty seven. For some reason, that turbo fish looked wrong, but uh, we should be good. Um, read unaligned U sixty four. Nice. We're actually reducing uh, text size, which is good. Read 
read fizz. Read unaligned. Two sixty four. Okay, uh, two sixty four. Fizz slice seventy seven. Fuck. Um, what was this doing? Uh, take the accumulator, wrapping add, the physical address, uh, add the offset. Uh, read that as a byte. Add that to the accumulator. Oh, it's this. This, yeah. Mm. Uh, yikes. Physical address. Check dad, okay or, there we go. We have a physical address, then we want to read a U8 out of there, and then use that as the argument to wrapping add, and then wrap it in an okay. Okay. So this should run, everything should be good. Obviously we still need to fix that uh, warning. Um. Uh... 2.11 and EFI. This, um, yeah, we want to basically have that uh, from rain set errors not implemented for EFI error. Um, and rain set uh, self. And we can say, um, uh, an error occurred when trying to construct the memory map uh, range set. Uh, memory range set, okay. And then 217. We'll do a map error e error um, range set e. And then if we don't use that, we should have a result error. Boom. Okay, and now we actually use it, and it's happy. And then exiting boot services, cargo uh, sh key Okay. My eyes, my eyes hurt? How are yours not? How are they not hurting? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, just, I'm just using a computer. <laughs> okay, so we have those ranges. Um, beautiful. So we have the memory that is free on the system. Um, pretty happy with that. This tables, this look good. So, my man's needs an optometrist. <laughs> Yeah, dude. Yeah, I shouldn't hurt. Give your eyes a break. Um. Table address. So what do I want to do? I 
I have to write a serial port driver. I, um, yeah, so what do I have to do? I have to write a serial port driver. I have to, um, serial port driver wouldn't be too tough. Otherwise, I can't, I can't really do anything after this, right? Because I can't print anything. Um, I have to make a virtual memory manager, which is not too hard. Uh, basically, I need to do uh, page table stuff. I need to make a copy of the kernel. I need to um, collect the... Uh, I need to collect the ranges for, um, I need to collect the ranges for, uh, associated, uh, Numa nodes, like domains, right? Which I don't know if I even have that code yet. Um, that's going to be the SRAT, the, and I don't know if I'm using an SRAT yet. No, I'm not. Um, so parsing the SRAT is something that I have to do as well. Um, let's do a serial driver. Do you have the PDF for UART from Chocolate Milk? Um, maybe? I don't know if I uploaded it with Chocolate Milk or not. I probably still have it saved somewhere. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, let's go take a look at the ACPI specification for that uh, table. Um, and I forget what that fucking table was. Um, uh, SPCR. Yeah, SPCR. So basically what I want to do is I want to parse the SPCR ACPI table. Um, ARC 64. Is there no... Is there no Yuffie? Um, ARC 64 Rust target? Really? Why not? Um, hmm. Why? That's kind of annoying. Uh, Kimu system AR sixty four. Um, Hmm. I might have to maybe build OVMF. OVMF uh, Kimu. Come on, Ubuntu wiki's like fucked right now. 
Oh, VMF blobs. Yuffie bias for Kimu. I mean, we can try and build uh, the EDK too. I think that's what we're running right now, right? Kimu? Uh, EDK2, OVMF. I can't remember how hard this is to build. Eric64, debug, release. Unless there are... Uh, there are releases... But I don't think these are binaries. Let's see. Uh, EDK2. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's just source. I can't remember how hard this is to build. I've definitely built it a couple times for a couple times for ARM. Um, OVMF package, arm vert package. OVMF code. I, I don't even know like what, what uh, modules I need to support. Um, hmm. Um, how to set up local tree. Um, yeah, that's like actually how to develop, um, you get two platforms, Kimu. Holds the Eufy implementation for SBSA ref machine, which is fully software emulated SBSA machine, ARM64. What? Um, SBSA, SBSA reference. The Kimu SBSA reference ARM virtual machine. Uh, okay. Oh, wow. This is everything. <laughs> sick. Um, sick. Uh, build Kimu, soft MMU, blah, blah, blah. Done. Uh, build TFA. It's only needed if users want a custom ATF binary. I don't know what that is. Um... Compile Yuffie for that. Can be found on here. A short description. That's exactly what I want. Workspace, export this. Create a workspace that has those components. And then run it. P flash. Set that as the, okay, flash zero and flash one. Serial standard out. 
sick. This could be fun. This could be fun. Um. Copy those. If they want a custom ATF binary. I don't know what that is. <laughs> BL1, BL2, BL31, TFA of those, okay. Okay. So, meter ARX64. Let's, uh, let's see what we can do here. Get clone this cursive. Come on. Come on. Holy shit. Stop. Stop. Come on. When is the end? Holy shit. It's fucking firmware. How much code do you need? It says I want TFA. The fuck is this? I mean, I'll get it. What? What? Shit, where was it? Okay. Um. Should be now in install path. Yeah, I don't think that's gonna matter. Um, uh, export workspace is PUID. Uh, CD work space. All right. All right. All right. All right. Uh oh. Was my upload fucked? Am I dropping frames again? Noise. Noise. Fucking noise, dude. Okay. Um, the fuck compiler is this trying to use? <coughs> oh, I can't wait to have to figure out this build system. Um, Toolchain tag name. GCC5. Yeah, I don't give a fuck about that. Um. <laughs> How do I set the fucking compiler?
<laughs> Sick. Fuck off, mate. What, do you want me to have a uh, override my GCC on my path with a, a fucking ARX64 GCC? There's no way to override that? Jesus. That doesn't even fucking exist. Okay. Base tools, yeah, we we did that. Um, if cross compiling or building a different version, we need to inform the build command of what tool chain. We do this by setting this. Okay, sick. Come on, you bitch. I don't think I have that in my path, but uh, it's, it's good. Sweet. Uh, Eric. Sweet. Uh, okay. Um, pseudo cross dev. All right, we'll get this built. We'll be able to see what we got going here. I'm curious if this firmware is going to work in Kimu. It should. There's no reason it shouldn't. Uh, and then maybe we'll be able to see if this OS works in Kimu. Drop frames? Oh, yeah, we got drop frames all day. Hell, yeah. What version of GCC is this even going to build? GCC 9? Is that going to be a problem? It wants GCC 5. I'm curious if it will just work. It's kind of a YOLO, but uh, we'll see. Isn't GCC 5, like, really fucking old now? Hell yeah, thank you so much for all the follows. Sorry that my uh, my upload sucks. There's nothing I can do about it. My ISP has had some serious uplink issues. Come on.
So what are we gonna do? We're gonna build that, and then we're gonna build this, and it's just it's just gonna be good. Copy that to there. Uh, then extend the file size to match the machine flash size. Okay. The resulting uh, flash zero will contain the secure flash zero image, the TFA code. Flash one will contain the non-secure UFI code and UFI variables. Sick. Oh, come on. God, this takes so long to build for uh, Eric64. Jesus. I'm like surprised how long this takes to build. Jeez. There's a chance this doesn't even work with this uh, latest compiler. I'm surprised they want you to use GCC5 for this shit. Machine SBSA ref, P flash this, P flash this. Serial standard IO? Aha, this will be interesting. Then on the first console, this. Okay, now uh, we built bin utils, now we're building the compiler. I wonder how long the Eric64 compiler takes to build. It shouldn't be that long. On 192 cores? No, I'm on six. Six cores. I still didn't even know if I can build this for Eric64. Uh, cargo build uh, target. Uh, cargo, yeah, like, has no one done Eric64 in Rust yet? Jesus Christ. It seems insane to me. Um. Let's see. Um, <coughs> I should be able to have Yuffie, I think, here. Are you having hiccups? Yeah, I've been having hiccups this whole time. Oh, fuck, dude. I thought I'd just be able to build y Yuffie from Rust. It's kind of ridiculous, to be honest. Uh, I guess I can just target uh, MSVC Windows. See if we can at least make uh, build something for Windows, and that'll get us most of the way there. We might have to hack the PE to change the um, oh, yeah, um. 
That makes sense. Um... While N is great, uh, how do I want to do this? Let me, it's II is zero for II, or, uh, um, um, Okay. Uh, right to the desk with the uh, red value of the source. Plus equals one. Read source, write to dust. Is that the only assembly I had? No, I have mem set as well. So this is not using mem set? Each personality. Um. Fuck. Um. Each personality. Uh. Let's see what we can do here. Uh, we're going to basically try and make our own uh, architecture specification. Oh, fuck off. Oh, thank God. It was a typo. <laughs> Woof. Um... And what's the format for cargo config? Eric64, Eric64 PC. We'll change this to unknown Yuffie. Cargo build target. Of course, this is, this is gonna fail in the same way. It's not that uh, while i is less than n, okay, um, is built in, is like MSVC, is like Windows, linker flavor. Um, LVM target unknown Yuffie. Um, OS is Yuffie. Uh, <laughs> okay. This is apparently the default, so we'll just replace this.
Okay, uh, no EH personality, uh, panic. Let's take a look at a, um... Let's get this for a, uh, x86-64 unknown Yuffie. Uh, get diff AR64 this. Uh, just diff it. Um. Okay. And. Return is int true. Weak linkage. Let's just say false. Arc code model large data layout. We have that copied DLL. We don't give a shit about dynamic linking. Nope. GDB scripts false. So that's eight lines and that is seven lines. Okay. What did we miss? Um, CPU. Can we just say ARC64 here? We'll see. May, that, that may or may not uh, throw a fit. Environment. Nothing. XE suffix. EFI executable is true. Um, let's just say soft float here. Uh, is built in true. Um, link your flavor. M S V C uh, is built in uh, linker L uh, Rust L D linker flavor uh, L D link link flavor link L V M target max atomic width uh, no default libraries I don't think we need that. Uh, Panic strategy abort. No logo. NX compat. Oh, yeah. Let's fucking go, baby. Prelink args. Panic strategy abort. Uh, I think all these are fine. Single thread. Stack probes. Um, shit, shit, um, is it this, commas, not a recognized processor, bye, soft float, not a recognized feature, I'm impressed, Come on, let's fucking go. Obviously that assembly is gonna fail. Just get rid of it. Unknown file type. Uh, okay, so we historically had this issue when we... Uh, this. Come on. Come on. Son of a bitch. Uh oh, differs. Um that that's a solvable problem. Easy, easy, easy fix. Bink. Clean. Let's go. Come on. Uh, relocation type, unsupported and cough targets. Um, let's see if these args are being used.
LVM error. Uh, relocation type. Unsupported on cough targets. Uh, absolute. Um, let's try a medium code model. Or a small code model. Uh, clean that. Okay. I think that might be it. Check stack unreferenced. Uh, stack probes won't be implemented for uh, ARM64, it looks like. Uh, no mangle. Uh, FN check stack. Just just do nothing. Throw that shit in the trash. Uh, no mem set. That's fine. We, we, we don't have a mem set. Um, uh, source... Uh, corrects mem sets. Yoinkity yoink. Uh, if config not, if it's not Eric's uh, 64, let mute i is zero for, or while i is less than n. Uh, let s is equal to s offset i i as i size. Um, core pointer writes to S with a C as a U8. That's it. Uh, I plus equals one. Easy. Easy. Fucking easy. Fucking easy. Uh, I is zero, while I is less than N, uh... Offset by ii, and then write c as u8 to that location, and then go to the next byte, and that should be good. <laughs> How am I so fucking good at writing code? Uh, d target. <laughs> I typoed. Uh, uh, EFI. <laughs> Gotta go clean. Not that it matters that much. It's just the extension. Objdump D. Target AX64. Debug. FuzzOS.EFI, Vim Dash. Fuck. Uh, I think I think we're good. Definitely an MZ. I, I think we're good. Um No symbols. Let's see if these are uh, working. Whew. Sick. Let's fucking go, baby. Easy. Easy. Symbols? Symbols? Hello? Mom? Mom, where are my symbols?
We had issues with that on x86-64 as well, and I have no idea why, so we'll, uh, we'll see if this works. Let's fucking go. Let's fucking go. Maybe these don't support dwarves. We'll see. <gasps> Whoa! Easy. Never written a fucking easier OS in my life, dude. Come on. Come on, dude. You're just making it so easy for me. Fuck off. I don't think I need the fix for either of them, to be honest. <laughs> Woo! Look at that. Now we're at Leap, baby. Fuck yeah, that's done building. Oh yeah. Build. Build, you bitch. Fuck. That's fine. Maybe we'll use their compilers. What even failed? Uh, ACPI tables? Um... That's what happens when you build with threads. We'll just run it a few times. Maybe, maybe we'll see the error in a better way. Fuck. I, oh, I, I asshole. Shit. Um... Why do I feel like this is not... Oh. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I think this is the uh, ACPI compiler. Let's go. How is writing code so fucking easy? How long have we been working? How long have we been working on this arm stuff? Like a fucking hour? Maybe an hour and a half? How hard can it possibly be to port your OS to ARM? It's like minutes of work. Tops! <laughs> Come on, fucking build, mate! Please! Built that fucking custom ass GNU GCC compiler. Looks like looks like it's going good here. Generating a female done. Woo! 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 Fucking easy, dude. And people pay embedded developers to do this. Come on. How how hard can this possibly be? I'm basically a, a hardware engineer. Okay, okay, do this. Okay, sick. Uh, truncate. Okay, sick. Uh, system AR64 M1024 M SBSA ref P flash. Uh, this. Whoa! 
Let's go, baby! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Woo! <sighs> Let's just uh, keep putting down the dub skis. Holy oh, fuck! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, is it gonna boot? Is our us gonna boot? Home pleb, uh, fuzz OS, target, arm, debug. I think that'll do the trick, right? Um, mm, maybe I don't have a, uh, maybe I don't have a, uh, driver for networking. Um, <sighs> it's, I think, I think this would work. We just don't have the, um, Um, uh, we don't have a, uh, dude, this is so fucking cool. Um, shit. Are these like the devices? P E U F E P C I serial driver. Um networking stack. Include network package. Uh, SMP enable, IP6, HTTP boot. Um, maybe it doesn't want an E1000. Uh, Kimu, SBSA ref networking. Uh, how do I, how do I, how do I, how do I network? Hmm. It could be that the firmware doesn't have the networking support added. Um, it could be a lot of things. Device manager. Ha. <sighs> uh. 
a fake embedded controller. Net user. Um, and that dude doesn't even know what the fuck they're doing. So, I don't know. Arm. Risk five. SBSA. Full software emulated SPSA machine. I know you kind of can't see this. Um, let's do this. Um, poking the hardware, blah, blah, blah. How to build. And that's what we do. We're, this is what we built. Running with this, add an XHCI for keyboard and mouse, serial. So, um, So let's just try a hard disk quick. Come on. Really? Uh, I'll get rid of node graphic just to see. Um. I can't use the keyboard and mouse. Let's uh, see if this works. Sick. Kimu hard disk. Yeah, so there's no... Um, uh, it looks like there's no network driver in uh, Tiana Core. Oh god. Um, yeah, so let's see if we can get that working somehow. Help net. Net user. I would imagine that it's uh, basically firmware doesn't support that. Um, so uh, we can do uh, make fs uh, x uh, vfat. Moose image. Um, okay, and then let's see if I can list things on that. Who knows how to use this shell?
Sweet, I can make that work. Um, pseudo mount dev moose, uh, moose mount mount. Uh, pseudo chown r pleb pleb mount mount. Oh, fuck off. Let's read right. Uh, pseudo cp. Um, uh, fuzz OS target this debug fuzz OS dot EFI to mount mount pseudo U mount 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 Is it just slow emulating? Is that is not not going to be acceptable to run a boot application? Do I have to like call boot space thing? Maybe, maybe I can't just run something like that. Um. No, I think you just give it the path. Fuck! Try slash fuzz OS. Yeah. I'm gonna do the non-no graphic as well, just in case that it's more verbose um, in this format. Oh, I got a... a Slash fuzz I mean, maybe it like the serial driver isn't working or something. Um, if I mean. Check stack, register. Like in theory, it might be running. Uh, let's just try this. Um, core pointer right volatile. Leet 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 as mute u eight u uh, zero. Um, pseudo mounts. Um, targets. Debug, uh, fuzz OS, EFI, mount, mount, pseudo U mount, mount, mount. Uh, 
No graphic. Right, volatile. Volatile. Unsafe. Um, yeah. Um, Okay, it's running. Um, so, uh, let's print something before ACPI. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, we can, we can debug this with, um, these exceptions. Uh, okay, so we make it to there. So, need serial standard IO? I don't think so. I think that's implied. Should be implied. Yeah, it's already, already being used. Um, so... 